And welcome to another day of the LCK. We're here on a wonderful Friday afternoon, and we're getting ready for this matchup. We got Genji up against Nongshim Red Force, and this one, it is for the lives of Nongshim and their chances of making it into playoffs. But Genji are the gigantic favorites today after they clobbered T1 just the other day. How are you doing today, Ox? I'm doing pretty good. Um, yeah, a mammoth task ahead of Nongshim. We have seen sometimes Genji have some wacky moments. Like last summer, they lost to Brion at the end of the season, which was very strange. So not impossible, but definitely no other way to spin it than a mammoth task for Nongshim to find an upset here. It definitely is, but uh, if they do want to make it into playoffs, they will have to get through not only Genji, but also the rest of their matches that they do have for the rest of this one, uh, including Bro later on this week. Let's take a look at the standings here. Genji up on top after they defeat T1. They only have that one loss to KT, which was a bit of a Senna Nautilus issue. Yeah, uh, obviously that was first first match of the new patch and kind of caught them off guard, but they have looked so dominant apart from that. And for Nongshim, you know, they're the only team on two wins. Quantum Freaks is on six wins. It's Sometimes it's a bit more complicated, a bit more nuanced. It's so simple. You have four matches left. If you want to make six wins, you got to win them all. There's no other way to spin it. Uh, so Nongshim, a very clear task ahead of them. Yeah. For sure, as Nongshim are at the cliff's edge, can they flip the overwhelming matchup trend? Um, it's 32 to 1 <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of game score. Hey, they got that one, though. <laughs> they did get the one game, and they have not won a single series against Gen.G. Um, yeah, and they're eliminated oh. from playoffs upon uh. defeat. It's not looking good, but hey, you never know. You still got to play the games. And who knows what Nongshim will pull out today? Those are some some odds, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you can see, you know, they've been capable of taking games here and there from uh, some of the, the top teams. Not consistently, but there's been moments where they've shown potential, which I think is why a lot of people are endeared with this team, because they do have their moments and they are enjoyable to watch, but the consistency hasn't come through. Yeah, it certainly has not. Uh, I think 
picking up one win here or there where the top teams are kind of like, oh, okay, we beat you in game one, and, you know, they kind of caught us by surprise in game two. It's not consistent, as you mentioned. So uh, we'll have to get at least to today as the matchup of 80 carry prospects is under the spotlight. The overwhelming kill score is Pays, who is currently in first place in spring out of everybody. And that includes all the roles, as you see Zeka is there in the middle. And the carry who shines in defeat is Jiwoo. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw, but the Korean space did like a Jiwoo cheer after they won that game two against Hummel Life Esports, I think it was, where he carried on Zeri that one game. Yeah. So, and, I mean, I think yeah. Jiwoo has had some really fantastic moments, even this season, even with their struggles. And I think, you know, Pays has obviously come on to Gen G, been a great addition to this lineup, but it's a very different environment coming up and going to Gen G and going to Nongshim. So I feel like Jiwoo has got to do a lot of work to try and carry this team and pays, but he gets facilitated quite a bit and does obviously uh, pay off with the resources he's given. But uh, yeah, definitely two different sides of the coin. Yeah, I think Pays and Lahans, we weren't sure where to rate them, but after going up against two Lucian lanes uh, that T1 pulled out and handling them with flying colors, um, seems like they're in a pretty good spot right now and certainly feeling pretty good about their chances in playoffs as well. Let's take a look at a deeper um, look into the stats of this 80 carry matchup as Pays is on top in terms of KDA and DPM. Of course, he is on the most winning team here, but he is a big part of it as well. Yeah, and you know, these stats you always have to sort of interpret them. You can't just take them, you know, as the granted the high damage percentage for Jiwoo you know, on paper, you might be like, oh, he's doing so much damage, but really it's that his team aren't always contributing as much, and he has to do the lion's share for them to win, particularly on picks like uh, the Smolder, uh, which can definitely be a powerful one. Yeah. I, I think if you're an AD carry that has played a lot of Smolder so far, regardless of if you're winning or not, you're going to have high DPM. High you're going to have high, D, uh, high damage, damage share. Percentage. Yeah, high exactly. everything. Because even if you lose, you're going to have high damage most likely as yeah, you press, team. pressed R once at like 25 minutes and, yeah. and did like 6,000 damage, you know, um, casually. Yeah, to away. topping the meters um, out of everybody on your team by far, just by pressing a couple of buttons. Uh, but Jiu does a bit more than that. He has played a lot of Smolder. He has played a bunch of Zeri as well. Um, we'll be curious to see where we do see the picks go in the draft. Um, certainly a lot of high prio picks on this patch and a lot of very winning picks so far. Um, Rel is like above 80%, Ari is at 90%. We've got Twisted Fate, five and zero. We have Callista, eight and one. <laughs> very high presence up there towards the top, only below Senna in yeah. terms of presence. Just a lot of very dominant picks Honestly, so far. I feel like the one that stands out to me the most is the Rel, because he's been consistently played in both jungle and support. You know, it's not just, oh, that you've been playing this one. Like TF, for example, we have seen TF bot, but his wins are mostly from the top lane. But Rel, there is two roles he's actually very effective in. We saw Execute yesterday have a phenomenal series playing it. So I think that level of flexibility uh, and the power that the champion brings is is really something. And I think, you know, whenever you're facing a mammoth task like this, it, it starts with the draft. I think there are picks that we have seen can allow you to deal blows to stronger opponents. You know, we obviously saw the Senna Nor being something KT utilized, but I also think the Karma uh, Smolder combo, if somehow you get your hands on it, is a very potent combo. And if you manage to get the late stage of the game, if Gen.G do make some mistakes, which I'm gonna be honest, they're not very prone to, but if they do, <laughs> then perhaps you can just let Smolder do his thing and win the game from there. Yeah. Nongshim still with their interim head coach, Chelly. Uh, after Irene did leave the team and um, hasn't necessarily helped them out either. I feel like their drafting has been a bit iffy uh, at time to time. We have talked about it a lot on the space. And to add insult to injury, Genji have side selection for this round and they have selected the blue side. So yeah. they're going to get their pick of the litter as Azir, of course, still global banned here on 14-4. And Smolder's just gone right out of the gate. Out the window. <laughs> Genji knew. He's like, how could we lose a, a match against Nomshin? Maybe if they get Smolder and get to 600 stacks, and they're just not even going to let it happen. Not even going to allow that to be a possibility. They do ban the Vi as well. They could. And the Nautilus taking off the cards as well. Definitely pushes the Zeri priority up, I feel like, with those off the table. I imagine... Actually, Nongshim in a pretty difficult position because 
Kalista is still open and available, Senna is still open and available, and Varus also on the cards as well. Like, there's a lot of picks in the bot lane, and typically we see heavy AD carry bans in the first three. Um, with that Jace, Cassante, Vi all coming through, it does mean that a lot of these AD carries are open. It's kind of like pick your poison at this point. Yeah, I thought, um, and TF's going to go as well, so even more AD carries left available. I thought that Genji would ban one of them so that they kind of take away some responses from Nongshim. Uh, but they said, we're going to get Senna, so we don't really care what you pick, and good luck. As well, it's Callista Rel, though, which is pretty strong. Yeah, a strong duo, ultimately, and also the flexibility to put the Rel in the jungle if you want to, so no huge commit there. And you can kind of see what Genji offer up with their support pick first, but definitely prioritizing some picks that have been very powerful in the patch, but the burden really goes to Nongshim to be driving the force in this game already. Like. We've had three picks come through in the draft, and you're looking at this and saying, okay, Nongshim need to win early just off the back of this. Yeah, they certainly do. Uh, especially, you know, you've banned away Nautilus, so Tom Kent is going to be the obvious one. Tom Kent's very strong into what is already showing on the side of Nongshim Red Force. And, you know, we have seen the Ramus once, this split. I, I don't think we're going to see it again. So. Curious to see what Canyon will play. He certainly has his pick of the litter from the jungle outside of the Vi and the Rel. Yeah, I mean, they could really go in a lot of directions. They could take mid here. It's interesting as well, the Karma is kind of open and available and is flown through, which is obviously something we've seen really prioritized recently as well. Lee Sin going to come through for Canyon. Canyon fans, very happy to see he's kind of been <laughs> taken away from that tank only duty. Uh, and this this actually makes really big sense to me. The Rel flexing the jungle and getting that Renata glass before the second rotation of bands. You know, I feel like a lot of the time when we've seen Callista, she's had to be in isolation because the Renata gets banned so quickly afterwards. Uh, but getting the duo and having that Rel jungle, I'm gonna be real, it's actually a really strong da draft from Nongshim um, so far and definitely something they needed in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, you just look at the first phase of bans and so much stuff was left available. That's why I thought Genji would at least chip away one of those really strong picks instead of the Cassante, but they left a lot of things up and so did Nongshim. So both sides are gonna get some big picks. The Corky is taken away. We did see that uh, one of the teams yesterday did try to utilize it to not too much success, but also another team winning on it pretty heavily. Yeah, BDD. So I don't think had the best quirky game, but definitely did some things with the package later on. Won um, the game. Yeah, I mean it was quirky center, the duo that actually beat out the smolder. So definitely a lot of range there. And I think ultimately when you're playing Clister Renata, you don't want to be dealing with long range poke as much as possible. Do you see the Ari ban coming in? Which I think when you already see the Lee and it is Chovy, makes complete sense. Uh, I wonder what will be the last ban for here, because the Karma is still open and available, and obviously, if you are trying to get an advantage early, the Karma is pretty obnoxious on lane in most matchups. Uh, but they're actually going to ban away the Renekton from Dundun in this situation, uh, which they potentially could have taken on four and left uh, five pick for mid. I would expect they would take their mid pick here and then just give Dundun the best odds possible. Talia still available makes sense. And uh, we'll see what Chovy opts to match up into this. He's got a little smirk on his face, which, um, yeah, oh. you know, Cassidy does jump, but he doesn't actually dash through the rocks. So if you really want it to be obnoxious, you could go for that into the Talia. And they're back on it. They are hovering it once again, and it will be locked in. We do get Cassidy for Chovy here. Yeah, I mean, it's rough for the Talia. Later on, there's not much you can do against the Kastin. He will just completely ignore your Unraveled Earth. Very hard hit with the Seismic Shove. Uh, and the Rumble does come out for Gen G, which we saw a great Rumble game yesterday, but it was specifically into the Renekton, and it was a counter pick. So it does mean that Dundon knows what he's up against, and he's kind of looking towards the Aatrox. Uh, you know, we said before, this is kind of going to have to be a win early, win hard game. I feel like that's just been amped up to 11. Uh, we're actually amped up to 16, I would say, <laughs> uh, with the cast in being locked in. Yeah. Uh, Genji definitely have so much insurance. They still have a strong top jungle uh, to sort of lean on. And it's not like the, the Tom Kench still gets a lot of power early with the farm. So it's not like their composition is nothing early. But they do have a mid lane where, you know, the old trope that people attributed to Chovy was he just sat mid and farmed. And obviously he's grown so much beyond that. But this pick is that. Uh, it's yeah. kind of a return to, I will just be a monster later. Can you win the game first? And that's really the question uh, being levied to Nongshim. 
Yeah, and as you mentioned, you know, the Tom Kent is going to be fine. We even saw Deft ganking the top lane at like three and a half minutes yesterday or like four and a half minutes, something ridiculous. So we'll see if Pays wants to get out on the map and make a uh, an impact on this early game as well. And uh, this just says, Genji, don't lose. <laughs> um, from Haley and Sophie. I love how it just straight up it is. <laughs> You know, that's good advice for any team. Have they actually thought about just not losing? Genji has been pretty good at that so far. Yeah. Maybe Nongshim could have done with that advice. They forgot about it that one day, but <laughs> yeah. outside of that, they have been listening to the fan sign. Um, <laughs> very interesting draft. We finally do get the Cassidy into the Talia here in this game. And it looks like we are just about ready to hop onto the Rift for game number one. So let's do it for Genji versus Nongshim. Genji, Hana, Du, Zen. Genji, fighting! Yay. Nongshim, Hana, Du, Zen. Nongshim, fighting! Yeah! All right. Fans out in force today as we're getting ready for match 75, game one. Yep. Almost at the end of spring already. It's gone so fast. I feel like that's that's the thing you say every single competitive league, but like it's gone so fast, but it really does. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. kind of just flies by. Uh, and it's just interesting to see how, I mean, I feel like Gen.G have kind of been that rock where other than that brief little hiccup, it's kind of been like, yeah, Gen.G Gen is solid. Um, and I feel like Nongshim have Many kind of just struggled to really hit their mark. But I, I feel like, you know, something you talked about was the, the change in coaching staff. Talked about the drafts a little bit. This draft from Nongshim, I actually feel like is very solid, very respectable, but I still have a lot of concerns. Draft isn't everything, yeah. um, despite what some people believe. <laughs> there is still a game to be played, um, and they certainly have that work out for them. All right, well, this is a nice early maneuver from the side of Nongshim. Sylvie going to get started in the enemy jungle and try to set up vertical jungling here to allow his Callista Renata to put on some pressure in that bottom lane and be pretty much unaffected. Let's yeah. see what Canyon decides to do. I think it's a good move when you're playing Callista Renata because Callista Renata is one of the best diving duos, like early levels. We've seen it two-man dive early, but actually Sylvie being challenged here by Pays. Yeah, Pays is level one, still has a root on level one as the Q is going to land and misses, and Sylvie does dodge that, but he does still have to flash away. So this protects Canyon's jungle, and it does kind of mitigate the possibility of Sylvie coming down for a dive, but it really sacrifices a lot of the lane presence uh, for the Hens and Pays. Pretty sure Pays will have missed some experience there. You can see at the bottom left, he's so far away from level two, so not going to have a fun time for the uh, time being. But to be honest, into close to Renata, that's kind of a given that you're not going to have a fun time there. Yeah. I mean, the lane's going to push in eventually anyway. You're still going to fall behind on the center. Yeah, and I actually wouldn't mind seeing Canyon potentially shadow on the crash, simply because we have seen level two dives on Clister Renata. With Pay still being level one, they could just kill him and get the bailout reset. So Canyon will be doing that. He will be moving over and just being like, guys, I'm here. Yeah. Don't kill my bot lane, please. He made that very obvious. It's the ghost, and now he's going to back. And it should be fine. Sylvie not heading this direction. Just going to go up to the top side jungle and go on with that. As level two, level three here for Peter, actually, as they do put a bit of damage in. And you can see that poke does go down onto the hands as Canyon is going back down to the bottom side and he has picked up a Doran's Blade, which is the new meta. Yeah, but it shows kind of how sort of wary he is of this pressure onto his bot lane. Um, he sacrificed so much time just to kind of ensure that, you know, that, that there was a possibility to counter gank in that situation. Now he is looking mid on Call Me. Yeah, he's got to get yeah. that stunned down with the Unrivaled Earth, but uh, this is going to help out Chovy not going to secure a kill or anything like that. Yeah, it just assists. I think, honestly, ganks like this are actually pretty nice when you have a cast in mid, especially pre-6. Like, you're forcing Call Me to back and match uh, teleport. In fact, Jovi actually is going to try and push once more before teleporting, so... A pretty nice nice move and very annoying as the enemy mid when you know you're not going to die. You know the jungler can't kill you, but he just chunks you out and kind of messes up your laning phase. Yeah, it's very annoying. It's, um... 
we used to call it pranks back in the day. They're not like quite ganks where you're looking for kills, but you're also pranking the enemy laner. And um, yeah, essentially it just makes it a little bit easier for your laner to uh, get through the early laning phase. Canyon falls a bit behind on CS, but um, does also eliminate one of the issues with the Kassadin early on. The bot lane seems all right, although you would expect the Kalista and Renata to continue to have some pressure down here. Yep. Such an impressive lane to play into, uh, and especially the autos from the Renata combined with W from the Kalista. If they just both connect autos onto the Tom, he takes so much damage. And yeah, Canyon has sacrificed a lot of his early clear. The fact he's only now uh, finishing off his topside jungle uh, really has put him behind. So potentially Sylvie has the opportunity to maybe start up this dragon. Uh, Canyon will go for the, the grubs in his side, which I think works out well for Gen G. They, they don't really need to secure early dragons that desperately. They obviously have a lot of scaling elements, but the grubs will kind of push Canyon back into the game. It's just like getting that extra XP from the first one. Uh, definite advantage. We also see Pays move up to help him with it. Yeah. A lot of uh, damage minions, by the way, underneath the turret, just getting um, eliminated to the tower, as this is going to go the way of Canyon and Pays. But uh, Lahens is not having a fun time, and Sylvie's going to pick up an early Infernal Drake for this comp, which is going to feel very nice. And Ocean should be pretty happy about their early start in this game. As here we go, we got level six from Call Me. He's gonna try to abyssal dive out of this one as the seismic shove will land, and now Lahens is in a ton of trouble as first blood should go over to the side of Nongshim. Who will they give the kill to? Um, okay, they did it. They finally did it. Jiwoo will pick up the first blood. And I'm not gonna lie, that was so greedy from Lahens. He could have just flashed that seismic shove, but he was like, no, I can sidestep it. Well, ends up paying for it with his life, so definitely an advantage that Nongshim likes to see. If we look at the bot discrepancy, that's a very significant farm difference. It obviously always gets a little bit wacky with farm discrepancies when you have a center lane, but uh, still a lot of gold going over to Jiwoo, who's kind of been unchallenged. It is kind of matched on the top side though. Kian is kind of bodying Dundun right now. Yeah, I mean, it is Kian into Dundun. Oh, we'll take another look at this bottom lane play. Could have maybe even seen it with the plants being hit, and as you mentioned I mean, here, you just press your flash button and you're fine. Yeah, you're a big catfish, dude. You're not, you're not that agile. Um, and lands pays for his uh, misplay there. And you can see Pays was there, just trying to come in a little bit late, though, unfortunately. So, now in a situation where you has capitalized and spent the gold he managed to generate there, so this 2v2 very threatening right now between them, especially as you assume they're going to be pretty close to level 6 for Jiwoo and Peter, so if a skirmish breaks out, there's a lot of power picked up from those. Yeah. Certainly is, as Lahen's going to get away this time. Chovi in the face of two members of Nongshim trying to take out a control ward. Uh, has hit level 7, so he has the ability to rift walk at least, at least, and he will not be in much trouble at all. Against the Talia, as you can see right here, Talia does not stop the Rift Walk and will not stop Cassidy the longer this game goes along. Yep. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's not a bad start from Nongshim, but I think the fact that Top has had such a discrepancy, the fact that Canyon managed to catch up in terms of farm to Sylvie and Chovy just completely unfazed, unbothered, flourishing in his lane, uh, it's kind of worrying already for Nongshim. They need. Uh, the mid game to be really crisp in this one. Trying to engage here on a canyon. They do have an immense amount of CC, but they are going into the enemy jungle here. Trophy not going to be able to help out too much as now Canyon also electing not to flash, and this time he will get away, unlike Lahens earlier on. Helps that he is uh, the Lee Sin, of course. And Chovy's like, yeah, I'm not helping you, dude. I'm, I'm farming mid. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> no camps in the bot side jungle. There's no dragon up. There's. Oh, <laughs> wow. Um. Yeah, uh, well, obviously you can Rift Walk to dodge CC, or you can just walk, walk. to dodge CC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No Rift required at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, trying to get the Hex Drinker, not going to get it. Ooh, nearly got it there. Far away, yeah. yeah. And the fact that the guy who wants Profane Hydra as soon as possible, or at least some kind of early item that's not a Hex Drinker, is on a Hex Drinker and behind 25 CS, 
is not a good feel. This Canyon is also here, shadowing for the lane that is winning early on. And Sylvia is also trying to help out here, but he's taking a huge amount of damage. Magnus Storm does come in. The double Q3 on the Canyon and Keen is going to push them away. But again, it doesn't really do too much damage at the end of the day. And Chovy even is going to roam up here to keep them safe. As the dive does technically fail. Yeah, it's just unfortunate because I feel like if Call Me was coming in to cut them off, it would have been a, a pretty great play. Uh, it didn't happen here. Yeah, a little gank from Peter as the uh, ult is going to come through. Lehen's taking a huge amount of damage from this Kalista, even the Grey Health. Oh, he is actually going to get away as now the root comes down onto Peter Pays, trying to threaten this one. But uh, yeah, just going to survive. Just barely a pretty close trade down in the bottom lane. Yeah, I think maybe if they'd used the ult from Jiwoo, they would have at least gotten Flash, um, but maybe didn't want to commit it just so uh, there wasn't any turn round potential. I'm trying to uh, zoom in on the some, teleport wards. Yeah, there are some wards, so you have to be cautious about that when Chovy is still available, but I think he's not really in a position to teleport now with his mana. But yeah, I think the previous play on the top side, if Cormie had been the one to get there first, I think they could have got those two kills. But unfortunately, it's a pretty big down trade for no. Okay, gonna get the flash here out of Pays. We do have a Tom Kent desperately trying to help him out as he does get the speed up and just spits him out over there towards the turret and will keep Pays safe. Oh, it's so sad. You has no mana and obviously the shield blocks it, but there wasn't even the opportunity to wait out and look for a Ren. So a nice save from the hens there. Looked really close to the wire. But uh, yeah, it feels like Nongshim, they're making the right plays. But the execution isn't quite there. Uh, and it's it's led to a situation where, I mean, Chovy's at 111 CS on Cassidy. All right, well, now oh. we have this wall coming in. TP is going to keep them safe. And Chovy just rift walks away. Yeah, I mean, I just think Genji are doing such a fantastic job of mitigating this pressure and just not allowing the plays of Nongshim to work. They're ahead in gold. You know, with that composition at this point, there's a bounty. There's a farm bounty on Chovy. <laughs> Not the first time we've ever seen that. But on a Kassadin, it doesn't feel good. No, it, oh, it does not. Yeah. Not supposed to happen. Um, yeah, I'm just going to poke him out. He doesn't want to commit. Doesn't have anyone else near him as Canyon is just, meanwhile, taking the entire enemy red jungle. Um, just hanging out on the top side of the map and saying, you wanted vertical jungling? Well, here I am. Yeah, and with Soul going to be seen in a second, I mean, this is the payoff as well, because it's six Void Verbs. You have the pressure in top lane already, even more gold for Keen. And it's going to be a Mountain Soul, so that's at least good news for Nongshim. Because um, if it was something like a Chemtech, I, I think the game would be so doomed. But at least they have a Soul that does represent some solid power. But uh, they need to really t retake control of this game, because it's slipping. Yep, it's definitely slipping. And uh, we saw that Keen in the top side, he got two solo plates uh, on top of the uh, two, I think, that he already had. I, I guess it was one. So now three solo plates for him up on the top side of the map. Yeah, he's kind of strong. We kind of saw a similar thing yesterday with the Rumble, who was just kind of farming up, just doing his thing. And then just it was clear, and he just dominated every fight. Um, Remember when Rumble got banned, or nerfed, rather, and everybody was like, ah, yeah, I don't want to play that anymore. Yeah. And then it started to win, and they're like, wait, it's still good. Yeah, it still works. And also, still a very good matchup in Turinecton. And as you can see, still can just completely torch Aatrox. Literally. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're kind of in this situation where there just hasn't been enough happening from Nongshim. And I kind of get the vibe that they'll start to feel a bit more desperate. I look Yeah, no need to rift walk when you can just walk again. Right, they, um. <laughs> they need a nerf walk. It's so broken. <laughs> um, the amount of skill shots Chovy has just used it to dodge. Um, you know, mind blowing. Movement speed, a very strong stat, and he went for early Merc Treads into the Talia. And you might think, well, he's he's just going to avoid all the CC. Why does he need that? Don't, well, he gets don't, tier two. Don't talk about boots and movement speed, because uh, Keen is, um, he'll, he'll anger Hoonie. <laughs> yeah, so. Hoonie is here today. Yeah, you got to, um, let's, let's cut the conversation. Yeah, also went for the proto belts, or the rocket belts. But, oh, uh, man, he is going to be fuming. So basically not doing damage, but he's very agile, which is important, right, Hoonie? The fastest, fastest. Yeah. Uh, we are going to get another handshake here on the hands. But again, you know, little little plays like this, it's not really a decisive maneuver like we're going to take this fight. It's kind of just um, trading evenly right now with Genji, who are very, very happy to go later in this game. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Chovy now level 11, got his Roa completed. Oh, 
All right, nice little knock up, but we do have the Devour here as uh, it might be a little bit of trouble here for Lehenz, but he's got so many shields with the Senna and the Top Kench himself, and he will just survive as they do utilize at least the Wall and the Renata Ultimate to try to take that down. It does not work, and he doesn't even have to flash. I can't fault them. I think Nongshim are making the right plays. It's just constantly getting shut down by Gen G. And now you've committed so much to that play, they're not confident to go for the Herald, so Genji are reaping the rewards of just not dying. That's their strategy, and it's working so well. Just walk away. <laughs> it's so powerful <laughs> in this game. Uh, Dindin is about eight years away from a real item in this game as well, and we have the completed one for Keen. Um, at least he's got Ignite, right? Didn't he? But the, the pressure's on, he's up more than 30 CS, and the Rumble's going to be a big issue. You see also that Canyon goes up to the top side with the Rift Herald that he got, and he's going to continue feeding his top laner. Yeah, I mean, they're really just stacking on the gold on these solo laners. Oh! All right, no Devour available. Maybe a bit of trouble for Lahens, but the knockup comes in to Peel, as we do have the Teleport coming in here from Chovy, looking to get in their faces. He doesn't do a whole lot of damage just yet. And now Equalizer on top of Call Me. But he's got a Seraph's shield to survive. And we stick on just the one kill for now. Yeah, really nice cleanse coming out from Haze there. And here, you know, they're threatening this tower, but don't need to overcommit for it. Just going to let the Void Bubs do a little bit of work and then back and away. But once more, a proactive play by Nongshim, shut down by Gen G. And I feel like there's just so many instances of that in this game. It's just kind of like a, a highlight reel of no action being allowed to happen. It's like there's action, yeah. but there's no kills. That is the highlight reel. Um, just attempts on people's lives in League of Legends. And um, now we have a Roa stacking Cassidy in, in a side lane level 12 already. We've got the Rumble who's ahead. And... Kind of just hanging out. Senna's doing her thing, stacking up the souls. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you think about a team like T1, they might come into a series like this and say, okay, we're going to we're gonna play extremely aggressive bottom lane. We're going to first pick Kalista, and we're going to shut them down in the laning phase and absolutely own them. Genji not really taking that style at all. They're like, no, we're just going to sit back and relax. No rush, actually. We're just going to sit here, scale up, watch Nongshim, let them have their chances, and then eventually win the game when we need to. Yeah, they are set up for the dragon fight now, though, so perhaps deeming they have waited long enough and now are ready to fight. We do see Chovy look on the flank. Now there is the engage the flash. Hostile takeover. Uh, something we don't really like to see, and that's part of the reason why. Uh, yeah, because it, you can just walk away from it. It got pays his flash, but you know you lose out on one of your best team fighting tools as a result. So it does mean that, and again, I feel like you would normally say, oh, well, they got Flash on the AD carry, but Lehens can just gobble him. So not really that Lovely. huge of a payoff. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. And um, see that Sildi, he's got his Knight's Val here onto Jiwoo. I, I think that's fine for now, especially because Dinan is so far behind. And the Callista does need to get pretty close to the sun to actually deal damage. And this setup, we have like flanking on flanking, where Chovy's on the bottom side trying to flank, but also Dindin's on the top side trying to flank. They're going to turn onto this one. The Weaver's Wall does come down. Sylvie not finding an engage, though, as Keen with the Equalizer. They're running into the enemy jungle, and the damage from this Equalizer is just gigantic as they are burning them to a crisp. Down will go Canyon, but you can see that Genji does have the advantage in this place. So many low health bars on the side of Nomsim as he goes Lehenz under the turret. What are you doing, my guy? Maybe just trying to bait them in, and that he will, as Chovy's going to pick up an extra kill on the back side of this fight. And Genji should be able to take down the dragon as well. And Nongshim is just really struggling to connect, really struggling to finish off targets. So you get Canyon, but no one else. And I feel like if you're losing fights at this point, it is not a good uh, position for the game to be in. And this fight kind of, you know, we saw Genji have complete control of this uh, banana brush here. And Dundun, they focus on him to get him away. But if you watch, Jiwu kites over to chase Canyon into the equalizer, into this double knockup from the hands. And suddenly we see Nongshim kind of panicking, trying to disengage to their tower. But, you know, there's so little actual damage done to Gen G because of the healing and the shielding that comes through. Like, the fact Lehenz goes in the tower here and doesn't die, and then Chovy also goes in the tower here, eats a knockup, and still doesn't die, it's just so frustrating for Nongshim. Yeah.
I mean, what are you going to do? It's it, it's like they're invulnerable in some of these fights. And we saw the Magnus Storm used just desperately for kind of like a defensive purpose to try to peel. And that's not the angle you're going to look for as Canyon goes in. The Equalizer good oh, once again, wow. burning down Sylvie and Colby. Look at the damage. It is insane. And they didn't quite take the Drake just yet. And that is why Gnome Shim are trying to get in here and challenge them. But that is not working too well. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say, if you don't get this dragon, uh, Kasten's going to be level 16 by the time you're trying to get Soul. It's just not going to be a good time. Um, he might honestly be level 16 anyway, even if you get the dragon by the time you're trying to get Soul. But <laughs> it is not looking good. That equalizer from Keen was fantastic. They were trapped against the wall, nowhere to run except through the equalizer. Sometimes you see like an equalizer hits, the initial damage is good, but they just walk off it. But that one was like full duration. Yeah. Uh, so much value. You can see already uh, the range advantage going pretty well. It, this is going to be a very nice combo coming in from the side of Nomsium, but do they have the follow-up is always the question. Keen in a lot of trouble as now the Weaver's Wall does come down and Colby just going to execute him in front of them. Dindum also on the flank here as yes, the Dragon will go the way of Gen G, but uh, see just how far away these guys can survive for as Canyon's just going to hit the turret and accept his fate. Does not have a safeguard and does not have his life anymore. Yeah, but I think he might have actually bought enough time. It's still early, but if he died closer to the Baron and earlier, perhaps Nongshim could have just rushed over and taken it on 20 minutes. Uh, but the fact he managed to buy enough time to get over there, dragged him down all the way to the bot lane, no real chance of that happening. And yeah, the kills on ice, but don't really change the state of the game much. We do see here the value of the Rel breaking that shield on Pays, obviously making him vulnerable. Uh, and just a bit of an overcommit, a really nice ult from Peter setting that play up. And then here, yeah, Canyon buying a lot of time uh, and dragging all of Nongshim down to this bot tower. Yeah. Nongshim, at least they finally got something. It, it was a bit frustrating, I'm sure, for them that it, it just felt like Genji kept getting away with it. And, you know, they caught them in mid. They had to chase Canyon, but they got him as well. And at least some kills now. You've got you on three kills, three and zero. You've got Call Me on two. And some potential to try to fight in this mid game. Yes, everything we've mentioned before still plays, you know, in terms of the scaling and the issues they are going to have into eventually level 16. Chovy. Oh, man, he's, he's halfway to 15, and his row is nearly stacked. So it's just going to be like he gets 15, boom, row stacked 16. And yeah, I don't know. I don't see an answer to that. Um, particularly. It's kind of been like, kill everyone else and hope that everyone else is dead by the time you have to deal with Chovy. But he's going to be such a threat. And I just think the composition that Nongshim have, like, there are definitely picks that are good at dealing with Kassadin, or at least better at dealing with him, even in the late game. You know, Vyze and Nolus is obviously fantastic at that. But nothing on Nongshim is targeted CC, uh, which just, just makes it so difficult, especially if Chovy ends up getting a Zonyas, then, I mean... You're just not going to be able to lock him down. Yeah, it's going to be a bit of an issue. Uh, doesn't seem like he's going for that next. As we are zooming in on him hitting level 16. Well, it's 15 now, but he's two more stacks. Yeah. And it's done. Uh, um, I was getting a little ahead of, ahead of myself, you know. Getting excited. Yeah, um, well, fortunately, uh, there's a dragon up in a couple of minutes. And he will have stacked his row by then. So, you know, I was kind of saying that Dongshin really needed that third dragon so that they could get Sol before Chovy got level 16. Even if they'd gotten that dragon, that wasn't going to be a possibility. Definitely still a bit of an issue. Dongshin trying to control as much of the map as they possibly can around the Baron. We even have some pings onto this one. They are going to start it up. Just trying to fight before we do have level 16 casted in, in this one. It's the right call. Might be a bit of a last-ditch effort. Let's see how it does go. They have the rel, at least, in terms of looking for flips. And you know what? Gen.G, a little bit sluggish to get in here, but finally they do get on top of Colby in that back line, but the damage is being done here, too. This Baron, but look at the kick oh. into the Equalizer, and the steal comes in just to add insult to injury as Gen.G, as a team this time, will burn them to a crisp. And that might just be a clean ace if Chovy can catch up to this Renata, which seems quite likely at this point. He's prepped the blade as there it will be. And there is the ace as also Chovy, not quite yet level 16, but good enough. Yeah, just fantastic execution from Gen G. The kick into the equalizer was so high value. They focused on Colmy, who's been doing a lot of damage, but so difficult for Colmy to handle the Cassidy in. 
But then we see here the kick that ends up coming out from Canyon, and then the equalizer on the back oh. of the pit. Oh man, it's just phenomenal. There's nowhere for them to go. The stun that comes in as well from the Baron, I believe, is just, yeah, pretty phenomenal. Uh, but I have to say, this was 100% the right call from Nongshim, because you're bad at face this level 16 casting anyway. You have to go for a Hail Mary, and yes, it backfires and you get aced. It just means the game's over quicker, but I think waiting for the cast into his 16, you were doomed regardless. Yeah, I, I do think, especially the way the early and mid game did go. Oh, um, man. For sure. Like, if Nongshim had a little bit of a better start, you know, he they didn't have to do that, but... He skipped level 16. Yeah, now he's level 17. 17. <laughs> Hit level 16 somewhere along the way, and then Roa uh, yeah. did rock. And now he's got blue buff as well. Just got to, Malignance, and he's nearly got a frozen heart. Yeah. Um, well... <laughs> You know, it Love is that itemization, by the way. It's a best of three, at least. So Nongshim, you, know, you can you can look towards game two on this one. Uh, I guess maybe they can try and see if they can separate Paisel and Hands and blow him up. But I really, I just, I'm here to just see what the <laughs> Acidin can do. And it's kind of, you know, yeah. We haven't seen him too much this season. Let's just be reminded of why this champion is uh, such a problem. Showmaker like, played him once. He did, yeah. And that uh, was it. Didn't he get a pentakill? I don't know. I think he was pretty close. It did win. Um, one and zero is cast. I think he might have actually got a pentakill, but I, I, it was definitely he was doing a lot of damage. I can't. Maybe I'm wrong, but regardless, he's. Uh... Dun dun. <laughs> I mean, you got to try to fight something, I guess. But yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah. is a seven thousand Red Bull Baron. Oh, Tobia is frozen hot now, by the way. In case you wanted to kill him, you know. Yeah. Um, so luck. now it's up to call me to kill him. Yeah. It's down three levels. Hmm. And they have double Mountain Drake here in a sec. Just I wonder how much armor he has. And he's going to have a fair bit of health as well with a robot. A lot. It'll be above, yeah, <laughs> 167. Yeah, I mean, it's not crazy amounts, but considering it's Cassadin, it feels like a lot, you know? And especially if you look at the look at the items of, like, Dindin. He's got, like, one and some pieces. Yeah, well... Gonna try to make a play here on Akeem, but he also utilizes the walk away strategy. I mean, it has just been such a powerful tool that Gen Genji have utilized. It's just the walk. <laughs> um, Hiding strategy, and uh, he just wanted to be part of the team. And then he well, wasn't. At least Chovy's level 18, so he can't gain any more levels. True. Um, <laughs> there is a upper limit. I feel like there shouldn't be. I feel like just let them keep leveling. You mean like an if where you just keep going? Yeah. Isn't there like an upper limit that? It's like 30 or something? Just give them stats. Yeah, that'd be a little bit obnoxious. <laughs> you can choose between like armor and magic resist for level 20. Why not both? Well, that's you gotta make a choice. Okay. Uh, this one is just an equalizer to poke, I guess. And uh, you do see double knight's vow. Utilized here by the side of Nongshim. Gonna help out just a little bit. And it kinda just feels like Nongshim are holding on, but I'm kinda struggling to see the window. When they get in, and with the six void bobs as well. Can you see the lose dough? The lose dough, I see it. I definitely see okay. it. Um, I think they're halfway through that one already. Yeah. And Genji, definitely not in a rush to finish this one out. Nope. Absolutely not. Ju does have three items. Picked up the Terminus. And hasn't really been a factor in this game, unfortunately. There still hasn't been a team fight where Nongshim kind of led the charge and we had a big, you know, couple of Wombo engage with the Rel Magnet Storm and the Hostile yeah. Takeover or something. It just never has really culminated in a real team fight. I think it's that so Nongshim hard. Started. It's so hard now as well because everyone on Genji has summons. So even if by some miracle Pays isn't next to Lahens, he could just cleanse Flash, you know? Uh, I feel like that makes it really difficult. You're not going to catch Chovy. Uh, he's got to seek his arm guard as well. So, I mean, honestly, just good luck. Um, well, uh, Dindin might wow. need it here as uh, he is trying to hit some sweet spots. The time that he ripped walked on wow. top of them, he did hit him. Still going. But, um, yeah, I, you're, you're not catching it. <laughs> 
It's have not you, happening, guys. It's so ridiculous. It's so. How many did he use there? I didn't actually keep count, but it must have been like eight or something. Yeah, it was something in that range. Yeah, and eight you know, ten. I respect for Nongshim trying. He they did get his flash at least, but he still had the Seeker's arm gone. <laughs> and he was still like pretty fully. He was like 70, 80 percent HP still on the back of that. Yeah. Well, One, we're gonna take a look. Okay. Just watch Two, the arc cool down. Three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, we don't get a full count. <laughs> I think it might have been counting so well. I think Ox. it might have been eleven. I've been practicing. I think it might have been eleven in total. So I think he used two more to get away after that. Um, count Ox giving us the numbers one to nine. Uh, we couldn't make it to ten. We struggled a little bit. Yeah, that's that's really where double digits apart. Are, yeah, two digits, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> God, what a champion. Yeah. Also, I think what's nuts is the fact that they've been kind of securing both teams' blue buffs now. And it's obviously global, so you don't even need Chobi to be there to get the blue buff. But he's kind of just had permanent blue buff in these situations. Yep. Which is just even more obnoxious. He just, uh, he's always got the damage and the mana. That's what I meant to say the first time. Um, <laughs> Chobi just solo pushing bot lane. And Dundon is not really a match for him, unfortunately, at this point in time. Well, Dundon has a Hex Drinker, so, you know, perhaps I'll help. He does, yeah. You know, a, a good item against the double AP yeah. on the side of Gen G. Surely that will help him deal with the casting. Yeah. Well, oh, that equalizer. Oh. That is a good amount of poke already onto that back line. Cannon just trying to be zoned away, but uh, yeah, Sylvie doesn't get to play the game, neither does Call Me, as they are just getting the tutorial victory. They're taking out all of the inhibitors. Yeah, kind of death by a thousand cuts or death by a thousand rift walks. Um, yeah. and, and walks as well. Yeah, and in walks. This game, yeah. Footsteps. Uh, yeah, nothing really Nongshim could do from here. Aatrox has looked so incredibly powerful in so many of our games here on 14.4. Not this one. <laughs> um, it just looks so sad. You put the chains on the Cassid and he just rift walks out of it. It's like, man, I used to be a champion. I used to matter! He doesn't at this point in time. Poor Aatrox is, uh, yep, they're gonna get it done. Joby just, uh, full-time rift walking into the back line as the seismic shove is not gonna hit him and that is going to be the end of the game. Gen.G take down game number one in this best of three. Yeah, and absolutely no rush whatsoever. I think Gen G are focused on ensuring that they get that first seed. They get any advantage they can get going into playoffs uh, and a game there that was controlled. And I think, you know, it, it obviously looks like Nongshin were making misplays. But I honestly think that, you know, the ideas, the concepts were good and the execution wasn't terrible. I think Gen G were just doing a phenomenal job of shutting it down. Uh, and I think as a team who can you know, not only sort of manage the other team's aggression, but ensure you're getting so many resources. Genji are just so fantastic at that style of play. Yeah. I think, you know, there was the time that Lahens didn't flash, and then there was the time they grouped up in mid and, and kind of got caught out. But at the end of the day, it, it wasn't a big enough cut. It wasn't a big enough swing in favor of Nongshim to really get them into a controlling position to not allow Genji to scale. So what did Genji do? They scaled. Yeah, and this was a 31 minute 49 game. Uh, I think Chovy at the end had like 370, 380 CS. Um, yeah. As a cast, a little bit absurd. <laughs> Not very fair. That's definitely how it felt in that game number one. But guys, we are done here for that first game. We're going to take a break and then have the space to break down that wonderful Cassidy game. And we will be right back.
게임이 들어 밖에 없어 발걸 걷고 자, 나 그냥 뒤에서 봐줄 테니까 편하게 하면 될 듯. 네. 자, 굳이 뭐안 해도 되겠다. 넥서 치자, 얘들아. 네. 더한더 뺄때 있고. 빨리 더 펴. 나 바이오 살아? 맞아. 거의. 입속에 펑당 꺼내줘
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the space. I'm Atlas. I'm joined by Hooney and Chronicler here today, and we're ready to go through what was a somewhat slow but very methodical victory for Gen G. Gentlemen, what did you make of it? Business as, as usual. They were like three minutes slower than they probably could have been had they taken an extra risk or two. But they did have Senna and Cassidy in, so I think they're just like, eh, we're, we're not in a rush. Yeah, I mean, also, also, it's just like more so no, I didn't see the nongshim, the flavor, the spicy, you know? Like, they had a kind of tool they, to bring up the, you know, from the draft, you know, as we see, like, we're gonna see the, the uh, nongshim pick up the, the Kalista and Renata, and they can actually just have a tool that they can go aggressive, but it wasn't enough. Yeah, it was the, it was like the the Western country noodles. It wasn't the it wasn't the actual spicy. It was it was just not really it. But it was Genji playing some uh, pretty strong League of Legends. Let's have a look at the draft here. To that really uh, it kind of dictated the slow pace of this game with some of these choices. In theory, a lot of what Nongshim is doing, I think, makes sense. I think if you try to go late game against Genji, you're just never winning. So they go all in on some genuinely great first half drafting. You get Callista Renata, which is probably the strongest bot lane, barring some Ash, Varus shenanigans. You get Rail, which is a great jungler. So that always looking good. But then with the Talia pickup, that's where things go all right. This Cassidy is so good, because there's three factors why. One, you're playing into Talia, which obviously can't really do a whole lot against you. Chovy also went early, no Magic Mantle. It's 60 MR on his first back. And then you have Rel. It's not Lee, it's not Vi, it's not something or Zinzao that can reliably threaten. So you don't have a way of shutting him down at all. And Rel kind of wants to play for the bot side anyway. So the moment this Kassadin was locked in, we were just like, uh-uh. Yeah. And also, I really like the Genji side, also the picking up the Rumble. At least, like, he can actually neutralize, you know, neutralize the top prior. Yeah, in at theory. Least, at <laughs> least. Yeah, if he built the right He still item. had a top prior, even though he didn't build a wrong, uh, correct item. And still, the Senna TK, and also the picking the the Lee. The Senna TK, obviously, they're going to have a hard time against the Renata Kalista, but the Lee and Rumble actually sort of observes a lot of the pressure from the Oleon game. Yeah, and it, it sort of started out really slowly i feel like you know chovy was just casually farming things up in the in the mid lane we saw the rumble like you say get ahead in the early stages of the game all item builds aside and on the bottom side of the map that's where our first highlight is going to come in and this might look like it's a nongshim highlight it isn't this is actually a gen g highlight like when I was like watching these live, like I was uh, begging, like please do not press the ulti on Talia, please do not. Like if you if you press the ulti, even though you get the kill on TK, like it, of course Alien should have just flashed and not dying, but it just it's just not worth it. It's just one kill on TK and TK had a TP back and also Kassadin just pushing mid for free. These cast these Kassadin just got the gold bounty on him, like at 11 30 minute, 100 on 150 gold against Talia. It's just. It's so tough. Yeah, I think Nongshim already at that point in the game, and as well as they did with the Baron, felt like if we don't do anything, we're going to lose because we're going to get outskilled guaranteed. But as as we already mentioned, like rotating your Kalista uh, over the mid to try and gank the Kassadin also wouldn't really work. You also have Renata, you don't have something that can like get the guaranteed lock uh, down. So they're like, well, maybe we'll kill the hands. And they did just because he didn't flash. And still, it's not enough. Yeah, it just it just didn't quite work. And then we had the game absolutely slow down. There were a couple of opportunities for Keen to get some kills if he had things like Sork Shoes or Leandries, something that uh, Huni was going to go into, but we thought that we'd probably driven the Cassidy is bad with Swiftness Boots. That point was driven home relatively early on. So let's dive into our second highlight here, which was just before the Cassidy hit level 16. So good timing for Nongshim. The idea was there, the secure with like Callista and the Rel, kind of crazy on this Baron. Chofi still has fully stacked Rod as well as uh, uh, his uh, his Archangel's done. So he does so much damage, which means they don't have the tools to actually keep Canyon away. Oh, the kick the, equalizer. Yeah, and just gorgeous. There as well, even if Sylvie gets this Nash, which, you know, he's Rel, you're always going to try to, but he smote too early, it, it wouldn't have mattered. Because Rumble finally got the Leandri right Yeah! Finally. Yeah! But no Sorks, though. My first item on Portal Belt, I kind of hate it, but, you know. Uh, kind of. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but, like, it's just a Gen G. I think they were kind of having, you know, happy gaming in the middle of the... the it's like around, like, 15-minute-ish. They were not actually just playing perfectly. 
So, I mean, that's why the Nongshim still had a chance to go Baron. And I think the Nongshim, at least, they found opportunity one time. Yeah, they did. And unfortunately, it just wasn't enough. At that point, the game was over. It did exist for about another 25 minutes or something like that. But honestly, it, it wasn't really real. And let's have a look at who picks up the POG for this one. I have certain Cassidy vibes going on in my mind right now. And he will be able to pick it up. 1.1K. That is a lot of POG points. Or is it just a normal day in the office for Chovy? That's a good point. That is a good point. <laughs> really? The only one I think that we felt like we could vote for played a flawless laning phase and then did unreasonable amounts of damage the way that you dream of when you see this castle and locks in. And it's not even like he was like actually not getting punishes like single time and then I don't I don't mean there was no new probably like one time Lee Sin just helped like a little bit and other like any other pl play like he's just making just as himself. Pace came in and was like, hello, gave him like a cue. That was it. Yeah, and, uh, and Valdez actually nailed it when he said, like, Canyon just came and pranked the lane. And he pranked the lane to win the game. That, from that point on, the momentum just shifted out of Call Me's favor entirely, and it was just doomed. So there you can see Trovi in the lead, 100 points above Faker, who had just uh, equalized those pog standings. We might be able to see him move back up again, though, because he has been picking them up left, right, and center. 12 out of 12. Um, it's It wasn't a difficult one. It was it? I wasn't even worried about but Media 3. No one no one else who you'd vote for. No one else had any standout moments. Uh, obviously, Keen, self-explanatory, couldn't vote for him because of the items. I, I think Ru <laughs> I think, I think Hootie would have gotten me if I, if I oh, yeah, tried. No. If it's the Leandre Sword Boots, I would just vote the wrong Keen there. 100%. And he would have been, like, it would have been 11 out of 12, and Huni would not have cared. But now it is time to throw it back to the casters to get into game number two. Thank you, space people, for that wonderful breakdown as we are ready to jump into game number two here in just a moment. As Jovi, he's had some dry eyes today, but that hasn't bothered him all too much in terms of the gameplay. As he... Well, he's definitely not shed any tears for yeah, him. Yeah, um, his eyes are perfectly dry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was pretty pretty brutal. We are going to see Fiesta subbed in. We've seen Nongshim toy with uh, switching between these two quite a bit over the course of the season. I think Fiesta has been a pretty solid player in, like, last week, I believe it was, or maybe the week before when he got subbed in, had a pretty strong performance. But, uh, you know, I'm... Still think you're going to have a bit of a tri tri uh, tricky time going up against Chovy. They also elected to go onto the red side here. Uh, the counter pick of the Aatrox did not work in the last game. Um, Gen.G got blue side last time. I I'm not sure why you would elect to do this, but maybe they're going to have Fiesta play something interesting in game number two. Yeah, I just hope they don't run it back. Um... I think probably for me, the thing that you could skip out the first three is the TF. I don't think TF needs to be banned in first three. I just don't... It's normally like a 4-5 pickup. And if we do see Gen G pick in the first three, then yes, it's going to be problematic. Don't get me wrong, but I think leaving the center open is very frustrating to deal with. Um, and perhaps, you know, they could go in a different di direction themselves. They picked up the, uh, the Talia, and like the Karma was still available. They could have leaned towards that. There was no obligation to take the Talia in that situation and obviously ended up setting up for that counter pick. But we'll see. Uh, either way, the band's gone exactly the same way. I would assume they'd go for setup. They haven't. So I think Gen G, if it ain't broke. I'm already writing it in. Like, I didn't even see the pick. It's, it's going to happen. I'm not really sure why this would be the choice, uh, especially after the way that game number one did go. And. I don't know. Like, if we just run it back and Fiesta picks to Leon four, I'm like, well, what are we doing here, guys? <laughs> like, there's no change. Yeah, I at imagine all. that's probably where they'll change things up. Is when they get to four five, they'll hope so. There's no way they ban Cassidy and pick to Leah. I think that would be so crazy. I think they'll probably just change the mid lane pick. Um, this time, Lee Sin was selected first instead of Tom Kench. Oh, drastically different. Um, completely yeah. shakes up the draft. So we'll see. I imagine this is a point where we'll see changes. They are going to ban the Rumble. Uh, Corky and Ari with their previous bans. They could just pick the Ari themselves. I actually think it'd go pretty good with the composition. Yep. Uh, Fiesta definitely knows how to play that one. You take it away from Chovy, you don't have to ban it. Yeah, we'll see what... Uh, 
Genji up the fan if they're just going to go the same direction, if they want to change things up. It would be really messed up if Gen G came out feeling better about that draft than Game 1. Um, and they are going to take away the Jax from the side of Nongshim. Obviously something that we have seen Finden play a decent amount of. Yeah. Uh, the Rumble hits the bench, so they say, hey, maybe they're going to feel a bit more comfortable about picking Jax and then maybe looking for a counter in the mid lane. It's weird because a lot of the time we've seen Jax has been into Aatrox, you know? So I feel yeah. like the fact... Perhaps, perhaps Gen G are thinking they're going to go for the Ari on four, and then they'll take the Aatrox, you know? Uh, because the Ari hasn't been banned. And I think if you give Ari Lee Sin over to Gen G, you won't lose in the same time as last game. You will lose far quicker. Yeah. Oriana banned away. So. It's like they're forcing them onto it. Yeah. All right. Select Ari. Find Ari. Should be pretty straightforward to find it. And select it. There we go. Yeah, they did it. Nice. Good job. Um, they passed the Ari test. 90% win percentage. Uh, you know, good odds. But uh, we'll have to obviously carry that one out. And now they are going to go for that Aatrox. So kind of what I was talking about, the fact they banned the Jax. Kind of predicted that Nongshin would take a mid on four. So... You know, cassante has gone, Jax is gone, Chef is gone, Rumble is gone. Renekton is open, so might see that specifically into the Aatrox. Or maybe Yone. We've seen Dundon play the Yone before. Yeah. Uh, but I still think a good pick up for Keen. And now the mid pick for Gen G into this Ari. They could just go the clear. We've seen this matchup a decent amount. Uh, ultimately, I do feel like, you know, you think, oh, Ari likes to dash. And Talia obviously can counter that, but ultimately the extreme mobility of Ari you can kind of play around the Unraveled Earth well. So I don't think it's really that much of a advantage for Talia. I honestly think the Ari benefits more in this matchup, but obviously we'll right. be happy to take it. And let's do it. This, you know what? Why Lock not? Lock it in. Why not? Just try. Just, just give it a shot. Yep, there it is. Vein top. You know what? They were talking about it on the space. This is that Nongshim spice that we need. Ooh. You know, we needed some heat. We didn't get it in game one. They brought it out in game two. And it means that if this game does end up going later, they kind of have that ace up their sleeve. They certainly can. Um, I, I think range might be an issue for the vein. You know, it feels a bit like the Callista, where you, you got to be in range to deal the damage. We'll deal it in heaping helpings as the game does go along. But uh, then you'll be dealing with a fed Senna, an Aatrox that's potentially in your face. And Talia is going to put down some rocks. And uh, definitely something that has an incredibly high ceiling in terms of yeah. actually getting a lot of value out of it. I think you have the tools. It's just pulling it off is not an easy task to do. Dunder definitely feels like the sort of the player who would be playing things like Vayne Top. Um, uh, but yeah, so I think the drafts are different from last time. There's key differences. There's not as much insurance for the side of Gen G. We still have some aggressive picks for the side of Nongshin, but ultimately I feel like the Rel, Ari, Callista, Renata, it's a pretty strong bot side. And I hope to see them trying to find that same level of proactivity, but the execution, if you're a little crisper, this could really work. Yeah, they're going to give themselves a good crack at a game number two. We'll see if that does lead them in the right direction, or if it looks a bit like game number one, as Vayne Top going to hit the rift for the first time this split as we hop onto it for game number two. Genji, oh no, do reset. Genji, fighting. Nongshim, red force. Hana, do reset. Nongshim, fighting. Ooh. Yes. Fans going hard. Mm -hmm. They're happy to see the vein. The hype for it. It is pretty hype. I do think that, as you mentioned before, you know, Dinden hopping on to the Yone top and stuff like that uh, does show that he is not scared to go for something a little bit out of the meta. And, you know, here you're up against the wall against Gen G. The Aatrox didn't work into the Rumble. Just try something new. And ranged top matchups are all the rage nowadays everywhere. And into the Aatrox, something with a lot of mobility as well. They're very unfun to play into. Be good. And specifically in the Aatrox, it's such a hard matchup because into ranged champions, you obviously can close the gap as the Aatrox if you find a good window. You can land a combo, 
But Vayne's tumble being such a short cooldown means it's very hard to consistently like get the full combo, get it with the infernal chains, hit your sweet spots. But also the condemn. You know, even if you catch out the Vayne in an uncomfortable spot, if she condemns you away, she's fine. There is a ward in that bush. Dinan also uh, pings it out after seeing the interaction. Um, nice little level one here from Ju and Peter. Yep. Good trade. And honestly, early trades before Tom has his E leveled stick so much harder as he's just not going to get the extra regen back. Uh, and we did actually see Nongshim. I, uh, it was Sylvie who went topside and got that ward down. Uh, and I believe it was on the other side, it was Lahens. Lahens? Oh. Um, okay, he's going to flash this one. It's not going to matter. First Blood goes over to Peter on the bottom side of the map, just like that. Yeah, good start. And I believe Jiu just got some... Got a decent amount of gold there, but it was actually... Yeah, it was uh, Peter who got the kill. I think Jiu might have had the... What's it called? The uh, Treasure Hunter? I think I saw the 70 gold pop up. So Jiu getting some extra money, even though he didn't get the kill. Uh, and yeah, Ari, a pretty high win rate. And we'll see if that can be maintained here. Yeah, the RE was one of those big picks, as we got to talk about this. It's been almost 1,500 days since QV lost to Kana in the top lane. Look at this gank, though, in mid. The charm comes down. This is super clean from the side of Nongshim, but where's the damage? It's not going to come through. It finally does, oh. but they nearly both die, as Fiesta is still taking damage from the cannon. Jeez. Yeah, don't die. That would be bad. Um, they managed to get the kill on a Trovi, which is nice, but the, with the trade back, I don't think Trovi's that bothered, and he nearly actually just got a double kill. That would have been catastrophic, but still, good proactivity. It's working well for Nongshim. Top lane is obviously painfully unfun for Keen. That's why you're playing solo queue. Don't care what they say. Just attack the guy. Just yeah. secure the kill. Just the power of the level 1, the slow from Peter, actually very clutch there. And then the, the, just the damage comes through. And yeah, you see the 70 gold pop up, so it does have the treasure hunter and getting good snowball from that. And here, the CC is layered very well, but they just didn't have the final damage. Yeah. And Sylvie ends up getting knocked back. I thought Sylvie, like, canceled an auto, but actually, you know, he just was out of range yeah. at the end there. We did just see Canyon up on the top side, but uh, maybe just a bit more pranking, you know, coming up, trying to help Keen get through the early stage of the lane, and here he is once again. And it's down Tumble. He can condemn Canyon here. Yeah. And the Q is going to miss as well, doesn't even have to cast it. Yeah, I mean, typically when we see a Lee Sin, the best scenarios are when you have laners with CC to set you up to land the Sonic Wave. That's not... <laughs> you're not in the rush, bro. That's not really the case here. Oh, man. If G, if that Q hit, could be a lot of damage coming through. And yeah. Fiesta's moving down. They're going for that proactive angle. Yeah, and this one is a different situation from game number one where Nongshim were getting wrecked in the top lane and the mid lane was Cassidy. So if you give it to Leah free farm for a little bit to put on some pressure, it's actually probably fine, especially compared to a Cassidy. As once again, trying to make this play happen, the handshake does come through as Canyon is here, but it's still going to be a flash forced away from Pace, and they're losing a bunch of uh, minion XP and gold here under the turret. Yeah, they're getting zoned out so hard. Canyon's going to try and chase and make something more of this. We actually do see Chovy's going to be first in the bot lane. This could be a difference maker. Yeah, but does have Fiesta right behind him. The flash charm is not going to land. Fiesta trying to make a difference. You know, I love the idea, but yeah, it just didn't didn't quite connect, unfortunately. Uh, so no more kills to come from that. But I'm loving the pressure Nongshim have put on. It's like, okay, you know, some of our plays backfired last time. Let's amp it up. Let's push it to another level. Uh, and it certainly seems to be going well so far. Fiesta is here, so is Peter. And now it's actually Canyon who's in a bit of trouble, but there's no stun, and now Sylvie's gonna get hit by that knockup. Not gonna take any damage. As, yep, that invade will work out. Yeah, the thing is, you know, now Dundon's coming back to lane with tier two boots. It's gonna be even harder to hit anything on him with the movement speed, but also he's just gonna start really bullying Keen out as you're getting more points in your abilities and just really starting to shred the Aatrox. So I feel like He's kind of weathered the storm so far, but it's not going to get better anytime soon. Yeah. Sylvie's like, I would like to also do the bubs. Please come back. Maybe we'll take them down. Smid lane, Chovy. I was uh, a bit surprised to see him actually just kind of handshake the Talia in this matchup once again. Yeah. I feel like he could have gone a little bit spicy himself. But uh, just elected to go just straight meta, not you know give anything up 
potentially going into playoffs in a couple of weeks. And you put a lot of tension towards top so far this game, just trying to really mitigate the pressure that Dundon can have. And I think clearing that control ward out of the river brush makes such a big difference. Peter really wants to get a handshake himself. This one will be dodged. They're totally fine, but you can see the pressure is there. Yeah, definitely a scary lane to be in. Yeah, Keen, uh, he's not having a fun time. <laughs> yeah, imagine just losing half your HP because you walked up a little bit and tried to queue Vayne. Um, seems a very fun matchup to play. Shouldn't have tried to queue the Vayne. Yeah. Imagine thinking you could fight back in this matchup. Silly Keen. Yeah. Kind of just have to hug turret. If Dinda never moves away, maybe you can hit some of the minions. But outside of that, um, you don't get to play the game much. We should see eventually that Dundon will take down turret plates. And just the pressure alone is going to be a lot as stuns come in. The handshake hits the red buff. And that's not going to feel very good, but Canyon's still in a bit of trouble, has to ward hop away. Yeah, it was nearly actually the cooldown back for Sylvie's W, so he could have been able, been able to chase, but he does get the ward hop off. Uh, and yeah, the red buff blocking that play a little bit, but Canyon definitely being challenged on the bot side. Feels like it's not just Sylvie, but the backup of the bot lane has really allowed them to apply pressure here. I would like to see them translate that into a dragon sooner rather than later, but at least now they are denying these jungle camps. You saw a couple of Nongshim pinks come in and say, okay, well, Canyon's either in my jungle or he's in on his own wolves. And timing was perfect for that. He was right on the red buff. He is level six. And Matovi coming up as well. Oh, you got to back away. You don't even need to be stepped up here. Yeah. And the wall will come down. It is a bit short, so he just kind of walks away and tumbles out of that one. But now he's stunned up against the wall, and that's going to be the end of him. And the three of them should be able to take out the vein as they did just there. Yeah, I think Dunda took too long to react and also flashed way too late there. A hard situation to navigate regardless, but I think he could have maybe played things a little bit differently. Uh, and they will get that kill, which, you know, I'm sure Keen loved seeing Dundun die in that moment. Oh, yeah. As I said before, it's going to it's gonna be a very high skill ceiling for that champ in general. And situations like that, if you survive, you just... You know, maybe you pick up a kill, you have even more pressure on the top side, but instead, now it just means that Keen gets a free back, he gets some more items, and some ability to take a rest from what was the impression for so long. Yeah, and they, they were kind of setting up to look for a dive there, but didn't really capitalize on it. The thing is, when you have a Rel mixed in, it's so good against the Tom Kench because you can just pop that shield. So if you gobble someone and spits them out, you can pop it. Or alternatively, if he uses his uh, Grey Health, you can also neutralize. Now Fiesta take a lot of damage. Fiesta has to back away. Chovy is being a bit of a bully. Yeah. Chari a bit more burst oriented, and the second the charm cooldown is down, Chovy knows he can just sprint right at him and win the trade. Keen once again tried to attack the vein. Yep. This time, though, you see the trade is not as insane. <laughs> yeah, I think here, you know, I think had to flash. He, I think yeah. maybe he thought he could Q out the, uh, the rocks and then end up self stunning, Ooh. and just the follow up is immediate. Nice flash from Chovy, or rather from Fiesta to land the charm, but at the end of the day, Lehens will TP in to keep him safe. Uh, but that is a flash in trade for a teleport at this point in time, as now Sylvie getting Whoa. in there alone 1v2. Uh, Meanwhile, on the top lane, Dundun is not exactly winning this 1v1, and Canyon and Paze are coming on over. No ghosts, no flash now on the vein. Yeah, you know, it was Keen using his flash to return, so in terms of summoners, Dundun actually trades up, but the pressure achieved does mean that we see a translation uh, into the Void Grubs for Gen G. Hens wants to pull a carrier there, you know, doesn't find the angle for it. Yeah, and at the end of the day, they're like, oh, maybe we can look bot, but it's just Lahens. And even if you get him, it's like, well, that's not nearly as good as what Gen G have gotten on the top side. I would still like to see them go for it, though. I think, oh, Dun Dun. Yeah, he's. Um, he doesn't have any sums, so even the slow is going to be really uh, a big issue for him. And I eventually, he just gets run down. I feel like you have to anticipate this. You know they're going to be on the top side. You could have gone 
You could have gone bot and just picked up wolves in the meantime. You could have just waited at your tier two. You know your team are going for an aggressive play on the bot side. You just shouldn't have walked up. Uh, now you're paying double. Uh, they will get the tower in the bot lane, but definitely advantage to Gen G over that passage of play. Yep. Traded turrets. Now King kind of gets to leave this annoying lane for a while. And they're even stealing some of the jungle as they're around. And Paze will get three souls from that as well. Up to 46 already. And uh, yeah, I mean, all things considered, doesn't feel like this vein is working out. Yeah, I mean, clearly wanted to try and get a defensive ward there, but it's one of these situations where Dundon clearly knows the threat, so wants to get the ward, but you should be aware that the threat is there, and so you shouldn't even want to step up to get the ward. Um, and it does end up backfiring Fiesta. Uh oh. Oh, oh, nice charm. Yeah, good charm, but still able to get in range is Canyon and could still try to force out the Spirit Rush with two. Will did not quite have his flash, so if he was going to make a play with the Dragon Kick, he'd have to be a bit trickier. Yeah, really wanted to get that ult down, and especially it's pre-Malignant Sari, so the cooldown is a fair bit longer. Um, and we're dragging up in a minute, burning that pretty substantial. No Aftershock for Sylvie might be a bit of an issue for him, but now the Magnus Storm does come in, and Canyon doesn't seem to care. He's got the Sundered Sky, and he's so tanky, he's healing up all the damage that's going on into him. Charm lands again, and he's just going back in. He doesn't care at all, as Fiesta just does not have the sustained damage to take him down. And even a wall is going to come out here. Maybe Canyon dies now. Now he's just going to flash away, and Fiesta actually is going to live. Has a bit of a bailout and will be just fine. Meanwhile, on the top side, Dundit going 1v2. As the Q sweet spots are not quite landing, but Dundit just doesn't have the damage right now into Keen. And the 2v1 will work out for Gen G. Oh, Pace does have sums. And he's going to flash away, but that's Callista following on the flash. And the hop on over. Another Q to land, but. Not going to continue chasing. Yeah, going to feel a bit frustrating, frustrating for Nongshim not getting those kills onto both Lee Sin and uh, the center there. Canyon just refused to die in that moment. Kept getting new procs of the Sundered Sky, which are just kind of healing ridiculous amounts. And as you said, the damage just wasn't there. Remember, this was an Ari before one item has even been picked up and no ult charges really to play around with. Uh, but it's like, gets, you know, goes in initially on this. Gets the Sundered Sky proc there. Gets focused down a decent bit, but gets another proc there. 219 HP. Gets some healing from the center, and then goes in on Fiesta once more here, and the heal once more from the Sundered <laughs> Sky. He's just yeah. doing so much. He's also got Q2, or rather W2, which uh, gives him a bit. And, yeah, and uh, Conqueror was very stacked. Conqueror, and he's got the Senna. I mean, it's just so obnoxious. Um, a lot of healing. Doesn't necessarily need in the Oblivion Orb just yet, though, but maybe in the future. As this was the, the follow-up here, once Lahens does show up, he yeah. knows he's in a bit of trouble. And I think in the 1v1, different story. Um, I think Dundun's still capable of winning that, but as soon as Atom was there, made things so difficult. And actually, Edge of Night Rush. Jovi in a bit of trouble here. No Unraveled Earth, and Sylvie is on the way as well. He does dodge everything, and there's a big shield, a potential burst, but with the jump in, it is going to be enough. He's getting worried for him there, though, uh, for Fiesta, but you he know, will be okay. This seems so weird, the Edge of Night, but I think the theory out of it is that the only way Dundun can proc it is with the, uh, the Condemn. Yep. So if you go for an all-in, Dundun has to use two Condemns to break it, and if you're burning your Condemn on the shield, you're, you're without it for such a long time, it's so dangerous. So I'm thinking this is the logic Keen is going for, uh, just really playing for that 1v1 against the Vayne. Oh, and Fiesta doing a good job of dodging away from the minions there. Fiesta's Ari is also quite strong. I mean, his ability to land skill shots especially and to angle on this pick has been fantastic based on what we've seen. Yes, the charm doesn't land, but... Regardless, as we're once again up in the top lane bullying Dundin, and down he will go. He does tank that up nicely. Yeah, uh, vein top, perhaps not. Not working very well. Zero for zero now. So now we never get to see it ever again. Yeah, it's Because it failed once, now it must just be bad. It must be. Um, it is not <laughs> having a good game this time, though. And I think the combined effort of Gen G definitely hurting Dundin in that way. I think that is the main issue. I, I do think that didn't, didn't well, expect in some I think 
Big scenarios. I think it's telling that Keen is 101 and Dindin 040. You know? Um, the numbers don't lie. They don't add up. Definitely something I miss here. Uh, and now Genji, they are down these dragons and Cloud Soul, pretty big for Nongshim. Oh, the kick came in as the Condemn did. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Um, yeah, it kind of feels like this topside jungle has just been Gen G's. Um, and constantly Dundun is just trying to farm comfortably and it's not been allowed to happen. It's actually fallen behind in farm compared to Keem. Yeah. Is going to get some alone time now. But remember, this is a vein without teleport. So if something breaks on on the other side of the map, no contribution from the vein. Yeah. And it's no TF, um, which was banned, by the way, by Nongshim. Um, Could have maybe left it open. At least force the ban away, but uh, not the case in this game. Whereas the TF, you know, could be around the map and stuff. The vein is just going to be focusing on that lane, which has not gone well. And all things considered, I mean, the gold is, is relatively even. And Nongshim did get the first couple of drakes. But the fact that Vayne is not really a champion is going to be an issue. And Canyon is also Omega fed. Yeah, I mean, at least the Vayne is eventually going to be a champion just given enough time. There's worse things to be this far behind now, but it's definitely not a good look. And I think the question for Nongshim right now is, do you risk just kind of leaving some of these dragons, or do you, are you forced to contest it? Because you are against the center, a champion that obviously skills exceptionally, but I do feel like fights might be a little bit difficult to navigate now. You can still try for it though, for sure. The cluster is strong, especially if you can get that second item before the dragon spawns. And uh... All right, well. We're trying to bully another top laner. This time it's not the vein, as the kick is very, very nice from Canyon. And look at Toby, he's not even joining. He's like, yeah, you got this, Canyon. I don't need to be here. Q, one time? No, nope, oh, not gonna hit. Oh, Flash man. gets it done. And That's Fiesta. <laughs> yeah, Fiesta's like, come on, man. Yeah. Gentleman's game. So if you're kind of blaming Dundun for dying along the top lane, it's not just him. And also, even if he had three dashes, it still wouldn't be enough. It's true. And Canyon's just gonna onto this. Uh, meanwhile, we do have a bit of a roam. Oh, they're going the in. Top side. They actually have the right... Oh, there are TPs available. <laughs> Something to be careful about. And there is just a wall. Yeah. Just create wall. But there is... Oh, uh -oh. Yeah, That's going to be in the old. Yeah, it is Dragon Spawn now. So I wonder how keen... They have just lost a big old there, but the Ariel's coming back up soon. They Gen got the Edge of Night. Oh, look at the flank. Um, I think he was spotted. <laughs> and you see they kind of check back here, trying to check this brush as a team. It is going to be Nongshim starting up the Drake, and Fiesta has gone very far into the flank, so not sure if they're going to expect this at this point, but is he going to be here on time is also another question. King just gets back over the wall. They spot him now. And the sticks are in the Cloud Drake. This should be easy for Callista Rel, but now a massive Wombo Combo comes in. Canyon doesn't care. He goes forward. The Devourer comes through, and Paze is going to live. Dinan is getting some good damage into that back line, and now Keen is going to go down. Chovy's here all alone and still can't take out Dinan. And he's going to be taken down. The charm is huge after the flash there from Chovy. And Nongshim, they get a Drake, they get two kills, and they're running at the Baron. Yeah, they could just try for this. You know, it could be a little bit risky. But they know that they have the health advantage. Canyons have to heal up with camps. Can they get this done in time? The only TP available is Keen, but he's 15 seconds away. Looks like Genji aren't even going to contest. Just going to let it go. And finally, Nongshim. They get the Kalista. They have the Rel. They have the Renata Glask. And they press their buttons in the team fight all at the same time. Yeah, it Feels was, like the first time today. It definitely is. The engage that came out was pretty phenomenal from Sylvie. And this is kind of the power of the Ari as well. Given that follow through, in the fights, once you start getting kills, Dundun does have a little oopsie moment where he tumbles through the unraveled earth in a second and just nearly dies, um, but does manage to survive. And yeah, Fiesta, the predict there on the flash, so nice. And really having solid performance in these fights on this Ari. It was the well engaged, the laying with Peter, but the follow through the Ari provides so powerful. Yeah. Kind of insane. Uh, all the charms landing as well, even in the team fight at the beginning of it, towards the end. And Nongshim are right back in the game. As you mentioned before, yes, Dindin is very far behind, but he's vain. He'll be a yeah. champion eventually. And the thing is, Gen G don't have the cast in. They can just go, well, you know, if we got to delay Sages, this is a guarantee. 
Senna does obviously scale exceptionally, but we've seen countless games where Senna falls behind in experience, doesn't get as many souls or items as you maybe hope, and doesn't have that impact. 80 souls at the moment. Um, yeah, still a while to go before you're really threatening a huge ranges, and Pays might be in trouble now. Yeah, he's running towards the Tom Camps. They are going to trade ultimates, essentially. Fate's call for the Devour. I feel like you're kind of okay with that as Gen G, as long as you don't get caught out without your Devour on a team fight somewhere in the next bunch of seconds. And now, Jin is just getting, make progress in the side lane. Oh. Now we have a big knockup coming in, and now Peter's going to be isolated. Fiesta does make his way in now as Canyon is in that back line. Gio's in a lot of trouble here as the Q will be followed up on the bailout coming out, but a little bit too little and too late. Genji find their angle, and yes, Dundin is up on the top side. He's still hitting that inner turret, but doesn't feel like Genji really care too much about it as the Lee Sin a bit out of range there. Canyon not able to follow up, and Keen also not able to get the kill done. Yeah, I mean, they get a tier 2 tower, but this is a problem. They don't have the teleport in their veins. So when that fight kicks off, they just didn't have the reinforcements. It was kind of just Nongshim scattering to the winds. And as a result, Gen G shut down the Baron push. Their tier 1 mid is still alive. And they may just be able to trade on this side and, yeah, get this tier 2 tower. So, pretty solid trade up for Gen G. And considering Nongshim were the ones with the Baron, definitely a big advantage achieved for Gen G. Yeah, that's not supposed to happen. And the Rebel Baron power play is at 500 gold. Fiesta doesn't have any vision. So he's oh. not going to see both of those guys. Probably could have at least killed the hens if he knew, but not going to happen. Yeah, and I think the problem is they're just not fully prepared for this. The TP comes in. The W by the hens is phenomenal because it just catches Peter out and forces a flash. But then Canyon, just been so on point with Elise in this game, gets the kick, gets the follow up. They're not able to do anything more out of this. Even dodges away from Fiesta, uses the blue buff to block any skill shots coming through. Yeah. He has been uh, a very slippery and oppressive Lee Sin in this game. As Fiesta trying to look over the wall, trying to get picks himself. He has had a pretty nice game on the RE himself. But, uh, yeah, I, I think we're going to have to wait and see how this next Drake fight does go in a minute. We do have the Trinity Force picked up here for Dindin, so maybe he can be a real threat in these fights once we do get to it. You would imagine that Genji do not want to give away the Cloud Soul for free. No, definitely not. I, I also think a lot of the champions on the side of Nongshim become a lot harder to deal with when you get that, especially like the Vayne and the Ari with Cloud Soul are just so hard to pin down uh, and can very heavily utilize that extra mobility. Like especially Vayne popping the ult. You can pop the ult, tumble, and they just don't know where you're going to be. Because you have yeah. so much speed, you can just reach the other end of the fight before you have to come out of uh, that invisibility. So definitely very problematic. Something to keep our eye on here, but Genji are moving in to try to make a play for the straight. We do have the TP coming in pretty early from the side of Jovi after pushing out that top wave. Yeah, Sylvie just kind of burning Aftershock for nothing there. Not really sure on the play, and Genji doing a good job of establishing vision control. They are the ones on the objective now, and, and Fiesta playing very carefully around this vision. I mean, they do see him. So let's see how they deal with this one. Once again, it's a very similar position to the last fight. As again, the same engage comes through, and Pace is just dead. He's in the front line. A huge Q comes through from the a Aatrox here as Keen trying to do it all by himself, but he's not going to be able to. And now Dundin trying to move forward here. He nearly gets knocked up, but that should be Cloud Soul here for Nomshim. Another big fight win for them. Yeah, huge engage once again from Sylvie. They're nailing the combo, and you can see why they had the priority on this duo together, so much value now. Dinton's fishing. Yeah, he sees him. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay, yeah, just let him go. You no, know, I, I respect the restraint, because I feel like it, I could definitely see a world where Dundun tumbles over and then is instantly met with like a Talia Lee Sin one shot. Um, so patience paying off. But once more, you know, this fight isn't perfect from Nongshin, but the engage was. Uh, Sylvie just patiently waiting for this opportunity, gets the big jump in, the triple hit, and Fiesta does misplay a bit, dashes away from the Aatrox, but gets caught in that stun from the Unraveled Earth and gets one shot. So this fight could have been even better for Nongshim, 
if the Astrid played it a bit better, but Dundon manages to avoid being pinned down. And also, the restraint. They don't chase these kills. They know they have the Dragon to take. They don't go through the Unraveled Earth. And now the Cloud Soul in pocket for the rest of the game. That 20% passive movement speed, definitely huge. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a big deal in these fights that we're going to be seeing here in a, just a moment. I feel like Pease was uh, very far forward in that fight. Um, he was actually the first guy who got hit by the Magma Storm. And yeah. I understand, you know, like Dindin and uh, Fiesta are setting up this kind of like triangulation from multiple different angles. And it is kind of scary. You don't want to get flanked by the vein and kind of get chunked out. But also, if you're in the front line as Senna, you're just <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, you're well, just gonna because die. Because it's AOE CC, Lehens doesn't have an opportunity to eat you unless he's like super preemptive yeah. and you're on top of him. And also, Pays being level 11, his health bar is just so small compared to everyone's, uh, everyone else's. It doesn't take much to kill him. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I mean, the Senna is going to be very important as well. I mean, you, you got to keep your team alive against this engage. You have to be ready to kind of use your range to mark some of the lower range targets, like the 280 carries on the side of Nongshim and try to keep them at bay, but so far we haven't really seen that in this game. It's gonna be so fast with the E. This is Laurel, you know. He's riding actually, a horse, it's actually not on fair. a horse, you know, that's that's what we're looking for. We are looking for Fiesta. Not able to find anything. They are setting up some decent control around the Baron though. And this is where it becomes a little bit difficult for Nongshim. They are still down in gold. The Senna I feel like is in still on that power trough where you're down on levels a bit, but is approaching uh, higher soul stacks as the game goes on. And, you know, we're looking at Elder in three minutes. I don't think Nongshim have secured enough of an advantage. It's like a guaranteed thing. Yeah. I mean, the game continues, and I, I think the biggest thing will be, as always, the execution when it does come to the later game team fights. And I would imagine that Pays will position a bit more passively. They'll try to mark their flanks and not get crushed by that Sylvie engage once again. Yeah, and once you get the rapid fire and, you know, sort of get like 120, 140 souls, there's no reason to ever be close to the enemy team. It's true. <laughs> Your range just gets so incredibly large as, oh god, that is just one way to win the team fight as well. As VS is like, well, I'm not even going to bother. Pressing my buttons didn't even look like he had time as it was perfectly timed from Gen G. And you know, I feel like that brush, the, the little banana brush there, is so strong if you can get control of it. You saw constantly Gen G were hiding in it, Keen was hiding in it for a while, ends up being Chovy, and there's so much space to maneuver in it, and you can hide behind the wall as well, but sets up for a play like that with a double combo onto two of the most important members of Nongshim, and now they're going to try and stop this Baron, but it's a hard task to do without the Ari. 20 seconds till Fiesta is up. All right, the wall's going to come down here as well. Just trying to keep Sylvie out of the pit. It does look like, and let's see if they... Yeah, he's not even going to go for it. In the 4v5, they're just going to let the Baron go. And now the Q is going to land here down onto Sylvie. He's just trying to hop away and get away from them. But they're on the wrong side of the rift. As Gen Z say, okay, cool, you can be behind us. We're yes, just going to push mid. As, yeah, the TP is going to come in. But look at the damage that Sylvie has taken already. Is he's just going to go down for free? And now they don't have a jungler here. Do you also have enough flash away? The charm is blocked perfectly by Lahens. And Fiesta not able to do anything. Genji sticking true as a five man unit. Managing to find that kill on the Sylvie. And the thing is, because we didn't get that set up, time and. Oh. I think he sees well. you. <laughs> and they're just stopping the backs here. They're just allowing them to, uh, you know, the teammates to come in. Oh, a very man. nice angle on the kick as Fate's Call will come out. Jiu is desperate on the bailout, but it will not matter. This Gen G now pushing mid with their Baron buff. It just kind of feels unfair. You know, Canyon on Lee Sin has just been so good this game. All the little stuff that happens in these fights, he's just playing them. It just seems perfectly. And now Nongshim, they got the dragon, but. After two sort of misplays in a row, they've just uh, entered into a massive gold deficit. 6,500 gold behind, but it's about 1,000 before. And this is a play you can see Chovy is kind of defensively positioning there behind the train and then moves forward, catches them both. That banana brush, man. It's broken. You were um, yelling at me all the time in solo queue to get vision in that brush. Now I, I told you. Now I, I told understand. You. It's so good. I had to watch this game. Now I get it. Yeah, whoever controls the brush controls the river. And uh, <laughs> yeah, this kick from Canyon, he's just always finding the angles. So well played. Jiwoo tries to get the turnaround, but it's just not quite there. 
And I like the fact they brought three members. They didn't want to risk like a 2v2. They didn't just send, uh, you know, for example, Canyon and Chovy. They ensured they had three. So no chance of an outplay from Longshim. And I feel like that's textbook Genji. You don't give the opportunity. Yeah. Don't even humor them. And we had, uh, well, oh, man. we have an engage from Renata Glass. Kind of unfortunate, oh. but uh, all of our Renatas try to do this. Sylvie trying to get in there, trying to catch them off guard with the counter engage. Not really going to work out. They do get the flash out of Jovi, but it is a free feign kill on the backside of this fight as here comes Lahans on the engage. And now Sylvie will be the second one to go down. Penta angle potentially here for Keen as he is on the double. As uh, there it is, triple coming in, and that's going to be a steal from Pays. So no Penta this time around, but it still should be the 2 0 from Gen G. Canyon, he's got a GA. This time he actually can't just run at them with no fear in the world. As down will go the Nexus Turrets, and down will go Gnome Shim, as Gen G do pick up the 2 0 tonight. Yeah, definitely started to feel a little bit desperate in the end that engage with Peter, not the best. And with that, unfortunately, Gnome Shim no longer able to make playoffs. They are. 100% out. Uh, they had a hard run ahead of them regardless. And uh, to be honest, starting with Gen G definitely didn't set them up with good odds. But I respect the fact they still put up some competition in that game too. And they were proactive throughout both games, even if it definitely looked like this was them being outclassed. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of those fights looked pretty good, but Gen G did not look all too bothered. And they just found really nice angles in the in the mid to later stages of the game after that first Baron where they were just like, hey, you're out of position. We capitalize on that mistake. Hey, uh, you know, you're checking this river. You don't have vision of the banana brush. We take advantage of that mistake and we take the, the Baron down and it's turned the game around so quickly, kind of made our heads spin. I think that's the frustrating thing against Gen.G is when you think you've caught them out, so often they're able to defend against the play and actually mitigate it. Yeah. And then you make like one mistake and it won't even be like, It'll be like, it'll feel like a minor mistake at the time, and then it'll just get exploited so heavily. It's like, okay, we lost the whole game. Yeah. Uh, it's so quickly to turn around. And it definitely felt like that was a game that was in Nongshim's hands to win, and then Gen just joined it. They absolutely did. They stole the candy away from the baby, who in this case is Nongshim, unfortunately. Um, and they'll be happy with that victory. I don't think that Jovi will get a second POG victory for the Church of Jovi, but he got the first one at least. I would imagine that Canyon probably picks this one up for game number two. I don't really know um, who else can get it. sabotaging Chovy so he can't get first. He's trying to keep him down, give him fake personal. Yeah, That's crazy. You know, Showmaker's also close to the top as well, so perhaps, you know, yeah. can you help him out as old teammate? <laughs> hmm, the plot The forbidden old love <laughs> between Canyon and Showmaker. Yeah, I He's feel like... got some work to do, I think, though. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't been doing a great job of it, yeah. you know? Showmaker is just like, bro, come on. He's at 1,100. <laughs> Are you really trying? Um, but he was trying this game. I think we could definitely say... Uh, again, uh, you know, even though Nongshim only have two series wins, even though they've been blasted by Genji pretty consistently over the history, they still always give it their all. Uh, and Dunder got set behind significantly, but we had some pretty masterful engages coming out with the Rel, with the Renata. They at least showed some positive signs in this game, even if they couldn't follow through all the way. Yeah. Keen kind of awkwardly trying to just walk away from that one. He tried to utilize the walk strategy. It did not work out. Got charmed by Fiesta. And Nongshim, they got Baron and were like, oh, are they going to win this game? Are they getting ahead? And then they're like, well, Vayne doesn't have TP. We take a 5v4 in mid. We take this win. We get a pick off later. We take the Baron of our own. And even though they got engaged upon once again and gave Cloud Soul over, oh man, quite matter. That combo was so beautiful. Yeah, just unfortunately they didn't get more kills out of this play. Um, you know, maybe that could have been a difference maker. Maybe could have made more of an impact. But then here, I think this is the moment that they're really gonna feel painful about. I think if one person gets hit by that, it's not as bad. It's still probably just Fiesta dying, but the both get hit is devastating. Just take it slow, take it slow, take it slow. Peel, fame. They were saying go for Kalista, actually. Yeah, I think it was Pei's hit uh, flash oh, on to oh, yeah, Jiwoo. Oh. 
<laughs> Pay's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. Uh, why did you take his Penta away? Oh, oh, Penta? Oh. It was a Penta. Yeah, it's kind of messed up. Yeah, oh, what, what the, the hell, Pays? Wow. Wonder Shameful. See, oh, he's like oh, sheepish. He's like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. What have I done? I gotta get out of here. Yeah. You know, it was pretty even for a lot of the game, and then it just kind of feels on a coin. It's like, okay, well, we win now. Yeah. And it's uh, it's difficult to take games off of Gen G, who at the moment best team in the LCK. Nomshim not able to scratch them this time. That does make their series and actually game score in the head to head, thirty four to one. Well, since they both were in the league. Yeah, you know maybe next season they'll be able to bump it up a little bit. They might be able to double their total game wins. Yeah, they have a much easier time of doing that than Gen G has. Yeah. Gen <laughs> that's very 68, true. Sixty eight, you yeah. know. But uh, at the end of the day, Gen G were the better team. They take the 2 0. Let's see what the space had to say about that game number two. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Great cast on the day for the first series, and big congratulations to Gen G picking up the 2 0. However, I do want to say that it's not the easiest 2 0 that they've had this season. Nongshim making them work for it in the middle of that game number two. I've got Hooney and Chronicle here. They're going to break down the draft for me. Take it away, boys. What, what, did, we, what did we see that we liked? Well, the obvious talking point is going to be our boy Dundun, who oh, both yeah. showed in the early laning phase why it feels great to play a ranged top into a melee matchup, and then also showed us very graciously why it doesn't feel great to play a ranged top against a team in competitive play as uh, he got uh, mercilessly beat down. Again, the core game plan from Nongshim, I think, is the right call. You're never going to beat Jinji when you get to the latest stage of the game. You just have to try and get an early lead and snowball off it. And they got a Cloud Soul. It almost felt like it could happen, but I think at the back of our mind, especially with the amount of late game scaling that Genji had available, we, we knew. Yeah, I mean, it was like basically exactly the same draft as a game one on the you know, first phase of the uh, draft, which is like the Renata College that was pressuring in bottom, like really toughly, and also the Rel was kind of backing up. But I think if they really want to play like that way, I think I wouldn't really recommend it, the vein top there. You know, like, I was like really sad to watch the vein, like, cause I'm, I, I, I played it before as professionally. I'm a, I am an expert. I am a ranged <laughs> top laner, as known as like, you know, like I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at it. But like, I was like really sad to watching like the rail was not coming top. They're just go, they went to the red side jungle invade instead. I've and not you it. playing ranged top, Rooney, and I like, know that it's not like, a great time. No, like man, like. You yeah. can't do that. Yeah, it, it, it really, it would have been a good Renekton angle. As happy as I think we all were that Dundon did it because he is that guy. Uh, I think the best example actually has been both Gen.G and KT lost split with Keen, where they split the map towards the ranged matchup so that you really get to push. Because if you do get a lead, it's so much more oppressive than it would be in a melee matchup. And because Gen.G both didn't give the opportunity and Nongshim didn't play towards him, it never ended up becoming that huge threat that you had to deal with inside. And we have seen, you know, Twisted Fates work in side lanes um, as Jeez. recently as not very long ago at all. Uh, Tristana was played up there as well as the, the Smolder from Kingen that actually worked very, very well. Vayne, I think, is like all in on I just want to like play for my lane and we're going to make it happen. And uh, Keen's been playing it in solo queue as well. It's actually really funny that uh, it's Dundon that brings it out. Of course, he does like the crazy tech. But we do want to focus on the fact that Nongshim were able to create some opportunities. Shout out to good old Sylvie finding some great angles on the rel. And that's our first highlight here. We are going to dive into it as we can see that they did have some really good setups. Sylvie has improved so much on this roster, really has been, I think, way more consistent and able to play way more champions. And this Rel Engage almost felt like it was enough to actually take down Denji. Yeah, I mean, basically they play, they want this team fight without almost a top laner. Like, that's how big it is for, that's how big it is to the Nongshim there. And the engage was so good. And I think that shout out to Peter as well. Like every single time when their Sylvie goes in the perfect time, the follow-up was really great. Even Fiesta Ari, like exactly when he know, like he knew that like when he actually need to land the charm, the person, and it's like the timing is like was everything was really, really great. That's how they won. Even though it was like they were like three thousand gold behind, it was really impressive. Yeah, it was absolutely amazing. I think 
The fact that the game was just naturally falling out of their control was the largest problem to me. The fact that more money was just going over to Gen G throughout this game. But Nongshim just had some great skirmishes, you know, as they generally do find. You know, they're, they're the best friends club. They can play together really, really well. But when they're isolated in lanes, they bleed a lot of gold. And uh, we can see the result of uh, the first mistake as we'll dive into it here. This was that Baron play from Gen G where it all kind of went wrong for Nongshim. Can't have that happen up near that brush where they know as well that there is vision control for Genji. They know that they can't really take that risk. That's that's all they need. That's all Genji need. That's all that we've seen T1 need as well. Just one mistake like that, and the game is done. And they try their best. Sylvie can't actually get into the pit because of the Chovy wall, so he can't do the Rel thing and steal it. And from that point on, there's nothing that they can really do. Yeah, I mean, Nongshim were in such a great spot. Like they had, a, they have a soul. They or just a as a team composition right now with the Cult and Renata and they have a top vein. Rail jungle with the mid, the, the also making playmaking the champion. It's just so sad to watch like a game. Like this is like so not organized. It's like for Nongshim, like just get one, get one pick and then just losing the Baron and into the Gen. Just they're so teamed up. They're so separate. Just falling up just one each. Oh, this, this is, is where like Canyon gets POG by the way. Woo! Oh, that kick. Just gorgeous. Unnecessary, uh, but beautiful. Yeah, he'd already run the early game to a very, very satisfying level. And he was like, I maybe there's some Chovy voters out there because of that, you know, that, that seismic shove? Mm -mm. No. Well, we'll have to find out. Let's have a look right now at who's going to pick up the POG. I definitely have some polar bears in my mind right now as we look towards it, but maybe there will be some casual other votes. There it is, 800 points for Canyon. I believe now, um, once again, title... No, was it 700 for Pyoshik yesterday, or did he move up to eight? I think it was 700. He's up here now with uh, tied with, I think, his old buddy, Showmaker, yeah, Showmaker. Also currently sitting at the same amount. And the jungler's job, when your top laner is playing a ranged matchup, I think absolutely pivotal, as you would know, Huni. I mean, also, it's more so like, I think the Dongshin play really, really great around like, just invading jungle, using the prior ollie, but like, I think the Canyon also, he juked it where they actually pressured on. 800 points, of course, Faker and Chovy still out in front, and Chovy not able to create that extra 100 gap. Let's have a look at, uh, yeah, of, yeah, that's uh, not surprising. Not surprising. Trovi had a great game as well. A couple of really big and got the big turning point when he found the uh, dot two. That one shove. So Sometimes shove. all you need is one shove. But now it is time for us to throw it over to Deer as we get into the interview. Thank you very much, guys. This is Deer for the POG interview translation, joined by Chovy and Canyon on the side of Genji, who have reached the first 14 wins of spring. Chovy, you now have reached 110, uh, 1100 POG points. How do you feel? Now I'm the first place in the POG standings, but I don't think there is a big difference between first and second, so I believe that anyone will be able to chase me down uh, for the first place so I can't get my let my guard down. And Canyon, how do you feel? Really happy that we're able to keep our place in the standings. In game one, Chovy, you picked Cassad and Titalia, and it was a pick that could have gotten pressured early. So what led you to pick this bold, uh, bold move? I can't really share exactly why. Uh, I can say that it was a good pick because uh, there's a talk within the team. It's a it's a strategy that I cannot leak. So now, a Fed Cassidy really turns the game around. What really gave you the control was this next highlight here. Canyon pulls a steal, and Chovy gets three kills right here. So can you walk us through what happened here? So the enemy actually got in a really bad position while trying to get Baron. And I think we were able to secure Baron and also uh, clean up after this team fight. Canyon, did you predict that you would steal the Baron? The enemy had Rel and Callista, so I think I was just trying to predict that my smite, and I got pretty lucky. So in game two, the opposing team swapped their mid laner out, 
and selected red side and took top vein as your last pick. So did you predict any of these moves? So while playing solo queue, I know how OP top vein is and I told Keen that he should try. I think we're just very aware of how good it is. And so Canyon, what did you consider as an important factor after this draft? I believe uh, that as long as we target down the vein, it would be an easy game and I think that actually worked really well. Yeah, so Canyon, you really focused down and pressured the vein and it looks like your skill distribution against Ari was on point as well. And as an undefeated Lee Sin player, what is your secret to maintaining your Lee Sin skills? As much as I play a lot of Lee Sin in uh, solo queue, I think I just have to practice Sonic Wave, uh, your Q skills in solo queue, and that's probably how you get better at Lee Sin. And until the middle of game two, the enemy took every objective, but there was this one moment where you really turned everything around. And Talia pulled an insane seismic shove, so... You know, it was at Baron, and I didn't really expect that I would hit anyone, but I knew that they were there, so I got... I got a lucky. I got pretty lucky because I was able to hit two people. And over numerous games, many see the mid jungle synergy between you two improve over time. So, what are your thoughts on this? Do you feel this firsthand? Personally, even from the beginning, we had really good synergy. It just went really well. And I don't know if I can say that I can feel firsthand that we are improving our synergy. I feel like it does work really well in practice and on stage, it's always different. So Chobi believes that it has always been there. But what about you, Canyon? I think I agree. Uh, along with Chovy, there are a lot of really good players in our team, so that's probably what enables us to have such good synergy, or what it looks like. So Genji is on an unstoppable mon momentum, and you have not dropped a single game in round 2, so is an undefeated round 2 something we can look forward to? And we're very determined to win. I think we can definitely aim for an undefeated round 2. And you will play D plus Kia next. And it'll be uh, your against your former teammates, Chovy. Please share your resolutions with your fans. Lately, uh, when we watch our VODs, uh, we definitely have a lot of things that we can improve on, so we'll make sure that we are prepared. And Canyon, we'll make sure that we are prepared at, to win against D plus Kia in our next match. And this will be the end of the interview, and back to the space. Thank you so much, dear, and fantastic to hear from both Canyon and Chovy there taking us through their aspirations for the next match. I kind of wanted Canyon to throw some shade towards Showmaker there um, for the second meeting uh, here in round two, but not to be the case. Other way around, I, I give you higher odds. Yeah. Uh, Canyon have... doesn't really pick fights. No, he doesn't. He definitely doesn't. Let's have a look at the standings and see what has happened here. I have a feeling Genji might be in first place. Wow! Nailed it. Uh, Nongshim still uh, all the way at the bottom as well, as Bro did manage to pick up that third victory. Nongshim still really struggling. Game score is not too bad. That's, that's, there you that's, go. that's, that's something. Actually, that's, that, like, that's the best you can say. Four ahead of Bro, and they're ahead of them in the standings. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, and also, it's gonna just keep going, and we'll see how far they can go. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been pretty impressive for Genji so far, but speaking of impressive, we've got one hell of a matchup coming up after the break. And even during the break, we have Secret Boardroom with your boy Hooney on it. So it's only entertainment from here on out. We are going to go, but when we, uh, when we come back, we'll have that banger for you.
엑스! 두려움을 모르는 팀! 피오 확정됐다고 생각하지 마세요! 대왕 광동! 접점입니다. 광동 브리스 들어오세요! 마지막 한 자리를 두고 경쟁하게 됐는데 굉장히 욕심이 나기 때문에 저희가 꼭 차지할 수 있도록 하겠습니다. 플레이오프는 저희가 가겠습니다. 오늘 시크릿 보드룸 회의를 시작하도록 하겠다. 내가 요즘에 고민이 많아. 와, 무슨 고민이 있으십니까? 갑자기 저희가 있는데. 나이가 있으시잖아, 이제. 혹시 그 메뉴가 우승 못할까 봐 그러시는 거 아니죠? 걔네는 원래 우승 못하고. <웃음> 다름이 아니고 이 MSI 분석 말이야. 냉철하고 이제 확실하게 딱딱 말해야 되는데 니들은 내가 보니까 니들 너무 물렁물렁해. 저는 그냥 깔끔하잖아요. 국민은 안 된다. 너는 뭐 어떻게 된 거야? 저는 근데 이게 또 아, 알다시피 국내 LEC 팬들이 많아요. 제가 괜히 또 이렇게 헛소리를 했다가 막 3천만 LEC 팬들한테 또 아니 뭐 나는 뭐뭐 뭐 LCS는 팬 없어 지금? 근데 너는 이게 문제야. 이쪽이야 뭐 그렇다 치더라도 너네도 벌써 이렇게 몸을 살이잖아. 살이면 안 돼. 안 되겠어. 내 이럴 줄 알고 오늘 또 너희들처럼 이렇게 물렁물렁한 애들 말고 너네 자리를 위협할 수도 있어. 얼마나 센 인물이길래. 진짜 냉철한 분석을 해줄 새 유원. 자 들어오게! 박수! 와! 진짜 초영자가 왔네? 엑스큐즈! 이 파고마 피어스 팀 서포터 엑스큐즈 음. 이정훈입니다. 와. 당당해. 보통은 이제 내가 소개 좀 해지 이렇게 하면 얘기를 하는데 벌써 뭐 알아서 탁탁 나오네 멘트가. 그게 이 친구가 유럽에 있다 와서 그래요. 이 어. 친구 또 유럽 그 음. 아스탈리스의 마지막 후예 아닙니다. 아 근데 엑스키도 자네가 이제 시크릿 보드룸에서 활동을 하게 됐어. 그래서 음. 우리는 절대 본인의 이름을 밝혀서는 안 돼. 음. 어, 그래서 오로지 코드명으로만 우리는 활동을 한다. 그래서 자네 닉네임에 어울리게 내가 좀 하나 준비를 해왔어. 오! 오. 오. 정님이 임명해 주시는 거 처음 아니야? 코드네임 빌로틴. 말도 안 된다. 어때? 이 센스 뭐야? 빌로틴. 자, 어, 어떻게 뭐 마음에는 드나? 빌로틴. 마음에 드네. 빌로틴. 마음에 드네. 어. 반두대 처형자. 단련이 좀 있어. 마음에 드네. 마음에 드네. 마음에 드네. 위아래가 높인 말이 없지만 야, 코리아. 근데 어, 국장님 이런 그렇고. 일 이런 일 하라고 부르신 거 아닙니까? 쉽지 않네요. 아니 그래도 그렇지 초면 얘기 하시기 어린 놈. 국장님도 너무 물렁하세요. 네. 아니 우리한테 반말해도 되는데 아무리 그래도 국장님인데. 아, 국장님. 네. 어, 네. 마음에 듭니다. 국장님. 그렇지, 그렇지. 음. <웃음> 마음에 듭니다. <웃음> 이제 좀 본격적인 엑스큐트의 좀 이야기를 들어볼 텐데 진짜 이게 제일 궁금한 이야기야. 음. 에리시 오퍼 아. 어떻게 받게 된 거야? 팀을 못간 시절이 있어, 있었는데 오. 주변에서도 일단 팀을 구할 거면 솔랭을 올려라 최대한 음. 올려라 해가지고 음. 3위까지 찍었을 때 너한테 관심 있는 팀이 있다. 근데 그치? 에리시 팀이다. 아. 갈 생각 있냐? 
엄청 좋지 그러면서 바로 가겠습니다 하고 에리시 아스탈리스에 들어가겠습니다 유럽인데 망설임 없이 가기로 마음먹은 거 보면 영어가 좀 됐나 봐 그때 당시 진짜 영어를 하나도 못하는 정도였고 오. 그래서 네. 엄청 난항이 처음에 심하지, 심했었어 아예 영어 하나도 모르고 백지 상태로 영어. 거의 백지 상태로 그럼 이게 아스탈리스 이거 한국 선수도 없었는데 의사소통은 어떻게 한 거야? 게임 내용 그 영어는 좀 간단해가지고 가기 전에 엄청 조금이라도 배우고 어. 킬 킬. 어. 고 어. 컴 스타 어. 백 백. 어. 그러고 보니까 캔이나 뭐 켄트 뭐 이런 게 되게 헷갈렸다고 스크림을 하는데 우리 팀이 아이 캔고 이래가지고 형 들어갈게 하고 난 들어가는데 갑자기 <웃음> 알고 보니 알고 보니 얘네 지금 집 짓고 있어 아 그래가지고 알고 보니 켄트였다 네. 그래서 이제 퍼즐을 걸고 왜안 왔냐 했는데 자기는 켄트라고 말하는 거야 아이 켄트 아 아센트가 이게 켄과 켄트는 진짜 현지인들도 어떻게 하냐면은 켄하고 켄낫 이렇게 한번더 물어봐요 현지인들도 이거는 구분을 잘 못해요 어떻게 해결했어? 그걸 어떻게 해결했어? 결국 해결 방법이 켄트 켄 이렇게 비슷하니까 켄낫으로 하자 우리 아, 여기 똑같 여기 현지인이 어. 이렇게 될 현지에서도 이렇게 될 수밖에 없어요 진짜로 켄이랑 켄낫으로 아니 뭐 들어보니까 팀원들의 배려가 좀 많았던 것 같아 거기 제가 처음에 갔을 때그 어. 형들이 케어도 잘해주고 못 알아들을 때 번역기 돌려주면서 천천히 천천히 해라 어떻게든 케어해주려고 그런 면을 많이 어. 보여주지 않나 나중에 누가 그 그분들한테 초급 아, 초코파이라도 한 박스 동물이죠 초코파이 한국인의 어, 정 보내주지 정. 오케이 우리도 보내줘야 응? 돼정야 네. 보내주라고 보내줘 아니 네가 뭐 네가 해 아, 제가... 네가 유럽 담당이잖아 너보고 얘기하는 거야 지금 신인을 시키면 어떡해 어이 베를린 야 그럼 에이플 담당이 거기 보내겠냐 그래 그러면? 내가 보내냐 자 됐고 시끄럽고 <웃음> 너는 뭐 유럽 가서 도움 좀 있었나? 도움 되게 많이 받았죠 저는 뭐 거기 이제 특히 레이노버 선수라고 이제 한국인이 있었으니까 같이 갔었잖아 어렸을 때 사이판에서 좀 살았어요. 영어를 아 이미 잘하는 상태로 가가지고 진검다리 역할을 해줬구나. 저는 편했죠. 아 그럼 뭐팀 그때 동료들하고 뭐 같이 좀 놀러 다니고 뭐 그런 에피소드도 있다? 하나 에피소드가 있는데요. 에피소드가 음. 있고 팀원들이 배려를 해주려고 음. 영화 하나 한 편을 카이트 플레이스. 플레이스. 뭔지 알아? 뭔지 소리가 안 나고 안 나고 공포 영화. 아 자막에 아, 아 필요가 없어. 아, 아니 좀 적게 나오는 아, 별미 나오고 아, 그걸 준비해줘 같이 봤다고 가서가지고. 아 진짜? 와 완전 특화된 영화였네. 그리고 그건 되게 재밌게 봤어? 역시 형들이 좀 케어를 잘해주고 나를 어. 엄청 아, 따뜻하다. 그렇게 배려도 많이 받고 그랬는데 거기가 그 위치가 어디길래? 이게 덴마크라는 곳에서 아, 덴마크, 생활을 해가지고 숙소가 덴마크면 이게 어떻게 되는 거야? 그러니까 덴마크면 이게 베를 네. 경기장이 베를린인데 거기까지 간 거야 그럼 경기할 때마다? 경기 전날에 스크림을 끝나고 공항 가가지고 경기하고 어, 가서 아. 이제 타고 베를린 숙소가 따로 있어 하나. 어. 그래가지고 거기서 자고 네, 어. 다시 경기하러. 아니 나 궁금한 게. 그럼 일주일에 그한번 그렇게 하는 거? 매주. 와. 공항에서 막 비행기 바로 뜨진 않잖아. 그러, 그렇긴 하죠. 뭐 타자마자 버스처럼 출발합니다. <웃음> 그러고 <그런 건 아니야. 웃음> 아, 얼마나 번거롭잖아. 타고 가야 되지. 그렇긴 하죠. 그걸 일주일 매일 탔으면 어, 좀 힘들었을 것 같은데. 와. 컨디션도 그렇고. 얼마나 걸려? 어, 이거, 이게 제가 계산해 보니까 어. 그냥 지도상으로는 땅으로 이동했을 때 6시간 50분 걸리더라고요. 와. 아, 비행기, 비행기 얼마야? 비행기는 한, 한 40분? 한 시간? 어, 여기서 서울에서 한 제주도? 제주 느낌. 어. 가끔 한 번씩 비행기가 지연돼가지고 어. 비행기가 안 된다. 못 간다. 못 간다 해서 그럼 이제 숙소 거기서 하겠다 해가지고 어, 속으로 좋았어 안 어. 좋았어? 뭐, 저도 그거 솔직히 좋았어. 다들, 솔직히... 다들 팀원들 다 좋았고. 개, 개꿀 아, 아니야? 개꿀. <웃음> <웃음> 비행기 엄청 탔을 거 아니야? 응. 마일리지 좀 쌓았나? 많이. 근데 그거는 이제 팀 쪽에서 해주는 아, 거. 아, 에이, 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 진짜. 에이, 야, 이게 너무하네. 그걸로 국장이 해외 한번 시켜드렸어야지. 자, 갑자기? 너나 나 시켜줘. 너 중국에 있어 나 시켜줬어? 그러니까. 너 중국에 있어 나 시켜줬냐고. 부르지도 않았으면 좋겠어. 그러니까. 밥은 어땠어? 사실 아... 먹는 문제는 어떻게 배려할 수 아... 없을 것 같은데. 유럽 밥이 진짜 답이 없어요. 어땠어? 일단 밥이 제일 먼저 안 좋았습니다. 유럽이랑 한국 쌀이 엄청 다르다 말이야. 찰기가 없어요. 유, 유럽 쌀은. 진짜 막 푸석 푸석 푸석해. 아, 그 맛이 없었구나. 도저히 못 먹겠어가지고 아, 어. 치킨이나 그냥 뭐 햄버거 음. 그런 걸로만 좀 생활하면서 먹었지 않나? 아, 저도 아니, 가서 연어밖에 안 먹었어요. 거의 그냥 뭐 북극곰. 너 그냥 연어를 좋아하는 거 아니야? <웃음> 너는 행동했던 거 아니야? 약간 연어 좋아했던 거 아니야? 살찌긴 했어. 그래, 어, 그러니까 어. 넌 좋았겠지. 아니 그럼 어때서 상하이는 LPL 어. 갔을 때 중국 음식 잘 맞았어? 전 너무 잘 맞았거든. <웃음> 중국밥을. 야, 너는 그냥 귀하해. 아, 가 그냥. 아 요즘 오해 좀 풀렸는데 그러시면 어떡합니까? 무슨 오해가 풀려? 
어디서 풀렸어? 아, 아닌가? 요 어떤 오해가? 너 아직도 지금 FA 그러한다는 소문이 있어. 아, 네? 아. 너 자꾸 어, 무슨 팀마다 FA 팀들 좀 부진하면은 눈독 들인다는 얘기가 있어. 너, 너 연말에 막 소침 좀 했다는 그런 소문이 있던데. 에이전시랑 컨택하고 아니, 있다던데. 아니야. 아이, 진짜 저 SK밖에 없습니다. 당신 <웃음> <웃음> 얼굴, 얼굴 지금 지금 건강, 건강. 찔러보고 있는데 이렇게 당황하니까. 아니, 진짜. 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 아니, 밝혀졌어. 국장님, 국장님이가 빨개요, 목덜미가. 아, 근데 진짜인가 본데? 진짜 가능. 다, 제, 다 재고 있나 본데? 엄청 힘들었네. 보니까 그러니까 밥도 안 맞아. 네. 언어도 안 맞아. 돼. 왔다 갔다 해야 돼. 진짜 힘들었겠네. 그런 힘든 상황에서 어. 요원길 로틴이 그래도 경기에서 활약을 했단 말이에요. 와. 아, 그러니까 7인왕이었다며. 몰랐네. 그런 활약상을 또 그냥 안 보고 갈수 없는 거 아닙니까? 아, 보고 가야지. 제가 또 자료 준비했어. 아, 자료 준비했어? 어디서? 누구야? 오, 온다, 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 온다. 아, 와, 뒷고 바로 풀. 와, 넘기고. 어, 스킬 연계가 방해 끌어 봐. 아, 진짜. 또와또와 이번엔 남이에요 남 정훈 타이밍 리 올트 워칭 웨어 이즈 예상 예상 오 이름 다 먼저 깔끔하게 글자리로 맞췄는데 퍼펙트 타이밍 그러니까 신상 맞는 거야 파이크가 또 원래 주케라고 하던데 맛있는데 아니 본인 활약상 좀 보니까 기억이 나나 저 상황 때 기억나고 엄청 멋있다고 생각하고 다시 봐도 잘했다 아니 근데 말이야 게임만 잘하는 게 아니야 오또 이게 내가 몇개 긁어왔거든? 한번 봐봐. 이 순진한 얼굴인데 뱉는 말들이 매칭이 안 되는데요? 아, 굉장히 매콤하더라고. 유럽 그 자체인데? 어. 아, 이 원래 성격이 이런 거야? 유럽에 가서 이렇게 된 아, 거야? 아, 왜 이렇게 트레이스 토크를 많이 했어? 원래 그런 성격, 그, 그런 사람이 아닌 거, 아닌 거였는데 음. 이제 유럽의 문화가 트위터에 이렇게 연기로 좀 많이 돼 있어가지고 음. 나도 그냥 문화에 빠져서 대사 적응하자 해가지고 그 막상 해보니까 이제 좀 숨겨져 있던 나를 알게 된 살짝 내가 이겼나? 페이스 토크가 또그 맛이지 이렇게 막해 음. 하고 나면 이게 또 사람인 이상 좀 감정적일 수도 있잖아 아, 있지. 그러니까 뭐 싸움이라던가 뭐 경기 끝났는데 악수하는데 악수하다고 딱 치고 간다던가 뭐 그런 거 없어? 막 멱살 잡고? 감정적인 사람들이 좀 있더라고 음. 음. 그럼 너도 카르지랑 아 그건 아니고 <웃음> 카라지랑 이제 플레이스 토크를 좀 많이 하긴 했는데 어. 그 선수가 워낙 착해가지고 아 그리고 또 이게 또 친하면 친할수록 확실히 트레이스 토크를 해도 재미있게 할수 있다 저도 한국에 있을 때칸 선수 트레이스 토크 했었어요 뭐라고 했어? 죽여버리겠다 오. 결승 때 동아 씨 이렇게 영광스러운 자리에서 만나는데 그 영광은 내가 다 해서 갈게 정당한 영광으로 야 라인 요즘 LCK 보면 너무 잘하더라고. 정잖아. 아, 동의합니다. 우리 과거에 클레빵 다 왔어. 그 다시 미쳤잖아. 로코도코가 뭐 머리 밀어버리겠다. 어, 그래. 야생의 그 LCK 느낌이 음, 옛날에 음. 거 있었잖아. 제가 잘하는 애들을 진짜 싫어해요. 피엘 선수는 이제는 믿지 않아요. 저는 못하는 애를 싫어하는데 인프는 너무 못해서 싫어. 최근에 선수가 충분히 잘한다고 내가 한타를 제가 진짜 잘해요. 아, 솔직히 한타 때도 못하는데 나보다. 진짜 싸운 선수 아, 이건 못 듣는 거죠. 그거 비하인드 스토리. 궁금하니까. 진짜 싸웠다. 여기서만 얘기해봐. 건너 건너 든 건데. 건너 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 건너. 건너, 건너, 건너. 아, 확실한 건 아니야. 아담 선수랑. 어, 어, 아, 아니, 어, 아니 얘가 아담 제일 좋아해 아담. 슈퍼, 어, 슈퍼스타인데. 아담 선수가 업셋 선수가 살짝. 오. 아. 드라마 있지 않나. 아, 업셋이 아펠이고. 아펠이. 아담이 세트. 아담이 세트. Oh, <laughs> 이 전멸이 까 그렇게 의미가 있, 있는 전멸이 아니었던 거지 감정적이다 뭐지? 왜 썼지? 나는 뭐 오, 잡으면 오. 게임이 끝나나? 음, 이상했는데 옆에 있는 선수들을 어? 그냥 쟤또 감정적으로 한다 아, 아, 같은 팀원들 아, 빛이야 같은 아, 팀원들이 봐도 이거는 얘네끼리 그 감정 때문에 이렇게 한 거다 아, 아, 현지인들끼리는 또 이제 아, 아, 바로 아, 알더라고 아, 
인모셔널 플래시였다. 이런 것들을 우리가 들으면서 그 팀의 약점을 좀 파악을 해야 돼. 음. 감정적. 어. 그러니까 트레스 토크 하면은 거기서부터 그치. 이제 주도권을 가져갈 수 있다. 어. 뭐 아니면 그때 만났을 때너 개못 하잖아. 그러니까. <웃음> 그리고 막그 게임 보고 또 꼬리 흔들고 어, 막 지나가고. 그래야 돼. 쓰게 만들고. 그래. 이런 어. 약점. 왜냐면 우리가 이걸 몰랐으면 얘가 그거 통하는지 안 통하는지는 그 모른단 말이야. 음. 아주 좋은 정보. 어, 잘 알려줬어. 앞으로도 이런 거 있으면 좀 냉정하게 이야기 할수 있도록. 알겠나? 알겠습니다. 어, 좋아. 어, 좋아. 개인적으로 내가 궁금한 거. 뭐, 또 이제 LCC에서 뛰다가 LCK로 왔잖아. LCC에서 사실 뛰다가 한국으로 이제 LCK로 오게 되면은 이게 연습량이 좀 많이 늘는데. 아, 그렇지. 이게 사실 어려워. 적응하는 게 쉽지 않고. 이게 아, 진짜, 그래. 아, 진짜로. 그거를 어. 지금 적응을 잘 하고 있는지. 오. 빡세 안 빡세? 살짝 빡세. <웃음> 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 유럽은. 아, 그렇지. 유럽은 그냥 아침 스크린 딱 다섯 판을 연속으로 하고. 저녁에 이제 휴식. 아, 하루에 스크린 다섯 번밖에 안 해? 그러니까 다섯 번 하고 다섯 끝난다는 거야? 근데 나는 쭉 하는 게 낫지 않냐? 휴식을 가져야지 조금 더 좋은 퀄리티의 퀄리티. 연습 경기가 더 많이 나올 수 있어. 빨리 끝내고 나 쉴라고. 나도 잘 모르는데 거의 문화가 아, 그냥. 문화가 그래. 그렇게 근데 그 그래. 문화를 제가 만들긴 했어요. 왜? 범인이, 범인인데 이거 에리시가 원래 저희도 끊어서 했었거든요. 처음에. 근데 내가 아 그냥 빨리 하고 그냥 빨리 쉬자 해가지고 그때부터 좀 많이 바뀌었어. 비장님이 스파이로 보내. 잘했어. 아, 그럼. 그래서 에리시가 더 잘하네. 아 그럼요. 그렇지. 제가 심어놨어요. 이게 맞잖아. 네. 사실 지금 또 현역 선수란 말이야. 음. 어, 나와줬는데 오늘 같이 해보니까 어떤 것 같아? 재밌고 재밌습니다. 이런 경험도 하나 엄청 좋다고 생각하고 음. 있습니다. 어. 또 SK 팬분들 입장에서는 또 엑스큐트 딱 이름 석자 딱 알려야 되잖아. 뭐 하고 싶은 말 있나? p o s 팀이란 색깔도 공격적인 음. 팀인데 좋은 모습 계속 보여주고 높은 롤컵까지 롤컵 목표로. 아니 뭐 해주고 싶은 말 있어? 한국은, 한국은 한국 문화니까 그 유럽에서 오던 그런 SNS 문화 그대로 하면 안 돼. 얼마나 잘해, 인마. <웃음> 그래, 그리고 롤드컵 꼭 진출해서 같은 팀 동료 만나면 다볶은탕 해주고. 그래. 그래. 맞네. 맞네. 자, 그래, 앞으로 멋진 모습 보여주도록 하고 우리 다른 요원들도 고생 많았다. 오늘은 여기서 마치도록 하지. 자, 모두 해서
Hello and welcome back to the LCK. We're here for the second match of the night, and this one should be a banger on paper. T1 up against Homolife Esports, our second and third place teams currently in the LCK. We did just have Gen G, our first place team, just bop Nong Shim and not give them a chance at playoffs for our first series, but uh, now this one could decide a lot in terms of playoff seeding. Yeah, I think in terms of playoff se seeding, pretty obvious. This is Honda Life Esports' opportunity to contest for a top two spot where you're seeded into the double elimination section of playoffs, so very valuable. Uh, they lose this, I believe, Gen G and T1 are locked in on that. Yep. So no opportunity to challenge that after this. But also, I think there's more to the fact that we have kind of seen this season so far as being Gen G and T1 on top, and I felt like there was such a big gap between them and even the third place team in Honda Life Esports. And I think this is an opportunity for Honda Life Esports to prove that maybe the gap is between Gen G and then second place and not T1 and third place, because ultimately, Honda Life Esports needs to show they can challenge these top two teams. And with T1 coming off that uh, rough loss against Gen G, it's a great opportunity to do so. Yeah, absolutely. We can take a look at the standings just to highlight what you were saying here. Uh, Ox, Gen G currently in first by a win and one fewer loss. But T1 and Humble Life Esports pretty close. Also, that one game gap. But if Humble Life Esports win and T1 take a loss, and then eventually, you know, Humble Life Esports can get some game score back, they could challenge for the round two spots, which are, of course, first place and second place in the standings at the end. And. So far, we've seen Humble Life Esports kind of fall to these two teams, but uh, they have looked better and better as the year has come along. Yeah, I think ultimately uh, we've seen Honor Life Esports have some pretty solid moments, but there's still been some question marks. Zeka sometimes in the champion pool, but Ari coming back in has definitely helped out a lot. I think T1, a lot of people were super high on them. I included was very high on them and predicted them against Gen G, and yeah. then that series has really shaken the faith substantially. And keeping that same roster that they just won Worlds on, expectations were sky high uh, and remain to be so. So this is a chance to bounce back from that Gen G loss. Yeah, we all knew that Gen G was going to be the one team to challenge them. And so far, they are ahead of them as Golden Mid Laners, Faker versus Zekka at the top of the POG ladder. It's funny because on 14-4, I feel like Zekka has actually benefited because uh, the Azir is out of the meta. Not that he's bad at the Azir, actually he was pretty good, but it just gives him an excuse to play the champs he actually wants to play more often. Yeah, I don't think he was, as you said, I don't think he was bad, but I think there were other better Azirs who benefited more. And also, I think the introduction of Ari, the fact that Trist is pretty popular, I feel like Zeka champion pool has always been a little bit of a tentative subject, uh, whereas Faker doesn't have a champion pool, he has a champion ocean. Yeah. Kind of just turned to anything over the course of his uh, career. Matchup of World's Champion 80 carries. Viper Swarm has been good. The bot matchup will be crucial. Uh, Gumiusi picks bot as the win condition. Uh, which 80 carry will triumph? It's pretty interesting because Guma and Karia, they played two games of Lucian Nami into Genji, and both of those were losses. And didn't look great, whereas Viper has played a lot of different things and might just have a bit more of a comfortable champion pool. It's hard to say because maybe. Guma and Karia just really um, favor the Lucian Nami and they can play other stuff, but they just didn't want to. There's so many good picks, particularly for T1's bot lane that you can lean into. We've seen so much flexibility, so much innovation from Kerry in particular. Just to send Lucian Nami two games in a row, I think a lot of fans are frustrated um, at that. And, you know, maybe they go in a similar direction, but that we often see so many bans in the first rotation for AD carries and then still end up with a lot of the power picks going through. Just our last series, we had Senna and Cluster going through both two games. So, you know, there's a lot of powerful picks. I don't think you need to set your sights purely on Lucian Nami. I think there are a lot of options that do yeah. well into it or can just honestly outvalue it. But we'll see how it does end up playing out. We are going to highlight the top lane, uh, not the AD carry as Guma wanted to. And Zeus has the top solo kills in the entire, um, in, in the entirety of LCK, not just amongst the top laners and, and first, and pretty much everything. He was first in the LCK for CSD and goal difference of 14, and that series against Gen G has actually knocked him. So he's still first for top laners, but no longer first for LCK after uh, that series. So. Definitely a little hit, but I think even despite the fact that Genji came out ahead and Keen looked really good in that series, I still think people are seeing uh, Zeus as the number one top laner right now. 
Yeah, I, I do think Canyon had a really huge effect on the way the top lane played out in that series. So it's hard to say. You know, if you pit Zeus and Keen head to head, I'm sure it would be pretty even, maybe slightly favored towards Zeus. But, um, you know, Canyon was able to get up there, make a big impact, and then eventually uh, take over, especially that game one yeah. in the Gen Genji T1 series. And then this matchup is interesting because Doran just always has this kind of ability to ramp it up against this. Normally in playoffs, though. Um, yeah. Normally, you know, there's certain finals last year where he just, you know, managed to pull it out. Uh, we'll see what he has uh, to display for us today. I feel like Gragas is something that we've kind of seen, not specifically much in the LCK, but in solo queue and in other regions rising up. But I think that one will instill fear in the minds of any <laughs> Zayas fans who are watching today. Yeah, it's very true. I, I think um, the Gragas is the big one for him. And... Uh, He's certainly a strong player, but I think he gets some flack for being very volatile and, and sometimes ca having these like big whoopsie moments where you wouldn't expect a player of his caliber to have them. But then on other days, he's like totally fine. So Yeah, I feel like the way I characterized him last year was he would get solo killed so often in lane for no reason and then would carry team fights. Yeah. That was kind of just his... I, mean, I still think he's very good at team fights, but he has been getting solo killed less. Um, so definitely worked on that, but different environment being on Honor Life Esports compared to being on Gen G. And I think, you know, as much as Zekas definitely had some good performances recently, Chovy and not Chovy are two very different things. <laughs> it's very true. And uh, we've also seen Peanut kind of struggle into the higher caliber uh, junglers here in the LCK. He is a strong jungler. We know what he's capable of, but Will he show up today is another question on my mind. As Maokai and Vi are going to be taken away, so already have any of junglers. Pick, yeah. you know, they're just targeting him heavily. And kind of what we were talking about before, these are a lot of jungle. You know, we have a support pick with the Ash. We have a mid pick. No AD carry bans at all. You know, Senna, Callista, Smolder, Lucian. Senna's going to get banned away, which I think is a great call. And they're going to pick Lucian. No, they're going to pick Callista. They did good it. Call, good call. <laughs> but yeah, we've talked extensively about the... Uh, power of giving carry a gold and with this cluster it's a flex you know we've seen him play a support to great effect so has the opportunity to put it in either uh, situation so we'll see what Harlem Life Esports want to go because you could go like Varus Callista bot lane would be very threatening yeah and is still an option so I think the Varus denial is good uh, you could even look towards like a rel because obviously a lot of the tank junglers target away rel has been super powerful and you can put a support if you want you can keep that flexibility open but we'll see what direction they want to go in. They could obviously uh, secure a jungler here. A lot of those being targeted. Well, obviously Rel's, but they could go for like the Lee Sin. Peanut's been really good on. But it uh, looks like they are looking at the Rel. Yeah. Uh, flexibility, obviously, Delight. Very solid in the pick as well. It's a good choice, and it's a good call from you because you, on the side of T1, you don't really know where that's going to go, right? So you can't just go ahead and say, okay, well, we know exactly what they're playing. We're going to pick, you know, Jin and try to just bully the bottom lane and then, you know, maybe... Delay pulls out something to deal with that a bit better. That's not the Rel. Yeah, I was thinking Lee Sin Ari would be like a solid rotation here for T1. They were toying with the Aatrox though. Here's the thing is that I feel like so many T1 drafts have just been, we can just pick Aatrox in the first three. And it looks like they will be following that pattern of just locking Aatrox. Now, Hardware Life Esports could respond with something like the Twisted Fate now. Um, if, or anything they want to secure to have a good matchup in the top lane. They want to lean more into something tanky, the Udia possibility, the Cassante. Uh, and it looks like they won't give the opportunity for T1 to ban away top lane picks. Actually going to go for the Jace, so another flex in theory. Um, but I would imagine probably picking that specifically to go into the Aatrox. And considering it's a pretty short range composition from T1, uh, T1 want to be kiting backwards with the Aatrox and the Cliss. They want you to come into them. The Varus Jace combo very threatening. And immediately we see the Nico band out, which has been used very effectively when trying to gap close on these long range picks. Yep, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see a similar uh, style of champion also gets banned away here as number five for the side of Homo Life Esports. Another support taken away. The Alistair from Delight has been a big one. Renata Glask also going to be denied from the side of T1, who haven't selected their support yeah. yet either. It's a solid ban, because I do think Renata Clist is just so strong. But also, you know, we've seen the Renatas trying to engage. It doesn't always go too well. It would be good against the Rel, but I think T1 need to figure out how they're going to gap close onto this Jace Varus. If they just sit back and poke, it will be a problem. 
And the fact is, we haven't actually seen the Ari touched. So I presume this is just Ari for Hunter Life Esports on four. You know, they keep the flex of the, the Rel alive. They could also pick up something for Delight, maybe. But I honestly think, get the support counter pick. See where this Clister is going. Yeah. See what it's paired with. And Ari is just so strong if you're happy to put the Jace in the top lane. And it's Zekka, and you're taking it away from Faker. Now this... <laughs> I think this is risky. This is very risky. Yeah, I mean, you're opening up for a potential good matchup. Yep, I think this is the right call from Honda Life Esports. So you secured, secured a really good mid pick and given yourself the flexibility. So now, you know, if... It's mind games. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of bans towards support with like the Alistair and the uh, Nautilus taken away. But now T1 are considering going for the Annie, which you've seen to have great effect into the Ari. We'll see what they end up going for in the mid lane. Another hover sense. on Recon. You know, if you find a good angle for it and get on top of the enemy team, the enemy can make huge impact, um, particularly into the Ari. We've seen it just kind of the point of click CC very good and could just suffocate it with the ult. And now we see what T1 are going to do. Do they put the cluster in the support role? Do they keep it AD carry? What do they take support? You know, they are technically going into this blind. It could always be the Rel support, but yeah. I think they have to realistically eye up the scenario where it isn't. Bard. Bard, which I actually like a lot. You're into a Varus J, so are pretty immobile. Uh, you can make proactive plays on the map. You can set up and uh, ult on top of them. And if you end up a little bit overextended, as Bard sometimes can do, you can just get ulted out to safety. So now Delight has the final pick. I would imagine you don't necessarily want to play the Rel into this. Oh, I, I love this. But you could. And yeah, just I pick think the Poppy for Peel. I think the Poppy, you can flex it a jungle. Very good against Callista and Lee Sin. It's a great pick for Peanut. You put the Rel in the support role, which into a Bard lane, you're completely fine with. You're not going to have any troubles there. And yeah, I think for me, Honor Life Esports have come out with a really good draft. I think T1 have definitely made some sharp adaptations with like the Annie into the Ari, with the uh, Bard coming out. But I think. Hot Life Esports have gotten exactly what they wanted. Feels pretty good, too, to R5 Poppy for Peanut. He's just sitting there the whole time. They're, like, banning away a bunch of junglers. He's like, yeah, I guess I'll just play one of my favorite champs in the entire game. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it and works perfectly with the comp. It's really good against what the enemy has. It's so high value here. Like, yeah. against the Bard, who's going to come through a magical journey, just slam into the wall. I mean, there's, there's so many good opportunities. And the thing is, you're not pressured to engage because you have the long-range poke. Um, you have tools to. But you can kind of just sit back and play peels. So yeah, Hunter Life Esports, I think game one after a good start, just coming out of the draft phase. Yeah. As we have all of the fan signs down here to cheer on the teams, even with the audience out for now. Hopefully we get them back for week nine and playoffs, but uh, still working on it. As here is the T1 draft. Certainly some interesting stuff here. Callista Bard you don't see every day. Also the Annie coming back in the mid lane. Yeah, and the side of Hunter Life Esports, so many good picks, specifically for them, and just good picks in general. Yeah, feels very nice, this composition, how it's going to work together as we are ready to hop into the rift for game number one. D1, Hana, Dursa. D1, fighting! Hanamalai <laughs> Esports, Hana, Dursa, Hanwa, fighting! That poppy skin looks like an Annie. Oh. Look at it. Yeah, it does. What? He did that on purpose. Just so you get them mixed up. <laughs> yeah. Make my life a little bit harder. Yeah. Once it gets to team fights. Imagine if you had to cast and you didn't have the health bars or the names. You just had to use the champions themselves. I think that would make it a little bit tricky. Yeah. Imagine if the client was in a language you didn't understand, and it was a game you had never played before. Hmm. That's I've done that before. <laughs> that would that would <laughs> seem like a hindrance. Yeah. It's not easy. Uh, but it can make for some legendary casts. It and really, what XP the solo lane is there as well, and clear out that ward, denying some information away from T uh, T1, and like should just be able to make his way down. Back to the boss side. This is 13 and 0 on Aatrox. Yeah, he's been playing this a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> he has, you know, it's it's him and King who have really just played this champion a ton. And yeah. Zayas has been doing pretty good on it. Um, some decent win rates from Hanwha Life Esports picks as well, but nothing really comparing to that Mama 13 and 0. You know, really hates this champ right now. It's 
Chronicler. And it's because it is so strong, so tanky in team fights, and you're building full damage. Dude, I, that annoys me so much. Just the fact that you're building lethality items and you're harder to kill than like an actual full tank. Just the healing you get. And the thing is, I understand if you get like a five man sweet spot Q3, I get it, you're gonna heal a lot. But I feel like he won't even get the sweet spot. He'll just like Q2 and he'll heal like 200 health or something ridiculous. Yeah. The champion just is so hard to kill for like, you know, we call it glass cannon, but he's definitely not made of glass. No. It's, um, it's a very hard tempered glass. Like perhaps. a diamond cannon, you know? Yeah. That doesn't seem very fair. No. But that's Aatrox. Yeah. <laughs> right Aatrox now. So. That shell. That's why and he's prioritized. This it. is what I was talking about. I mean, you're putting a spot as Hummel Life Esports. A bunch of junglers are banned away. T1 are using bans on stuff that aren't Poppy. You have the perfect comp for Poppy. And it's Pino's favorite champ. Yeah. I love that they just gave so much value to the uh, Rel flex pick. They kind of saved it to the very end. And you could easily think that, you know, they saw two support bands from T1. You could easily think, oh, yeah, they're going to put the Rel in the jungle. And then they just flip it around. I think a lot of value achieved from that. And also on red side, because typically we've seen teams always leaning the blue side when they have choice predominantly and uh, taking the opportunity and using that flexibility well on the red side. Uh, but so far, top lane, not going so hot for Doran. Here you see even he's got the, oh, flash on in. Guma forced to use his cleanse, but that is going to be flash out of delight and cleanse out of Viper as well in the trade. So T1 actually yeah. going to be feeling pretty good about the way that went. Not the best trade. I do think there's a caveat because with Rel you have Hex Flash and also you can W over walls, so not a big deal. But this might be the payoff is they're going for a dive. Well, I guess this was the whole setup, and T1 are not feeling good about this anymore. Delight is going to take a bunch of damage, but it doesn't matter. It's first blood over to the side of Viper as they were thinking multiple steps ahead. Nicely done yeah. from Hamalai Life Esports. Sometimes you see a team being a summoner, and it might be like, you know, three minutes later, oh, they're down flash, you can do this. This was literally like 20 seconds later. You know, instant capitalization. I love this setup, you know. If that cleanse was available for Guma, it could have been a lot more scary to go for that dive, especially when you see how low Delight went, so. Oh. No problem. Yeah. Managed to get away. But yeah, good start. Really good start for the side of Han Life Esports. Yeah. You're gonna get that early Dirk on Viper now, oh which my is Thorin gonna make kind of never mind. It's over. <laughs> um, <laughs> GG. Um, it's all over. Um, yeah. So again, no cleanse makes this much easier. Yeah, and Guma tries to position away from the tower there, but gets flipped by Delight close enough that Pina could slam it into it. Because you don't want to be near the wall. That's the easiest place to get slammed. So he was trying to prevent it, but didn't really have great options there. Poppy just so good at diving towers uh, in the side lanes. Yeah. That is what uh, Pina is very good at, and Donor oh, has man. done it a bunch as well. He came back to lane just with a dick, yeah. and Guma has Boots Dagger. Uh, yeah, I think I know who's favored in that scenario. It, uh, it's definitely Devaris, and Skull and Lethality is pretty obvious when Halo Blades and Guma go into lethal tempo and is maxing his E. So, in terms of the poke war, should go pretty heavily in. in favor of Viper and Delight. They'll have a much easier time of this bottom lane. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we saw them just get away with the Magical Portal, but any opportunity where you kind of get the CC laid on you, this virus is so much burst. So capable of just one-shotting someone uh, if you get some Blight stacks down. Yeah. Meanwhile, level 6 hit here for Faker. Owner just showing up just in case Zekka wasn't uh, in a safe spot. He's like, going to hit six himself. This is yep. the way Annie always used to be played, to just drop bear on yep. the person and it's, just make them go back. It's just you guarantee probably chunk them out. Really advantageous. Uh, not sure about that one, Oh no. Yeah, that is a poppy. It's pretty good into Lee Sin. <laughs> Even going to pick up this plant to help their health bars and maybe try to secure this early Drake. You have the support Rel, which isn't jungle, but you can still come over and do you know a smite on the dragon because you're Rel. Yeah, you can definitely sink it, especially with the Varus as well. I feel like in terms of champions who are good at securing neutrals, uh, the Rel Varus, honestly, even better than the Clista, because the Clista actually has to stack up spears, uh, and they really don't. Oh. Just do some burst. Zekka is going to be forced to Spirit Rush. Honor did use his Q, but no level 6 for him, and that's be the end of that. He does walk into stun range again. 
Uh, but he does have another charge of essence as Faker. Thinking about it. Yeah. Flash Q, but no. Thinking Flash Q auto. You know, yeah. did he have it? He was calculating, you know, running the numbers, run the 7 million outcomes in his head and decided against it. Uh, so, owner maybe spotted getting in here. Either way, they knew that it was available and uh, spotted doing the enemy red. Red handed, you could say. Wow. Yeah. I think you would say that. You would say it. It's the red buff. You wouldn't say it if it was the blue buff. Then you would say blue handed. Yeah, which wouldn't work. Oh my. Yeah, and Peanut, level six. I mean, he's thinking about it as well, at least trying to push him away. As we do have this pass picked up, there's the ult as well, but Owner going to be blocked. The Steadfast Presence, really not sure why he's taking this fight at all. Yeah, I'm... Hoping that Faker gets there, but that did not work out for him. Not sure what the game plan was there. You can obviously see Peanut wanted to keep Owner away from smiting the uh, Raptor because he had no uh, smite himself. But the extended fight, the fact that Owner was level five and also just dealing with uh, all the shutdown that Poppy has just didn't end up going well. Here comes Zekka. He does not have Spirit Rush, but he was there, and now he's not. And he's running away, and the timing for him, very unfortunate. Not going to see Karia, who's on a gank to try to get on top of Doran here, who might be forced to flash away as the flash comes in from Zeus and does force it out. As Doran will have to get away. Karia just uh, with the cheeky wait, gank on the top you, side. See that wood? Look at that wood that Doran <laughs> just put down. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Not doing too much with that one. Yeah, um, well, at least T1 won't expect the ward to be specifically there. Yeah. <laughs> he can see the enemy champions when they're close to him. Mm, yes. Double E. Yes. So. You know, if someone was hanging between the towers, he would see them slightly earlier. Y yeah. But now he has his, his poppy just being a human ward. <sighs> you know, was setting up for that. And he's going to hit it. As, let's see the damage into Owner. He's in a bit of trouble. Can't dash away. So fast Presence does go down. As Flash on in from Peanut. And he is going to pick it up. The kick comes out late. And Peanut just very oh, casually yes. picks up a kill. And now Zekka coming on in. Zeus in a bit of trouble. Faker's making his way over. The charm is down. But Faker not really able to help out too much in this. And now Zeus just left all alone. Zekka going to pick up that kill. And Homolife Esports with some big wins here in the early game. Now they're going for a bit more. As Gooba doesn't have cleanse once again. Is forced to flash away in the queue. It's going to land. And it's barely not enough damage. So close. Loving the aggression from Delight. On these engage picks, always a treat to watch. But Homolife Esports coming out really strong in the early game. Pina just completely read Ona like a book in that situation. And was so patient with the play. Now, Peanut is all over the jungle right now. He picks up an early Knight's Vow as well. Uh, going to be pretty valuable when it does come down to the later stages of the game if they do get Dove on as well. And Viper, 20 CS up, has a Ghost Blade already. Yeah. Guess who's back? Back again. It's Peanut. Oh, man. He doesn't actually have Smite, but they're looking for him. Ooh. He's not going to get knocked on the wall, but it's still a good angle oh, for the arm. And Peanut just steals that one away with his ult. Might as well. Man, this R5 Poppy getting all the value in this situation. Yep. Just, yeah. again, he's just <laughs> he's just reading him so well. Counters the gank in the top lane, comes down, catches him on the red, has the backup of Zekka, and the power of this Ari. Oh, Doran might be in trouble. Yeah, Doran does not have his flash, so he's going to get sent up against the wall, and they should be able to... Uh, set this one up pretty easily. Not much recourse for him as he'll do a bit of damage. But look at this once again. Now it's Guma who's on the crooks. Just going to get isolated by himself. Yeah, I think Dorm pretty okay with that trade. Uh, sure. Guma, I mean, this is the thing. Like, I, I respect Carrier going for that play. I think going proactively and getting the pick on Doran, definitely nice. But uh, Hot Life Esports, no hesitation in punishing on the other side of the map and getting a ton of value for it now. They are going to look for the return. There is a TP on Doran, and he might regret <laughs> going for... Oh, he's going to immediately regret that. Yeah. He wishes he um, could cancel. The timing, very unfortunate, and uh, he's dead. Not much you can do except not TP in this case and just identify, hey, well, I got a kill on the bottom side of the map. It's a free lane for Viper. Maybe I should just walk this one. Yeah, in. not not doing so great in the weak siding this game. I feel like um, yeah. people just kind of dying when the teams are focusing, but credit also. Both teams doing a pretty good job of punishing. This is the replay of Guma. Was on a wall. I think he might have been spotted. Well, they knew the Krugs yeah. moved, so they knew he was there. And then gets spotted, gets locked up. Playing Kliston to Rel Poppy. Uh, very unfun, I think it's safe to say. And that timing from Carrier just flawless. It's one way to put it. 
And uh, not very fun to get Dove in the top lane. We've seen this about eight times today, it feels like. As Bear comes down, Zekka in a bit of trouble oh! and just gets flash incinerated. And he's dead. Just got absolutely bopped there by Faker. And you know, Zekka's been moving out a fair bit and Faker's kind of just been holding strong, picking up a lot of farm, got a pretty substantial chess lead. It feels like Honda Life Esports overall definitely have the edge. Oh yeah. But we saw some cross mapping going, but this mid matchup, you know Faker has a two level lead on Zekka. It's a bit of a problem. I'm not really sure how he managed that. Hits level 10 here. Uh, no, no alt is what he said for Ari. And it's Chemtech Soul. Pretty unfortunate for Humble Life Esports. They got this early lead and now, well, they, they've got some shields. I My guess. bad. My bad. And they have some tanky members that might be able to utilize it a little bit, but yeah. generally, uh, not going to be nearly as good. Not so hot. We talk about this every time, but it's pretty important. In case it's not Life clear, have the two drakes. If it's not clear, we don't rate Chemtech Soul on this desk. At all. Um, yeah, it's not yeah. very good. So, if that wasn't apparent. Yeah, still a lead for Honor Life Esports. Still an advantage for them. Um, and I feel like Viper right now really strong on this fire. So looking to see what they can do. They've obviously moved him towards mid. Yeah. Uh, his piercing arrow is one. He's now just at level nine, so they're maxed. Yeah. Damage coming through is going to be very significant. And no one really has any armor on the side of T1 other than, you know, a Seeker's... Uh, sorry, uh, played steel caps on this. So going to be doing a lot of damage to everyone. Yeah. You got some armor on Carrier too, but at the end of the day, it's Whoa, like... Whoa, a whole cloth armor? Yeah. It's well, it's going to be built into a chain vest and then an item that has armor as well. Uh, but, you know, we talked about Faker's lead, but Viper's lead over Guma right now is even larger. And yes, there's a lead in the top side as well for the side of Zeus, but... This Lethality Varus... He might, like, we're reaching a scenario where maybe this Lethality, Var Lethality Varus just wins fights by himself with a couple of good cues. Yeah, and I mean, you even have the... The thing is, you have the Jace as well, but comps like this is you can kind of position in a way where as soon as you land the significant poke, Zeke can just go in and look to clean up, like Zekka with a bit of engage from Delight, Peanut there as well. Like, you just land the poke, and then you have the mobility to kind of chase up and clean up the kills, get the momentum going. If the targets are low health before the fight, that just makes Ari resets even more likely to come through. Duran goes back, picks up his first item here. You can see Eclipse. And, yeah, you mentioned the Jace is going to be in this one as well, so some pretty big long-range poke boom-boom damage. About to grease us on the rift. Oh, good man. Yeah, bit of an angle here, as owner might be caught in the crossfire. We do have teleports available, and that is going to be dodged this time from Guma. Also has clans, but the damage is already coming out here. The teleport is channeled by the both of them as they are trying to get on top of Viper, but the peeling is coming away. He's just sprinting away as far as he possibly can, and there's the peel, but owner gets in as he is going to take out the Lethality Varus, and now Delight's in a bit of trouble. Double stun comes in from the side of Karia, and T1 are turning this fight around immediately. Down will go Doran, and one by one, the dominoes fall. Peanuts should be able to keep themselves alive, but that's three kills for T1. Yeah, t one so quick to respond on the play. Honolife Esports looking for a pick there, but it ended up backfiring massively, chaining into a full team fight with the double TP coming in. And yeah, really favorable there for T1. Picked up all those kills, shutting down the virus. We'll see the replay coming out. And yeah, I think the problem was Viper went for this ult on Vision. If this is not on Vision, then I think he just catches Guma, but he saw it coming. Uh, and we see the play starts coming in. And then I'm not, does Peanut just cancel his ult? Yeah. Yeah, not sure about that one. And Viper, he was so overextended, there was no way he was getting out. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you know, Guma's low, Zeus is low, but it doesn't matter because they already did the damage, they, did, they got the job done, and it's a 5v2 at the end of it all. So, bit of a respite here for the side of T1. They catch back up in terms of gold. Yeah, it is that dragon in a minute, though. Uh, so what? I mean, it is when he can attack. <laughs> you know, it's like just a fight. Yeah. On my feast, let's looking to try and get some pressure on this mid to oh. oh, the charm and the chains. There is the fate's call to save Karia. That's why I was saying goodbye because he was leaving. Fate's call. Yeah. Um, 
Not because I thought he was going to die, I knew the Quest was there. Um, yeah. And I assume Honor Life Esports did, uh, just feeling they were happy to trade the Varasolt for that. I would be. Varasolt is uh, basically up again. <laughs> yeah, it won't be too long. It'll be up by the Dragon fight, you would imagine. And you know, I feel like off the back of that play, Zaya's got a decent amount of gold, and that's always concerning. You know, 13 0 and currently trying to get poised for that 14th. Yeah. Uh, but remember, they don't have TP now, so we're seeing him move over. T1 are trying to focus on mid prior here as Hanalei Esports are trying to get control of the river. Banana brush control going the way of Hanalei Esports, but look at T1 moving in together and getting some wards into that brush as well as over the wall. That control ward actually didn't get this ward, so he has to scan uh, the uh, bear. Owner's on your team. Thing. Zoning bear. <laughs> Zoning them away. You know, oh, it's just a total waste. Sacrifice the tibbers. Uh, yeah, big cooldown unavailable now. Yeah. Magical journey is, over the wall. Anwa, you could just go for the mid-tier one. You don't have to fight this. Uh, it is just a Camtech Dragon. So Zach is going to take mid-tier one. And actually, he won it backed away, taking some heavy poke here. Yeah. And this seems like the best scenario for Hanalei Peaceful. I mean, look at the damage. It's literally just the poke. The Jace and the Varus doing everything. They don't even have to fight. They poke them off. They get mid-tier one, and they get the Dragon. Big win for Hanalei Peaceful. It's just one of the basic rules of League of Legends is if the poke comp is sitting there in a passive positioning poking you and you're doing nothing, you will lose. You will fall behind to, unless you eventually get some kind of engage, but you're going to lose those health bars as long as the poke can land. And that it did for the side of Hamalai Esports. T1 elected to not fight over the Chemtech Drake, which after the poke had landed, probably a good idea. Yeah, I think also the Tibbers probably a and you know, <laughs> consideration. Typically, we always see like opportunity come out for Varus, but I actually really like the fact he's got Edge of Night Ghost Blade because the it's actually kind of tricky for T1 to engage because you have to kind of close the distance with Lee Sin and Annie, which isn't always easy. But the Edge of Night really makes it hard for Bard. He can't just ult you out of nowhere with that on top of you. And then the Ghost Blade is also great for like kiting away from those situations, for running out of a Bard ult. He has Cleanse as well, so I think Viper just very much knowing he's already going to do a lot of damage, but now he's just going to be very hard to actually pin down and get an engage off. And I think T1 realized they didn't have the angle for it there. Yeah. And look at this, Doran playing safely in the side lane. A good sight to see, as he now has Peanut over there with him. Or actually, that is Delight. See a lot of jungle rel nowadays. And he'll be fine. Just farming it out. It doesn't look like either team wants to make a big maneuver before this next Drake does come out. Yeah, I'm so concerned just for Guma and his impact in this game. He is not looking so hot in the item, item department at the moment. And I'm sure he's got some gold saved up. He has just back now and bought a BF sword. But still, he's behind um, quite substantially. And you know, I kind of times before we've seen T1 manage to team fight their way out of a depth set. They're not even that far behind in gold. I just think how the compositions interact is going to be a challenge to have to solve. Um, yeah, especially uh, when you're going to be hitting a front line that is a Rel, who is naturally tanky, and a Poppy who goes for Knight's Vow and Thornmail, which is kind of the flavor of the month build yep. uh, when you're going up against a lot of AD. And outside of the burst from the Annie, it's basically all AD. So. I think it's all right in this case. We're not huge fans of the Thorn Mail, but no, I think it's. I think the uh, especially since Frozen Heart got nerfed a bit, it's still a very high armor item. Uh, even if you're not getting like the most value, there's still like a decent amount of healing on the side of T1. Yeah, um, Thunder Sky. Yeah, and just the least in general is healing this kit. Aatrox. Aatrox to Clister with the Blade of the Rune King. I guess in this game, it's probably actually it's not valueless, but I think just the stats are the main thing you're picking up for. Yep, 70 armor. Feeling pretty good about that. Also in Merch Reds. He's up to 221 armor total at this point in time already. So that early game domination from Peanut is really going to help him out. Yeah, and obviously when you get low HP as well, you get the boost from your W. So Poppy, I think safe to say, kind of hard to kill. That is the way it goes. And we talked about how difficult it is to get on top of Viper in general with his itemization, but just the fact that Poppy exists, <laughs> you know, like if it's very telegraphed if you're throwing a sealed fate into them and they're running straight at you. Yeah. Um, you just 
swing your hammer around and you say, okay, come on in. At least two of you, maybe even more, yeah, just don't are going to be knocked away. Time, yeah. peanut, you know, like, maybe it was like a weird interaction. I saw like the kick was on cooldown from owner. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not it looks like he sure. canceled it. Yeah. I didn't see anything come out that I thought would cancel it, but who knows. Oh! <gasps> Edge of Night down! Oh no! What will he do for the next 30, 40 seconds? Well, which is it? 30 or 40? Uh, I think it's... Now it's a quiz show. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 30. I think it could be 40. Mm, it's already halfway gone. Yeah. Oh, Does he have an ingenious? Why are you putting me on the spot? <laughs> I don't know. This is why it gets so There's complicated. There's nothing else happening. It gets so complicated, you know? Yeah. Cosmic what is insight the exact also? cooldown off? Ah, I just have cosmic insight. Where am I? I need... <laughs> this is too much. All right, it's back. That okay. was about 30 seconds. Let's so. never question the cooldown again. We're just going to blind <laughs> faith, you know? Yeah. It Around has... 30 to 40 seconds. I think it was less, that's, though. That's what I said. Let's just stick with that. Yeah. You know? Why do we have to change? <laughs> I'm gonna say um, 24.7 seconds. Let's say 33.33. All right. Recurring. Uh, repeating, of oh, course. Repeating, yeah. of course. Yeah. Maybe the desk can help us out. <laughs> Space. How many esports they have a chokehold on this river as we get the zoom out? T1 yeah. have really no entry into this. There's no flank wards. Nothing. It is sold not the highest priority, but definitely not something you want to give out for free. And with Baron now up and available, a one team fight here could mean. So much more. Unlike esports, we'll get mid prior and have firm control over the river. So my question is, how are T1 going to approach this? I mean, can they? <laughs> like they got to do something, but they're not even getting in the river. Unfortunate angle on the Q there, but yeah, this is just gone. As Carry is just gonna face tank and face call out, and that's Chemtech Soul. Yep. And now you're really not killing Poppy, and you're probably not killing Delight either. Yeah, when Poppy gets low, she will just kind of go in mortal mode. Um, yep. But still, not the most impactful soul. We've said this enough times, but I think Honor Life Esports definitely upset that they kind of rolled low on the uh, soul dice there. But still, just set the Elder Timer in motion. And I, I think T1, like the gold isn't that far apart. They have strong picks on the team. They have a fed Aatrox. They have this strong Annie. But they're just still struggling, really, with even how to approach the situation. Yeah. They really haven't found any angle ever since, like, that one fight. As uh, maybe this is an angle. Doran a bit out of position. The Q is going to miss, as is that one. But maybe just brute force will get the job done, and that it will. That's a kill for Zeus as he flashes on top of Doran. Yeah, good capitalization. Doran just a little bit overextended there. Uh, and ends up getting taken down. Not sure they'll be able to... Oh, carry it. Oh. <laughs> well, you can take another try, I guess. Or you might just get CC'd 100 to 0. So Yeah, no Fate's call that time around. It's the end of that. And now Faker, he's not looking too uh, good in this spot. As 4v1, Hummelite Peaceworks get two picks, and now they're going to start up the Baron. And I think that's just Baron gone, because you have Doran to TP in if you need, but, you know, Ona's so far away... Uma and Zeus are just pushing towers. I'm not sure. They look like they might be coming over to contest, but it's difficult odds. If Honolife Esports really want, they could just TP and Doran. And they don't have control of the banana brush. Oh my lord. Most How important can thing. How can they handle this? Especially while Onks is casting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just no entry. And unfortunately for T1, <laughs> sitting around and doing nothing isn't exactly going to work eventually. Like, there's no there's no time where it's like, oh boy, Annie hit 30 minutes. Like, now yeah. she's going to take over the game. Like, Aatrox is a bit of a, a threat, of course, but... Yeah, I mean, the game's still in arm's length. It's just composition interactions are struggling here. Uh, Doran dodges the, the Sonic Wave. Uh oh And, oh... Little pick on a Doran, but he is surprisingly tanky. Yeah, the replay was a pick on a Doran. Uh, yeah. That was also an attempted pick on a Doran. He, he's really embraced his role on this team as the punching bag. <laughs> just, <laughs> just sit there, absorb wow. all the energy. So different all from the pressure. Role on Gen G. Yeah. What, a, what a change, <laughs> you know? It's just hanging out, saying, come at me, bros. And well, actually, it's come at me T1s, bro. Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 wrong, yeah. wrong matchup. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny how Carrie is like, oh, you grounded me? I can just go through again. And then he just doesn't get to move, like, 
15 seconds. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Oh, and like now Caria no. is dead. Feet Squall, just kidding. Uh huh. Uh, owner also getting in there. Now we have a flank from Zayus. This is a very nice flank. He's going to force the flash out of Viper, but the follow up from Delight might be enough as the double knock up comes in. They don't quite take out Zayus, though. And now Viper is all alone. He does have Doran coming on in, and Zayus is just going 1v5 oh. on the top side, but he eventually does get taken out, as you would imagine. Even Aatrox, not OP enough to win that one. How many Esports? A bit shaky, but still a very favorable trade for them. Yeah, Delight and Peanut just bounce housing both Owner and Zayas there. There was just nothing they could actually do. Just really, they found a good angle, but you saw uh, Viper flash away and then Ghostblade and just run as fast as he can. Faker tried to catch him out, but the peel came in. And then oh, even here, on the back end, Snipes Carrier. So yeah. that looked like the good attempt, the best attempt from T1. They found a flank, they found an approach, and then it all just kind of backfired. Yeah. Still mind-blowing to me that Peanut got his hands on Poppy in this game. <laughs> yeah. I'm still thinking about that right now. He's just totally taking it over. And yeah, the, the angle's good here, but we kind of see Viper, look how fast he is with the Ghost play just running. And then we get this just, they don't get to play the game. Yeah. Uh, Ona and Zeus. And we see the top, top of the fight going pretty unfavorably. They do see Zeka go down, Zeus catches him, but then Viper also snipes Carrier. And Zeus is trying, man. He's doing his best. Yeah. He really does not want to tarnish his Aatrox record, but it's looking like that might be what happens out of this game. Yeah, it's uh, it's looking pretty likely. It is the Zeus strike. Not surprising at all, um, given the way this game has played out. And man, look at the poppy items now, by the way. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you're not killing this guy. It's not happening. It's pretty oppressive. It's pretty ridiculous. Peanut would have to get caught like 1v5 in order to die at this point. Yeah. Like we say he's not going to die if he made a huge mistake, sure, but... And I just find it funny that the 0 for uh, Jace is second highest damage, you know? Yeah. Um, that's the champ in a nutshell. Oh. Uh oh No. Just a little bit of burst. Yep. Not a ton of damage. Just enough. Yeah. Send a message. Um, and with Elder in 45 seconds, I think the problem really now is that that moment there where Ono walked up to that brush, that's the closest I've seen anyone on T1 get to the Dragon <laughs> in the last couple of minutes. It's, uh, it's been a struggle. Uh, yeah. Karia took the shortest magical journey of all time <laughs> over that tiny ward. Zeus, he's hiding on bush. He's they don't know he's better. here. And, well, he's going to get that Banshee Veil out. Zeka is going to run away from this one. Yeah, he's like waiting for someone to come by. And it's like, not Peanut. Anyone but Peanut. <laughs> really not the Poppy. And then Ze uh, Zeka comes over. He's like, okay, I'll hit that a little bit. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, I thought maybe Ono was going to get up to that brush. But uh, no, apparently not. It's just not happening. And, and they know the angle of attack, too, which makes the poke even oh. more deadly. Because it's so easy to hit when they're all just running at you on the same angle, you know? And Hollow Life Esports, again, so cold on this one. They're going to get the charm on Zeus as once again the CC Castle comes in. Zeus is going to get sealed. Faden tries to go over the wall, but immediately denied by Peanut the Poppy. Once again, more value as Flash on in. And that should be the end of this one. Caria going to get wiped up as well. The charm before the disengage cone as well to not get Faker out. And it won't be an ace, but it is going to be a very clean victory to the side of Homolife Esports. They've got a wave in the bottom lane, and they will look to end. Yeah, just a great setup. You know, they cleared out all the vision. They forced you want to come into them, landed the poke, got the engage onto the Aatrox, and cleaned up from there. I feel like this has been such a good game for Homolife Esports, and people questioned. Oh, boy. <laughs> didn't question that. People questioned, you know, can Homolife Esports challenge T1? Is the gap between two and three that big? And the answer is no. At the moment, certainly not. Says Homolai Peace Sports is going to take a very dominant win in game number one and move ahead in this best of three. Peanut, he's like, huh, R5 Poppy into this? Sure, I'll yeah. just take over the entire game and uh, win it for my team, I guess. And you know, the Poppy was a great pick, but I feel like the draft as a whole for Hunter Life Esports uh, yeah. really made so much sense. Really felt like they answered all the threats, the composition fitted together well. Uh, was a great match into like the picks of Aatrox and Clista, who are great at kiting backwards. And I think T1 are having struggles in this area. Like, don't get me wrong, it wasn't all draft. The gameplay was definitely crisp from Home Life Esports. But we saw T1 struggle in this regard against Genji as well. 
And considering one of the statements they made in in the World Championship was, you know, they'd thought a lot more about their drafts, and that obviously led them to victory. It feels like they've kind of regressed in that area over the course of the split. Guma, you know, you can't even really follow him. He just doesn't get to play the game. You're playing the yeah. regular auto attack cluster, and you're outranged by everything. And should you even get in range of someone to hit, it's a Poppy or a Rel. Good luck. It's Poppy and it's Rel and it's Charm and Chains of Corruption. You've only got one cleanse, so never a chance to do any damage for pretty much anyone on the side of T1. Hava Life Esports, a very dominant victory in game number one. We're going to take a break and have the space break down that first game. We'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
Welcome to the space, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Atlas. I'm joined by Hooney and Chronicler as we break down game number one between T1 and Hanwha Life Esports. A little bit of an unexpected outcome in this one as Hanwha, they sort of took control of the game and then they never let go and then they destroyed the enemy Nexus. It was, for some reason, completely clean outside of whatever Doran was doing, but it didn't seem to matter. Drawing attention. Hell and not yeah. being able to deal with it at all. Uh, hats off to Humble Life. Even in hypothetical scenarios where I've, I think if you come from the future, like, hey, Humble Life win, I would expect it to be through great uh, team fighting, uh, but it wasn't great team fighting. They just dunked on T1 early and never gave them an opportunity to play the game. And obviously, all the credit goes to Pina. Yeah, I mean, this is like one of the hardest carry I've ever seen in this season so far, and the Peanut, the performance was like, was too insane. I mean, obviously we know the, how good it is Peanut, especially on Poppy as well, but not making single mistake and actually it's impacting these wide, the giant impact the whole map, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, I think there was that one weird issue that he had on the bottom side of the map where an ultimate went the wrong direction and didn't manage to get a stun or a, a W onto owner. But after that, and before that, it was all perfection from from uh, Peanut. We can forgive him for one little uh, little misdemeanor. Yeah, if, if we can take a look at the drafts, because I want to highlight, I actually didn't mind the plan from T1 if they had banned Poppy. Because if you look at what this comp in theory does, you have a really strong mid jungle 2v2 with Annie and Lee that you can play through. Then you also have the Callista as an as a early uh, powerful tool to, to start winning the lane and then rotate that power over to the early objectives. And then you have Bard and Aatrox as like kind of late game insurance to either start fights or to end them. But all of that just gets annihilated by Poppy. Like your Callista doesn't get to play the game. You lose the they lost the lane level three because of the poppy gank. Lee doesn't actually win the 2v2 anymore because of the fact that you're playing in the poppy. Even Aatrox can't go for like the big plays because he's being stopped. So like that R5 poppy, which shouldn't be a surprise by the way, because it's Peanut, just I think. If he plays well, he ends it and he didn't just play well, he played incredible. Yeah, I mean also just understanding the mod put match on from the Hana Life Esports, it's like they pick him right away. It's just like virus into Kalis and making sure you can actually just handshake the lane faces and also they are already planning to just like diving bottom at level three. Like I already knew that like as soon as Jace already got their face rush and Poppy just trying to pass down from the rest side jungle to the bottom. And it's like everything was so planned and they were so making spicy on bottom. Tried to bun cleans and as much as the uh, trying to burn the HP also. And I mean, that's how they died the bottom. And I think the, that, that, that was the play. Yeah, and it all came from actually beautiful drafting as well with the fact that they held the rel and you assumed it was going to the jungle and then it wasn't. Um, but both of them were on the bottom side of the map for this particular play to really start things off. We're going to have a look at what Peanut managed to do in this early game. Also credit to Viper and Delight. Uh, Delight on Engage Report's always a pleasure to watch. They already got sums very early on, which was uh, what allowed them to so very easily execute on Peanut. Then Peanut just reading Owner like a book, man. Owner having a really rough one. Obviously, it is a counter matchup, but it also felt like Peanut was just dictating the map everywhere. Zeka, unfortunately, isn't Chovy, but still does enough on the Ari, is where he needs to be. And as long as they give Peanut some help, he will he will take over the map for you. Yeah, I mean, they were so ready. They were already predicting just diving top. So Zeka was already heading towards her top. And this play, like, I think the, as you mentioned from the draft, like, it's just like 2v2 as soon as it's over. The poppy is just like a lot, just a lot to move like everywhere with the Ari, and that makes like so hard to play for T1. It was extraordinarily difficult. They did have that one moment um, towards the bottom side of the map, but after that, uh, we're gonna have a look at the next highlight, and that really does illustrate just how completely doomed it kind of was. Um, this, of course, is Doran dying again. We did need to include this uh, because this was a large part of what the game was, was him dying over and it's over an again. It's an essential part of the storyline. it doesn't onward. matter. It just doesn't matter. He can keep doing that, drawing that attention. He'll still be Jace, and they're still able to find picks like these. And it's, once again, just Peanut. Yeah, I mean, just the interrupted bar tunnel. It also, I mean, this is like a little bit disrespectful from just carry. I just going this deep inside against the Poppy. And it's kind of hilarious is that he he made the tunnel and the, the, the Faker was just right in front of it and he got caught and it opens up, just got kind of get the free Nash after it. It's so free for them. They get the Drexel, 
it's gonna be, be able to control around the Elder Drake after the team fight, the gold wise. It's just like it was pretty smooth after the Baron play. It was extraordinarily smooth. And now it's time to give Peanut his POG and wonder whether there was one person that didn't get the memo. 700 points, 100 beneath the other two junglers that are right at the top of these particular standings in Canyon and Pyoshik. If he's able to do it again though, and he's on form today, he could equalize by the end of this series in theory. I'm, uh, I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit worried, guys, that there's, there's gonna be someone that just didn't understand that Peanut was the only one in this game. There's no way. Like, this is not possible. There, I think no? there, are, no, there are games where you can look at some of the fights, how they played out. I, There's no way. I, if I, it I, isn't I, Peanut, I, I guess it. I'm wondering who like, the heck it would be. Viper. A Viper voter. There might be a... Yeah. Like, Delight played a good game. He's 4-0 like, and zero on his roll right now. Yeah, Delight yeah, gauge ports. Peanut just had 100% KP no, we, until... We know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. There's no way. Okay, no okay. Way. It's, oh, we nailed Ooh, it. I got scared. I got scared as I well. Got I, I got nervous. We actually had like a little a little thing pop up. Media question mark, question mark. And I got a little bit spooked. I got a bit spooked. But that was that was a really good jump scare. Really good jump scare. 12 out of 12. Absolutely brilliant play from Peanut. We'll see whether we can do it again. It's time to throw it back to the casters for game number two. Thank you, Spacers, for that wonderful breakdown as not robbed, of course. I mean, in that yeah, game, I mean, there, there's no chance. The guy just basically 1v9'd, and his team was great as well, but he was the main character. Yeah, I think right? there's obviously an argument for like 13 out of 12, 14 out of 12, maybe. Sure, sure, um, yeah, yeah. But 12 out of 12, we'll take it. It's satisfactory. Um, yeah, really good game from Peanut, and as well, this was with T1 having side selection on blue side. Um, and they're going to stick with blue side once again. Blue side has been the popular side, but to get out drafted on your favorite side, never a good feeling. We'll see how they shake things up this time. Uh, starting off with the Maokai once again. I'd say a good start is to, if you're going to do the same thing, if you're going to try to salty run it back, just ban away Poppy instead of something else like the Sejuani. I think Vi Maokai is fine. And even if you try to wait for like, Phase two and say, well, they are five did, so maybe we can phase two ban. Maybe how will I these sports just pick a third in the J spot? We'll have to wait and see. As uh, Sejuani is going to be the ban once again, so same bans here for game two. Yeah, I mean, I think there's plenty of picks that Doran could have played and just died on the top lane. Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> play anything. I don't think it needed to be the chase, but things are going the exact same direction, and I don't see a reason why Hanwha Life Esports wouldn't go Varus Rael, uh here. Um, I think it's really on T1 to adapt, but actually toying with the idea of securing the RE first, which, you know, it's pretty proactive to think, okay, what what could they do to change things? What could cause more of a thing? And I actually even said in the last draft that RE Lee would have been a good 2-3 for uh, T1, so Hunter Life Esports predicting that might be the change up and not even letting it happen. They but really Rel want so this good. RE. Rel is like so strong right now. Um, Aatrox is going to be picked again, so they weren't uh, in threat of that. And they are going to take the Nico here instead of letting it ba get banned away this time. And now they can take the Rel anyway, you know. Um, we'll see if they go in a different direction. We'll see if they want to secure, because they have obviously dropped the Rel, but they may really want to get a good top matchup for Doran. They could go the Jace again. You know, it made sense in the comp, but it didn't really flourish that well. But talking about the idea of going uh, the Ari Lee for themselves and securing this really strong mid jungle. Hmm. Not going the Rel for the previous game. Things shaking up a little bit. Uh, obviously, a bit of value and be able to kick the Nico away. Um, but just generally looking for a strong mid jungle to carry them through. Uh, and we'll see how things pan out going in this next phase. I imagine T1 may want to focus bands towards top lane picks, maybe get rid of the Jace uh, and potentially. Maybe even the Twisted Fate as well could be a decent ban. Um, Jace. And Nico has to be banned. Uh, I'm sorry, not Nico. Uh, Nocturne has to be banned because it pairs so well with huh. Nico. Uh, Poppy. And Poppy, I've actually, you know, I've been doing some research recently. Poppy, pretty good to lease in, I think. <laughs> um, we have some good... We have um, footage on the subject. <laughs> very recent, very recent. Uh, as, as early as last game. Nautilus also taken off the board. Crazy when this late in the draft, obviously in a lot of drafts seen it banned very early on. Rel? Still available. Uh, you know, I would probably take top here and then just save counterpick for support just so you can see what you want to do. And never 
never give away uh, counter pick to to carrier. I'm of the opinion that's a, a safe one to take, and I think the Cassante is pretty fine. And if you do end up playing the game out in a similar manner to the last one, harder to dive than the Jace, I think, is a very safe statement to make. <laughs> that is for sure. Um, let's see what they decide to take here on the side of T1. Obviously, a lot of hard engage on their side. They might want something very reliable, such as Aurel. Um, a lot of stuff taken away, you know, in terms of uh, junglers in this game, trying to think what they want to pair. Well, it's Either just going to be Nico support. Nico support. Yeah. They go to Talia and they go to Zin Zhao. You know, I don't. I think that Talia is good into the Lee Sin. You know, there's a lot of dashes on the team of Honor Life Esports, but I just feel like Karma and Zin Zhao is such a strong duo if they were going to go in that direction. Yeah, we'll get a Nico support, and, you know, even though it was obviously already locked in earlier, I think Honor Life Esports get the payoff from uh, seeing where everything is. Trying to decide what they're going for. They will settle with the Zin Zhao in the end. And I think a lot is going to come down to Carrier trying to close the distance because they don't have amazing engage on the side of T1. And they are dealing with a Poke Varus once again. Yeah, I mean, not the easiest for Kong game. Uh, I think Nico and uh, the Talia are kind of hard to play into. But Delight is just so good at Rakan. Yeah. And I feel like if you're not really going to suffer in lane, if you know you have a lane where you're fine playing it, a lot of LCK supports like just just pick the Rakan. It's good. It's good and engaging. It's very reliable, and they will lock that one in. So I don't think there's nearly as much of a clear advantage as it was in the previous game. But I still think Honor Life Esports are very very happy with what they got. Uh, very strong mid jungle. They got the Varus, which Viper's been fantastic on, and then the Rakan and the Cassante just supporting pieces. But T1 have shaken things up a little bit. Uh, the Nico coming out. We'll see what Carrier can do on this pick. Uh, not, I mean, he kind of didn't have much impact on the bar other than that topside roam. Yeah. But definitely a pick where you can get a little bit cheeky with the Nico. Yeah, you definitely can. I think this might open up some angles for him to do a bit more even in this game. And uh, as you mentioned, if you're going to give Rakan to one support, it should be Delight. So kind of happy. He was even hovering it in game one and elected not to go for that and just played the Rel. And I'm sure he's going to be happy he found a spot to play it this time around. As excited to see Peanut now not on the Poppy, but on the Lee Sin and see how he plays this pick out as we're just about ready to hop on to the Rift for game number two. D1, oh no, who is that? D1 fighting, yeah. <laughs> How are you, On our doorstep! On my fighting! Uh, and it is going to be the Halo Blades, Callista, so I'm matching Lethality, which I think is a great call. I think in this lane matchup, you know, despite what I said, like, oh, you can pick for Khan if the lane's not too uh, too much of a struggle, should still be on Guma and Carrier to have the advantage in lane. They're going to be able to achieve Pryo. And if you land, like, the root from the uh, Nico and then you chain autos and a Q together, uh, get the rend, and you can do a lot of damage. And to be honest, the Thality is just so broken right now. Um, the, the numbers you can get full build, you can have like 30% armor pen, like 90 Lethality. Unless you're like a hyper tank, like a Cassante, you basically have no armor. <laughs> and even the Cassante still actually takes a fair amount of damage from Lethality. And it's no longer, like, Lethality was always like, you know what, it just falls off super hard. It's kind of bonkers. Um, and to be honest, you could just hit people who aren't Cassante. Just launch a Q at them from a while away, press Ren, boom. Job's done. Boom, boom damage. That's what we're looking for. And he'll be looking to match that poke from Viper. Zeus, oh, that feels bad. Oh, 13 man. and 1. Ruin. The one loss. Unlucky. Yeah, and Zeka 4 0 on the Ari. Um, it's obviously only recently come back in the meta, but you could see their adaption on draft before T1 even changed anything. Kind of showed how highly they prioritized this pick. And I feel like one of the things they had issues in earlier in the season was what to put Zeka on. Uh, you know, the Corky perhaps not the optimal decision in some of those games. Yeah. The Ari working for them, working well. I wonder which minion. It's Carrier. I wonder if it's the one that was running about really fast. Impossible to know. Erratically. Yeah. <laughs> just no way. Wait, is that is that Faker in the bot lane? Yeah. Whoa, crazy. Hey, just TP'd bot. It's crazy. I don't know how he managed that. Oh. 
range minion. This one's a bit more subtle because he at least went in the brush first. Oh, he gets the root and Delight's in a little bit of trouble. He's going to have to flash. And very early on getting Delight's flash is going to feel very good. Yep, just using misdirection and there went out of vision to turn into the Pasta minion. Uh, uh, and Delight burning both sums. And now, I mean, this is actually great for Hard Life Esports because Fake is going to assume he's safe towards that side of the map, but they don't end up finding an angle, unfortunately. Yeah. Now Ona ne <laughs> definitely knows Peanut's nearby, but I don't think you win the 1v1. Uh, and Peanut, you don't have the support of your lanes. So, good luck. <laughs> I see Owner's just trying to escort him out. And not going to go for the flip, just wants to go for the trade in the 1v1. And Peanut's just kind of... Waiting, waiting, waiting. He's got a nice ward in that brush. That should help him out just a bit. Bot lane's still being pushed in, and now Faker is going to roam on over, and Pina started his wolves, so. Yeah, and if you so look this one away. across the map, T1 have triple lane prio so far. Just gives so much freedom to Ona, and Ona definitely had a rough game one. Uh, goes without saying, but also wasn't put in the best situation. Playing Lee in that game, not too fun. Uh, and Pina currently experiencing some of that pain. Uh, jungling when you have no prior lanes isn't the best experience. <laughs> He's just constantly switching. Yeah. Always keep them guessing. Yeah. You never know who it is. I mean, we've all had that moment when you, like, load into a game where there's a Nico, and you're like, why is Caitlyn mid? Yeah. And you know <laughs> the Nico's there, but you just like, you know, Caitlyn swapped it. No, 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 no. Brains. Yeah. Not even once. <laughs> <laughs> Said no zombie ever. Um, we're t <laughs> Nothing's happening. I mean, this is just thing to talk about. Uh, okay, let's take a look at this. On 14-4, Ari is winning against everyone who's not Chovy. Yeah, and I feel like that's kind of unfair to expect Ari to win against Chovy. Not many people are doing that right now, so... Um, definitely a challenge. Doran struggling in this matchup. Um, Zeus... Definitely a lot of experience in this Aatrox that we've hit on many times, but 17 Cess lead, it really comes down to how much farm Doran can pick up out of this wave, but certainly not 17. Um, and he at least baited Zayas into taking two tower hits, so at least the health is a bit more even. Uh, yeah, that does count. And, uh... <laughs> yeah. Look, don't look at the minimap. It's I, fine. I'm trying. It's, it's fine. There's just a little white square. <laughs> it's... It's, it's okay. It's Harrier as the... Because he switched to the Callista. Yeah, that's oh. not that's not a thing. You're not supposed to do that. It's not <laughs> not allowed, actually. <laughs> he was just scouting in the river, you know? It's, it's it just looks so scary. Like, it's just going to go come down and consume Viper in the light, you know? <laughs> yeah. This big white square, square. Here comes Peanut into Owner's Jungle. And he's spotted. Owner not going to miss those. Gonna land a Q onto the Drake, might just taxi on over. Not sure if he'll actually commit to doing it. Yeah, there's been a bit of ebb and flow in the, you know, the lanes have gone in favor of Hunter Life Esports now, so it does have a bit more prio, but still a little bit scary to start that one up. Doran level six. Could always consider a treat, but you have to be so careful not to feed a kill over. You would just like to go even. I have seen so many of these matchups where they just both pop out do some heavy trading, no one dies, and then just continue business as usual. Oh, nice charm landed here from Zeke. He's a bit low on mana, might have enough for, yeah, he's got enough for a W. Kind of a trading ult there at the end of the day. You know, if he had more mana, that could be a different story. Well, that's one way to do it. <laughs> he is so far under the turret now, and he's getting flashed on even, but he's very fast, so I don't think he's gonna stick around. Yeah, that play would have been sick if that was Doran's turret. Um, yeah. But, Kind of just the wrong way. escorted Zayas to safety and went, here you go. Um, but it does end up being a trade of sums, trade of ults, and Doran's ghost is lower cooldown. So overall, he's the beneficiary of that play. Um, oh, the light. Nice dodge there. Has his flashback up. Peanut just getting some trading damage in. Carry is pretty low at this point, but so is the light. He's not going to land the Q either. As Peanut thinking about a steal. But that's 1v4, and I think he's just going to have to get this one up. And that he will. See one big commitment to that first Drake, and they get an Inferno. Yep, so nice little early payoff. Uh, able to get that one. It's Chemtech. Dragon second as well, so won't be a Chemtech soul. 
Uh, even though it really didn't dismay Honor Life Esports that they picked up the worst soul last game, but definitely higher priority here. And I feel like when you have this, the Thality Cluster is just so strong. Like, Cluster's already strong early, but this just feels even more extreme. Very easy to set up these early dragons. Saker charmed up again. Trading pretty heavy in the mid lane between these two. But at the end of the day, Zek is at on farm. Yep. By seven. Seven. That's a whole wave plus an extra one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, hasn't been a ton of activity, and I feel like Ona's been kind of challenging Peanut in the jungle, but not too much come from it. I think that was Delight hanging around yep. at the Fog of War. Uh, just going to help push the wave in, but nothing much more to come from it. And carry it, starting to get cheeky on the map. Yeah, might as well get a big reset like that around the dragon time. As, uh, <laughs> oh, it's back to this again. See, Carrie is. I like just remember when we had the Nico jungle last summer, and Canyon was just like spamming it. Yeah. And he would, he'd like just so obnoxiously so that it was just permanently like there was just like an emoting whoever. Mm -hmm. I think it was Leona who was copying one game and he was just spamming them non stop. Oh, Peanut. Hey, it's four gold. Yeah, you, you paid off. Nice. That is owner's blue buff, it turns out. Wasn't 100% sure, but now we know. As he has secured it both times. You know, not as much action this game. Especially considering we had like the early dive in the previous one. Both teams are kind of eyeing each other up. Um, but not really finding too big a windows. I don't imagine they're going to go for a dive here. Yeah. Maybe if Faker decides to make a move on his Talia or something, then you can commit, but... Um, oh, he's right there. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they think that. Maybe they're getting real scared about it. That's the fake faker. Oh, no, not the fake faker denied of his back. Yeah. It's fake carrier. Fake carrier, yeah, I guess. Yeah. No works. That is, that is what it And that's the only player it that's the only player it works with. On the whole rift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Getting the hard hit analysis, analysis here, you know. Yeah. Down to naming conventions That's in this one. Do. Nothing yeah. else is happening. Yeah, Let's I, take a look at who has the most gold. Uh, it's. Oh. You know, I was looking Zeka? through it, I didn't get time. I think it was Zeka. Probably is highest, yes. Uh, Pina is here. Doran gonna pull him back to late. Also here, Zeus in a lot of trouble. He's got some help on the way, but flashed on with the charm and just no cues available. First blood goes over to Peanut once again. And yeah, the rest of them just a little bit too late on the rotation. Yeah, a lot committed there. You can kind of see the light was in a rush to make the play happen before they got collapsed on, but uh, ended up missing his W there onto Zeus. So had to burn the flash. But uh. I'm going to say it, if that Q hit from Guma, we could have been seeing like a solo kill, potentially. Um, he is doing ridiculous damage right now with that ability. Obviously maxing it with the but a Ghost Blade completed. I think like Q Rend would have just done half of Viper's re remaining health there. <laughs> just like Q Instant Rend, no autos. Yeah. Could have happened, but instead Viper just dodged it. Uh, it does have the boots. And he is behind about... You know, 17 CS at the end of this wave. Meanwhile, trying to set something up in mid. Faker does have his flash. Might rely on Zeka to get this one started. Although here comes Peanut now. The immediate flash comes out. Good respect from Faker, but now that uh, Talia is flashed. Yeah, I mean, I think you take that if you're Peanut. Um, been in the summoner without committing too much. Obviously worse, worse than that is if you flash and Faker flashes and then you're just trading. But uh, Peanut pretty far behind it. Ooh. Ooh. And now Zeus got a flash and he's getting TP'd behind. I don't think he even realized, but now he's trying to trade here on a door and he's so dead. It's Charm nice now. rings true. And again, this time Doran's actually being played around a little bit. Yeah, that Crazy. means he's got good setup on the Aatrox and that's two times in a row Zeus has been taken down. Uh, T1 will move towards this dragon. Fake is going to TP in as well, and I think with the fact that Ari's been in the ult, I don't see Honolite Esports contesting this. Yeah. We'll have to see what the soul is 
at the end of this, but Doran is going to pick up two plates solo. Yeah, two plates and a kill, pretty decent reward, and it is a Mountain Soul, so very high value. Uh, not too many like massive tanks in it, but I feel like Mountain Soul, it's just good for everyone. Yeah, it's just a good soul. Everybody's going to be building some resistances, and if you can get the soul, you get the shield on everyone. Oh, um, that is a lot of damage. Yeah. No rend, even. The light doesn't uh, resist that very well at the moment. Yeah, he's uh, a little bit vulnerable to that armor. I mean, that lethality. <laughs> he doesn't have armor, yeah. hence he's vulnerable to that lethality. Yeah. Vulnerable to armor. Um, yeah, sure. We'll go with that. So, Homolife Esports, two setups in the top lane, and that's about it. Couple of drakes going into the pockets of T1. And you know, I think we've seen this sort of situation before where Zeus goes 0 2 early and then just re emerges later into the game as kind of a monster. It has been kind of one of the hallmarks of this Aatrox pick. I feel like T1 haven't been playing around topside that much so far this season and kind of just satisfied and happy that if they early pick Aatrox, Zeus will eventually be a threat. So we'll see if that comes to fruition in this game as well. But now their team's setting up around the topside looking towards uh, that Herald that's spawning soon. Yeah, pretty good setup for... You want to just stun up immediately. Everyone with Doran is here, but Doran does have TP. Yeah, he's ready if they do need him. And this is feeling like old times, just flipping for the uh, Rift Herald and he's dead. Peanut just gets 100 comboed from there. Guma nearly dies as well to the poke from Viper. And now he's kind of out of the fight as now this front line is just being tipped away. I don't know he's going to get that Crescent Guard though. And a oh. big Nico ult from the bush, but he's only a support Nico. Carrier is eventually going to go down. So it was some nice uh, CC, but that was about it. Doran now in the front line though is kind of alone against the wall and the rest of T1. And that will be a favorable trade for T1. They might be able to pick up this Rift Herald, although. Yeah, I don't think they have the health bars to do it. They often go for a reset, but Peanut taking out first, giving. T1, oh, the momentum in that fight. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe a Viper just flashed to the left for some reason. That would have hit him, but uh, not quite in range there. Nice attempt by Fake here, though. And a swing and a miss. Oh my god, just the fact you can just Q and just one shot the casters is insane. And yeah, Peter got banana bushed. Um, he did. Just got one shot with no ability to play the game. We did see the ult from Viper and the charm chunking Guma out, so. But this is the thing with this Lethality Cluster, you don't need to be in auto range. So even though he's low, he can kind of just sit back, case in the auto, throw some Qs out on key targets, and still contribute to the fight. Yeah, I like uh, the wall too. It's that Q. You know. Yeah, that's fine. Eventually, uh, the Cassante is killable. Um, you know, you might think he's not, and that would make sense, but... They do eventually take him down. Yeah, today are pretty good in the Dixante altogether. Um, just the Unraveled Earth having a ton of value. And Guma now has opportunity finish. So two items in this cluster, and the Lethality cluster just spikes so hard early. Just zoning away Zeus, I guess. You know, not even... I mean, he went on to that so early, it's not even like he was trying to bait him under the turret or anything. Just trying to zone him away. Give some extra time for Dorn with this turret. Yeah, they are the only ones to have any Void Bubs with three in pocket. A little bit extra damage to tower. Definitely helps a champion like Cassante, who's not the best tower taker. Uh, but Goldie's slim in favor of T1. Not much there. But now, they're dragon in a minute. It is that mountain. It is going to be a high priority one. We'll have to see which team can kind of get the setup for it. Hunter Life Esports already moving towards it. Um, and potentially Peanut looking for something there. Yeah. Peanut ends Delight, but Delight is on Vision. There's no Flash and Guma, so if you do kill him... Carry him, maybe? That's a clone. <laughs> uh, yep. Didn't get the real one there. Always yeah. nice to face check. You know, it's one of the saddest things when you're playing support and you have to face check and just get one shot. So nice to be able to send in your clone just to do it for you. Yeah. Um, not the most ethical, but uh, it works. It's fine. And now they've kind of given over control off the Dragon area. And I feel like Hunt Life Esports can't really afford to get this one up. They 
Don't have the Herald either. I guess maybe they're trying to control mid so the Herald can't just get slammed by T1, but I'm not sure how much progress you're gonna make on that. Well, they're taking control of this brush, at least. And they are situated in the banana brush. Yep. The dragon banana brush. They still have a control ward for Peanut that they can place down. Yeah. CT1 trying to take over that part of the map. Meanwhile, some nice trading here. We don't have Leandri's for Faker in this game just yet. Yeah, not quite there. Not quite really cutting through. We do see the TP from Zeka a little bit it's away, but we're going to get into the fight while catching that mid-wave. Yeah, already a bit of damage. Decent amount of sticks in the Dragon, but actually, and now they're gone. Viper's just firing piercing arrows from this brush out of vision. So hard to deal with him in this situation. All right, we have a wall. Doran up against that said wall, just running around, reloading, getting ready. There are the chains, but that is a Shin Zhao. Now Peanut desperate to try to get into the pit as the Q comes in and he swipes early. It's not going to work. T1 take down the Dragon, and that is a win for them. They've also got this Rift Herald in mid to try to get a push. Um, I don't know the Susan to tank it up. Meanwhile. Yeah, not really that much value from it ultimately. I think they could have just rode it in. The knockback from the Herald when you bounce out of it is so long. I think you're probably okay, but they are conscious. Zeka still has ult, so does the light. Which kind of leads on to my point about that fight. Hollow Knight Esports never really got an opportunity to engage. They never really looked for it. They did fire some damage on our owner, but that was about it. Uh, and this wall, I think, was super high value from Faker. Separating Doran off here. And everyone was kind of cautious not to give an opportunity to ult them over. You can see Owner backs away, and Doran gets chunked out. They try and put damage on it, Owner doesn't work that well. And still, you know, oh. that can delight, not really making much of the situation. Yeah. Drake went down to like 24. So, very close on the steal from Peanut. Got a nice amount of burst coming in here onto Zekka. I swear he dashed through those rocks, but I guess he already got stunned. Yeah, we got knocked through, so, so it's fine. Yeah, totally okay. But he did have the spirit rush. And uh, yeah, I mean now T1 on soul points at this uh, point in time, just one mountain Drake away. Great position to be in, honestly. Uh, and now really trying to cement control of the map by taking this mid tier one, but Honor Life Esports are not letting it go. It's a very nice standpoint for Avaris to kind of hang around and have the protection of the Tier 1 to just be a bit of a turret of his own. Now Zeus, he's got some help from Faker, but we have lots of rotations coming down to the bottom lane, actually. Oh, no. Doran up against a wall and the rest of T1. He's going to get a double knockup in and an all-out now on a Faker. He's got Rakan nearby. Delight, a rare miss, actually, on that knockup but it might still be enough as Doran is going to take him out. Meanwhile, in the jungle, a big fight going on here as well. Peanut going to be taken out, and Doran eventually will go down. So now T1 charging up the bottom lane as Viper not able to do enough. Yeah, and as you said, Delight not been 100% on this Rakan so far. Zayus just doing so much damage. Once again, even though he got set behind in lane, still feels like he's making pretty big impact in these fights, and Peanut Going from POG to really a, not a solid performance in this one on the Lee Sin. Lee Sin seeming, seeming kind of cursed in the series. Yeah. Lee Sin, it can have value, but I think these teams are good enough to utilize some of the picks that can do well into it to a high level. And you know, I respect you, Brendan, for not mentioning the Rel. I thought you were going to bring up there and be like, hey, imagine if you could have picked yeah. another pick well, in this situation. Well, Rel. Yeah. yeah. Um, Maybe next time. And in this situation, you know, double knockoff from Doran, pretty nice. Uh, and then Delight, yeah, this is the second time he's just not been super sharp on it. Normally something he's really good off. And I'm not sure it would have made a massive difference to the outcome, but it would have at least made the kill quicker and potentially changed things around. But yeah, you can see in the rest of the fight, Peanut uh, ends up getting taken down. And I just think this, right now, Guma on this Callista is so powerful. And if he is able to get a Q on someone, maybe a couple of autos, there is no one really who can withstand the damage apart from Doran. He's the only person who has any semblance of tankiness against this pick. Yeah, and so far what we've seen out of him is uh, a lot of split pushing, 
You know, he, he was trying to be there for the Drake fight, but got put up against the wall and wasn't able to zone enough for the team. Yeah, I actually think something that's been really good is they put the wall behind the Cassante and be very cautious about, like, getting anywhere near so you can, like, flip into ulting you over the wall. Yeah. Um, that's, like, the worst case scenario when you're playing into Cassante. Mm -hmm. Well, we have the Drake in about a minute. See how Malife Esports trying to make their way into this area of the map once again. Try to take it over. I think last time we didn't see them use a lot of their engage tools. The poke maybe came down a little bit too late, like they got some late poke on the owner. I really need to see them start putting down the damage early on. Uh, particularly, like that's the thing is that yes, Guma can do a ton of damage with his lethality build, but his range is nowhere near Vipers. Uh, and you're not going to be able to just consistently fire off long-range arrows to chunk people out. So I want to see Viper get value out of that. He doesn't have the mana muni yet, but does have the fully stack here. Okay. Two big ults traded. I would probably say the Ari ult more important, though, for the fight. Yeah. You know, if this were a mid Nico, maybe you could say differently, but... At this point in time, Zeus in the top side, we do have the Chains of Corruption on the owner just to delay his impact on the streak, and they're just going to turn around. Carry is almost dead. It's now Homelite Esports. They just want to take the fight here. They don't even care about that Drake, but now the rest of T1 are coming in, and Zekka, he doesn't have an ulti. He doesn't have a flash, and he will go down. Baker in a lot of trouble, though. He's going to be taking out some low health bars as well, as here comes Doran, going to pull in owner and keep him around. The Crescent Guard is not going to help oh. against the Cassante, who is assassinating this team. Team. Say who's trying to go for the 1v4. That is not going to work out as the rest of your team is dead. Thorin playing that fight so well. Managing to get that double knockup at the end. You know, I feel like T1 lucky to get away with two members with Goom and Carrier still alive. Zayas was pretty healthy. But that bot lane easily could have gone down there. And regardless, Honor Life Esports deny the soul. But also showing they still have a lot of fight left in this game. Delight as well. This was a much better team fight from him. You know, oh, a yeah. little bit critical of what he did before, but they switched off the dragon looking for Carrier, who's hard to pin down, but Delight charms owner, knock up onto Guma, and then gets a charm on Faker and Zeus on the back end, so huge value there. Unfortunately, Zekka without the ult doesn't have too much value, but we see as the team are chasing down Faker, Doran, he's just in the mix and he's completely fine with it, but aggresses onto owner, finishes him, but then gets this beautiful knock up to the side on two. So well played by Honor Life Esports, and after I'm going to be real, a pretty subdued game for them. We're seeing that life back in them. Yeah, gives them a nice chance. I mean, this game is far from over. Yes, T1 are sitting pretty comfortably, but the fight is going to leave them kind of scratching their heads a little bit, I'd say. You know, they had a pretty decent angle from Zeus. The wall was decent once again, but um, just kind of got Cassante <laughs> at the end of it. You know, you know when I saw him dashing about? I yeah. was like, remember they nerfed his, his dash speed? They did, yeah. It doesn't feel like it. Chains down. Okay, I'm just going to say it. Stop Varus ulting the Zin Zhao. It's just not working. This is like the third time. The first time at least they chunked him, but the two times since, I mean, that time missed because the big treads meant the stun didn't even last long enough. Speaking of stuns. Okay. You know, fast reactions from Zekka, but it just never feels good. Um, this is like the second time in a row he's just burned his ult defensively. <laughs> yeah. Now you don't have your ult, so. Yeah, I mean, it is so low cooldown with sure. Malignance, but. And at least this time, there's not anything to fight for specifically soon. But yeah, definitely not the best feeling. Yeah. Nice little uh, angle, I guess, from Faker to spot him out. I guess maybe there was a ward over the wall. I'm not sure exactly how he saw him, but either way. Ultra Instinct. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, Just knows where all the enemies are at all times. Yeah, he saw Zekel walking over Vision like 47 seconds ago and extrapolated yeah. exactly where he'd be. STP! They really want to keep that mid-tier one I, alive. <laughs> like, this is the second teleport they've committed to keep that mid-tier one alive this game. Both times Doran has TP'd in, he's like, I'm not giving this over. Uh, and I'm not sure how you're going to get a third teleport into defend. It's pretty low on health, but yeah. for now it's still alive. I mean, they hold on to the turret. They keep Viper on his, his post, which is just in mid clearing waves and holding on to it as well. But now you don't have Doran in the side lane for a potential Baron. Play. Not sure if T1 really want to go for the Baron at this point in time with the I mean, game this T1. close. It's T1. It is, yeah. but I don't know, especially after that last fight. 
I'm not sure how confident they'd be. Yeah, I feel like it's only situations where T1 are winning. Oh man, the fourth time. Come on, Viper, please. <laughs> um, I feel like if T1 are winning, then they want to go for a Baron so they can get an advantage to close out the game. But if T1 are behind, then they... Oh, oh onto Akuma. There's a lot of people around, but Peanut doesn't seem to care. Look at that damage follow-up from Viper, too. Yeah, and now Akuma's just out of the fight. He's just so low now. Yeah, they could go for this, potentially. I mean, I... He's gonna have to recall and teleport. Uh, sorry, walk back in and have teleport. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> you know that would be a pretty good tool to have for the Baron. Everybody is know? way overexcited right now. Okay. Yeah. Like <laughs> I actually think this is scary for Hanoi Life Esports because Guma's making his way over. They don't have Viper or Delight ult. Those are big cooldowns not to have. Yeah. And this is, is on not from the top lane. This is not a fast Baron. Yeah. It's a slow Baron, in fact. As now the wall is gonna come in. They are gonna try to turn this one around. Stun from the rocks. Bit of damage into Owner. Who will struggle a bit into the poke before he uses that ult. Here comes Carry against the double knockup and the root down onto Zekka. He will go. And look at this. Doran also isolated. I'm like these sports. They wanted this fight. They asked for it. And T1 oh. said, hell yeah, we'll go for it. As into that back line goes Owner. Viper is going to go down. And the light will meet a similar fate. That's a very broken up one this time around. Started by Carrya. It's looking good for the side of T1 as Peanut still on the run, but... <laughs> yeah, I think he's going to keep running. I don't think he has a chance again back in this Baron Pit and a great fight from T1, a great angle to punish. I really think the lack of the ult from the Varus and the Rakan makes such a big difference in Hollow Life Esports team fighting power. No real opportunity to get down poke and second misses that initial charm which allows him to trade heavily on him. Faker kind of corrals them in, and this is such a beautiful setup with the not only Zayas threatening from the flank, but then Carrier ends up threatening over the wall. And there was a ward, but he was just so quick to implement the combo. You know, we see the Sante get focused out, and then Zayas is just causing mayhem in the back line. And this flash triple slow from Owen, a super high value. Yeah. At the end of the day, I don't even think they should have been there. <laughs> but um, they... Had control of the Baron Pit, they wanted to turn, but the second everything misses and you're just getting engaged upon by sticking around for too long, things are going to go south very quickly. And now T1 with the Baron, trying to make a fight here is Hamalife Esports on the Mountain Soul, but uh, you're losing turrets, you're losing yeah. control of the map very quickly. T1 don't need this dragon. You know, obviously Hamalife Esports long way away from Soul. Oh, this. Yeah, he's gonna catch out Zeus, and this time the chains get huge value as he even flashes at the end. I know Aatrox is strong, but yeah, he was pretty dead at that point in time. Yeah, a lot more value. Barasaulting the Aatrox instead of the Zinzao, looking like a good <laughs> angle for Hanoi Life Esports. Yeah, helps that uh, he got caught out now. Uh, Doran is taking a bunch of damage, actually. Look at the poke coming out as now Charm comes out, but Doran immediately dies! And Peanut's super low as well. The damage from the side of T1 is just huge, and that will be Mountain Soul to T1. Yeah, damage is getting laid down, and it feels like Honor Life Esports frontline just got overconfident with the situation, more focused on the dragon instead of the fight. The damage comes in, the cleanup is there, and T1 managed to pick up the Mountain Soul. Well, I guess they might get oh, area. Interrupted. Yeah, very unfortunate timing. I think he might actually get away now. Uh, I see. He uh, changes well. to Talia, so it's Faker who dies, not him. That's how it works, right? And they got fooled by Wait, the Wait, he's away! As well. And now Owner is coming on over. And Faker is here as well. Faker is pumping so much damage. I mean, look at his build. It's just damage. <laughs> like, it's kind of insane. It's now a very broken up fight. Zekka trying to do something onto the support, Carrier's but Carrier is still so alive. Free. And he will survive. Delight will not. That's that's such a tilter, honestly. Um, yeah, Carrier managing to get away from that situation. Seemed like it was kind of a certain death for him, but manages to bait them out, drag them away from the fight. And now T1, they can just kind of look to take these inhibitors. It's kind of like walking in the front door and nobody's home. They're like, huh. Well, I guess I'll make myself comfortable on the couch. Yeah. Nobody's here. <laughs> And that's two free inhibitors. They had a snack, and now uh, I guess they're just going to go home. Baron's timed out, but they can honestly just move towards the bot lane. Probably spend a bit of gold first, but then just push in while the super minions do the work for them. Guma has found a peanut. Yeah. Wow. That was a lot of damage. The whole team is there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're getting away from this one, Peanut. Nice kick. But Carrie has something to say about that. 
And that'll be the end of him. Just caught out in the jungle. Thought he could leave his base. Yeah, and there's no time pressure on T1 here. They can just wait for the super minions to push in. And Honor Life Esports, this tower is already so low. They're dropping the wall. Yeah, they're just diving into the turret. The wall comes down. Uh, he does get bounced on over, funnily enough. Andorin is is quite tanky, yeah, but they're just hitting the inhibitor at this point in time as Zeus. It's going to go down. They do take out the Aatrox, but it's three inhibitors down. Yeah, very hard to get back from this position. Oh, dang. Who hit? Uh, uh oh, yeah. He's. Oh, oh God. <laughs> he's just dead immediately. And down will go the next turret. Looks like T1 has finally broken into the base. That's another pick off onto Zeka this time. And down will go the Nexus. We have a series on our hands as T1 will tie it up and bring us to a game number three. Yeah, really strong performance, honestly. There was definitely some moments where I felt like maybe they'd lost the momentum. Carrier came in with a fantastic ult that helped out the team fights, but just a great bounce back. You know, the draft in game one, I think, gave them a massive disadvantage. I don't think the draft here necessarily was uh, a guaranteed win or anything, but definitely gave them a fighting chance. And we saw them deliver on that. You know, it was a slow paced early game, but when it came back down to those fights, the execution was very crisp. And I'm going to be brutally honest, some members of Honor Life Esports felt a little bit off. You know, Delight, who's Rakan, we normally praise all the time, had a, a few whiffs in that one. Not the easiest game to play Rakan into Talia, obviously. Um, but yeah, and I think Peanut <laughs> going from player of the game, game one, very heavily deserved to uh, not so hot in game two. Yeah, I mean, he had like some decent angles, but the the, the difference in terms what of is... impact is pretty huge. Look how much damage Ona did on Xin Zhao. Yep. Um, he was just always in the thick of things. Yeah, getting it done. Uh, and yeah, pretty solid performance to bounce back. Well, that was game number two. It is all tied up one to one. We're going to take a break and have the space afterwards. We'll be right back. ちゃんとどうでもこれでこっちだ。よ、パルトとこれ。もうなんか。パルトプリント。クリンジマント。オッケー、オッケー。ボン軽け。あ。あ、チェック、チェック、チェック。パウダー。パウダー。やあ、待
Glacial Prison goes completely wide. Decent seismic shove there, but the face call is now going to come through and Peanut onto two from Delight as they dive into the sky, says Keen. And Pays says, all right, that's where I'll send him. But yeah, now Wall comes down here. That's, uh, yeah, Vickers just probably dead here in a ton of trouble. He will flash and immediately dies. In the mid game, then you're doing something wrong. And Nongshim, they're not doing anything wrong. Not yet, anyway. As Beryl, he is, he's gonna throw his anchor away. Does have to use his ult onto Jiwu with no one around. It's a decent seismic shove. But now Jiwu is taking matters into his own hands. Steph, no Featherstorm, remember. And he does look for it, but he's not gonna find it. Jiwu down to about 100. Like Darren's blade. Um, did you notice that? Notice that, by the way? Carrier moved away from the lane to give level two first. And that's gonna be first blood to Carrier. Speaking of it, as the, uh, is he the AD carry or is he the support? Well, I don't know anymore as Carrier picks up a double kill on Kalista. We do have Bull to take him down as now Zeus is pretty unkillable himself on this lethality Aatrox. And yeah, they're gonna put a lot into him, but it's not quite enough. As now Carrier, he's just running at the enemy team as he might fall here as finally Bulldog takes him out, but after. A dive. That is a uh, sweet spot connection. Kingan just needs. Okay, yeah, he is going to be taken down. Gets out of turret. Right? What? Can he do There's it? No he way! Does. How did that even happen? Next is turret that's going to go down. Now, Willa, cease and desist comes in, and that is at least that first kill, but Chains of Corruption somehow does not find anyone. Kingan. Went down relatively low, but there's the triple kill for Showmaker. Now Hannah, he's trying to kite them underneath this turret, but the pushback the on the closer, angle, the, the quadra angle. kill for the Karma, and there Contact it is, the Penta kill for Showmaker's Karma. Welcome back to the space, ladies and gentlemen. We are here ready to break down a game number two that went the other direction and prepare ourselves for a game number three. Absolutely fantastic. I've got Hooney and Chronicler here ready to break down the draft, which we felt was maybe not necessarily quite as favorable for Harmer Life Esports this time around. And let's, uh, let's have a look at it. Dive into it for me, boys. I, I love Delight. I think Delight is an incredible player. I think he's one of the best parts of this roster. It sounds roster. like a no offense. No offense, but <laughs> that Rakan pick was not it, man. It, with the with the Talia and the Zin already being picked, like face up as well. Hear me out. What if that was a Zyra? Uh, Still bad. Sure. I mean, it's just like more so has to be matchable against Nico support, right? It's not like 
They both have E's that do snares. Yeah, but so so the main issue with Rakan is just that the laning phase was rough. Actually got caught a bunch of time, didn't have any pressure. And as Huni was saying, like, I don't think Rakan matches that great into Nico. And then come late game, you can't engage on Xin Zhao. You can't engage on Nico because of Fate's goal. You can't engage on the fellow the Aatrox because he's a tank. You can't engage <laughs> on Talia because it's Talia. So what does Delight actually get to do? Also, obviously missed a couple of Ws, but... It really feels like anything, but that would have been anything utility, maybe an enchanter. Like, I, I'm not usually the biggest fan of that, but this was not it, unfortunately. A cow could have been better, right? Maybe? Yeah, I mean, at least because it's like it also it impact, it effect because you already have an AD carry on the virus as well. I mean, sure. I mean, it's also, they also brought out the, the Ari and Lee and I feel like didn't really work well against, especially Talia Zinzo. I think Zinzo pick was re actually really great because like, you can't just go in, just throw the body and just press ulti and not dying. And that's how you need to get the visions out. But this way, but the other jungler, if he's like any other champion, would have been like pretty, it would have been really tough for T1. I also want to give a really a lot of credit to T1 because with the Nico pick, you basically ensure that they have to ban Nocturne. Like guaranteed, otherwise you're playing into Nico Nocturne, which is almost unplayable. T1 has used it, like especially the first couple of weeks, insanely well. And then you also have Poppy, which we know needs to be banned because of what Peanut did to them last game. So, I, I think there weren't a lot of good options. So credit to T1 for a good draft bounce back after what was a rough game number one. Yeah, and then they decided to just take control of the game from about minute one. Of course, there was a little bit of back and forth here and there, but it was neutral objectives that T1 really played around. Let's have a look at our highlight number one and really jump into how this story began in this game. Yeah, I mean, starting with the, the HLE, it was kind of side, you know, they were kind of eyeballing it. Like, oh, they're doing the Drake. Like, what should we do? They didn't clearly have any pry on the blue from the lane. And I feel like it was, it's just, it's just like a little bit, you know, they're kind of greedy. Like, they rather actually just push the wave and get the tempos faster. Like, this is like really good at T1, T1 thing. It's like, you just, just calculate it so fast that what you need to do next as a next step. And this is like, we're actually kind of game breakdown. The big thing here is also that Guma was allowed to play the game. Like, the Kalista has so much value, we just didn't get to see it at all in the last game. Not even, I think, because of Guma. And then here, because you already have built up that lead, you get the Drake uh, stacking going. That was the first Drake so early, so that even though Humble Life in Fury has a decent team fight, if they ever misplay around any following objective, you're playing Lethality Varus into Mountain Soul. Yeah, and it's not, yeah, Chemtech anymore. It is the Mountain, and that is very, very difficult because there was Lethality sort of everywhere, right? There's the Varus that's heavily relied upon here by Harmal Life Esports and then double on the side of T1. So let's have a look at the final highlight here, the final nail in the Harmal Life Esports coffin, if you will, because this is where T1 really took this game over. They just used the lights. Oh, they're down a crucial cooldown, and they still try to force. Yeah, I mean, also, they it's just like right this before the previous fight, I think the HLE handled really, really well. So I didn't really feel like anything that they are in rush. Like, they can just go back to play, like, where they were good at it. Like, this game was so slow phase that it's going to be no matter what, the Drake team fighting, just go around the object control. Like, though, I didn't really feel like they had to pull out the Baron trigger. It's like, I don't, like, there was no, like, the clear plan as well like they're uh, sure i get that they are desperate but sh they can do same thing with the ro lower ri risk at the just one more drake team fight yeah they didn't quite manage to do so let's have a look at who picks up player of the game for this one i am sensing a new number for a gentleman here it is faker is going to move up alongside trovi once again at 1.1k we're expecting a smattering of votes because I think Owner had a great bounce back game. Carrier, his ultimates were amazing, but the walls were the big difference maker for us. Faker segmented so many of these fights off in a way that was very beneficial to T1. And it was, to me, the biggest difference maker in how a lot of these fights played out compared to the team fights in game number one. Yeah, I mean, definitely, as you, as you mentioned, it, I think the Faker wall, it actually made it really different. And also, I think the lane phase, it could be really tough as well. Like, as I, as I said it from the draft, it's just like highlighting the Ari and Leasing combo and getting away, just th just playing through that lane. It's already really big credit. Yep, and 300 points ahead of third place. Uh, that is a tie with a whole bunch of junglers and Zeka. We'll see whether, you know, Zeka could potentially find an opportunity in our next game. As you mentioned, a bit of a smattering of votes here, but I kind of agree with Faker picking this one up, uh, even if it does also 
help with our narrative battle of POG points going to, towards uh, both Chovy and Faker. It is now time to throw it back to the casters, though, and get into game number three and see who can take it in the end. Thank you, Spacers, for that awesome breakdown. Just want to point out, I, I actually do agree with the Faker vote, but you you guys are both with the uh, with the two media guys uh, on that one. And Faker does pick it up with six out of twelve. It's okay. It makes sense. I think there were he deserved it. There were multiple people to contribute. Not good games. Like I think carrier vote completely fair. Um, Boomer is pretty boom boom damage. Uh, Owner was was my vote. I think he managed to get a pretty big lead in the early game over. Uh, over Pina and also had pretty high impact, uh, which we don't always see on junglers nowadays in terms of like fight impact, because we often get, well, I mean, the tanks have fight impact, but they're not doing the damage and getting stuck in. So it was good to see, um, regardless. But going on the draft, we have finally got a size switch up. So Hon Wife Esports on blue side, uh, and the expectation is things will change quite a bit on the back of that. Senna gonna be quickly banned away by T1, but Ori, then Lucian banned away by Hanwha Life Esports. Lucian kind of overlooked, and you know, I'm going to say it, maybe some T1 fans pretty happy that the <laughs> Lucian's getting banned after the Gen G. Yeah, series. I, I mean, I don't think it's really necessary to ban it away, but if you do have a specific pick in mind, take away the Lucian, take away the Callista, you want to play something that scales up a bit, uh, like a Varus, and doesn't have to really worry about anything. Yeah, I mean, my question is, are T1 going to ban Varus? Are they going to let... Uh, Viper have it. This guy has just been playing Varus pretty much non-stop, so I feel like if it's left open, he may well just first pick it. Yeah, and if it does get banned away, perhaps we see something in the mid lane, or otherwise, if with all of these bot lane bans you want to get your hands on, like, the best pick at the moment, you could do that as well, but, like, the Karma's available, Maokai available as well, they're gonna immediately lock that one in. Yeah, so it was banned away before by T1, now left open, could obviously be flex, support, or jungle. Although I would probably expect Peanut to be playing it, but we'll see. Um, regardless, doesn't really show too much right now. Uh, we'll see what T1, T1 want to up for in this situation. They do want to prioritize an AD carry, but could also lean towards things like the Ari. Uh, that's available. The Aatrox first <laughs> pick. Never change, Zayas. Um, he knows what he wants and he goes for it, but they are looking at the Ari as well alongside and will lock that in. So, two strong solo laners picked up already at 41. Definitely a lot of power in those two picks. And for Hunter Life Esports, you know, you can try and just match those solo laners if you really want to right now. You could look to secure a bot lane. If you pick up a bot, bot lane duo, then obviously there's only one pick that you want to respond. You could go like AD carry uh, mid, potentially. You know, depending on what they want to lean towards, I'm not sure they'd want to go for like the Smolder angle, but like Karma Smolder's been popular, but I don't know about Karma with the Maokai. They're gonna actually pick up the Jace. Imagine if they had yeah. Varus with this as well. Yeah. Like Varus, Jace, and Maokai. Thankfully that was banned away. You know, Jin in another year, another meta, could be fun, but let's see what they decide to go for. Could just, you know, lock in an AD carry for mid. You know, Try I utilize that. I think Zek has been I mean, the last game I don't think was his hottest Ari game, but generally he's been good on Ari. But Talia, I'm hoping we get a good Talia performance from Zeka. But I definitely have a lot more faith in Faker and Zeus on Ari and Aatrox than I do on Zeka and Doran on Talia and the Jace. Oh, and I'm going to go back to the Lee Sin. Lee Sin Ari, really strong combo. But Lee Sin being a little bit curious this series, not having the most impact so far. Uh, and Rakan ban. I like because you're never really going to play Rakan as T1 when you're into a Maokai and a Talia. Uh, that would be almost as bad as picking Rakan last game. Um, so <laughs> Probably worse. <laughs> Probably honestly. even worse, which is impressive. So they will ban that one away. And Honor Life Esports, they know that T1 have counter pick, so definitely want to clear away some of those strong lanes that you know uh, T1 like to lean towards. It's going to be one of those Ophelios Melio games. <laughs> With all of the uh, bands we've seen so far, you can only get so many bot lane duos that work well. Yeah, I feel like so far with how the draft has developed, it's very much the anti-dive from Hunter Life Esports, and T1 are definitely more dive focused, so I think the Zeri could honestly make sense. Yeah. Not necessarily a pick that Guma is known for, though, but something that's kind of sl uh, slid through is the Nautilus. And 
Obviously, I think every support in the league has to be competent Nautilus. It's so ingrained in the meta for such a long time, but very reliable pick, and Carrier will pick that one up, prioritizing the support first, so not getting counter pick, yeah. but ensuring he gets priority on that champion. And now Honwa is just going to go for the small to Alistair. Alistair Delight is phenomenal on this pick, was so good last summer on it, but also pretty popular being played into the Nort, but good against Lee Sin and Aatrox, are just headbutting them away. And Viper on the small dot looking to scale up. Uh, looking at T1's picks, I think it's a tricky one, honestly. Zeri yeah. definitely syncs well with the composition, but both are going to provide pretty strong cleanup after that initial pick in the fight. Uh, but I think maybe Zeri a little bit safer uh, playing against things like the Maokai. You can obviously just ult you when you're bot lane. Yeah, I think Zeri is much more meta nowadays as well. And you take the Nautilus that says, okay, well, you're not allowed to pick Zeri. And then that allows them the, the option to pick it themselves. And they do take it here. But pretty interesting. Definitely a, a very scrappy composition from the side of T1, whereas a bit more control on the side of Hummelife Esports, a lot of control with Alistair, um, Talia, and Maokai for yeah. zone. And then you have like a, a nice amount of poke with Talia and Jace, and even the Smolder, who's going to be hyperscaling. Yeah, you got the two bodyguards in the Alice and the Maokai, just protecting the, the delegation. It's not just a singular VIP, <laughs> but uh, all three of them they got to provide cover for. Uh, definitely more nuanced to play in this, I'd say, but I think the pace is going to need to be set by T1. Ultimately, they're into a Smolder, and nothing new there. You need to really be driving forwards, and I'm going to be real. Zeri, Nautilus into uh, Smolder, Alistair, there's not a ton you can do on the 2v2 to really set yourself ahead there, unless Honor Life Esports bot lane misplay. So maybe looking at Faker and Owner to make an impact and spread their presence down to the bot lane. Well, they certainly might just do that here, Ox, as Faker has gone on to Ari now for the first time tonight. Let's see how it does go as we hop on the rip for game number three. Honor Life Esports! Ta-da! Do it! Honor Life Fighting! All right. Game three. I feel like we don't get a lot of game threes nowadays. It's been a lot of 2-0s, but if there was going to be a series that's going to go to three, this was going to be it. Yeah. Um, and you know, as we kind of hit on at the start of the series, a lot of implications for this. If uh, T1 win, then Gen G and T1 are secured in round two. They get the double elimination, the safety net. Yeah. Uh, but also, I just feel like even if T1 ended up winning this, Honor Life Esports drawing blood, uh, they didn't manage to do so in the last series up against them. I think everyone was looking at Honor Life as being the team to challenge the top two, and the possibility to deny is just another T1 Gen.G Finals, which most people would say is a very safe <laughs> bet. Um, We're probably at like, ooh, nope. Uh oh. Zeka just not in range. Peanut just going to dab on the haters. Yep. And that, I, I don't think I've ever seen that emote from Zeka. What was that? Oh, I didn't actually catch it. I was looking at the runes. Triple phase rush topside from Honor Life Esports. And first dragon is Cloud. They're going to be going fast. Zoom. Zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom. It's so funny because it's so, so, you're so used to seeing like T1 champions having like an insane win rate. Um, just because they obviously win a lot of games. But Owners Lee, one and three at the moment. Uh, not gone so hot so far. Had some struggles. Uh, and honestly, it's not Poppy, but Maokai, Talia aren't fun champions to play Lee Sin into. No, certainly not. I, I think the second that you see the Maokai, you're already feeling it. And then you pick Aatrox Ari, and the enemy team is going to be like, well, we're going to draft more zone control, more engage. Um, as Doran, you were talking about this. You know, how, how well is he going to be able to play this matchup? Already getting a decent trade, although he takes some damage on the backside of that one. And uh, it's going pretty evenly so far, we can say, based on what we've seen. And I think this kind of highlights the lane. Like, you're not going to get level 2 on Alistair in like pretty much any matchup. But the fact that Carrier got level 2, goes in, gets pulverized, and Viper and Delight don't even back off. Like, normally when you're playing bot lane 2v2, if the enemy bot lane gets uh, level 2 fish, like, oh god, we have to get away. They're just like, no, yeah. it's fine. It's limited opportunity to punish, I think, is the takeaway that's been demonstrated here. Um, which, when you're picking a smolder, 
You're more than fine with our situation. That's exactly what you want. Viper, I believe he is still our fastest stacker to 225 on the smolder. I'm not sure, because we had a fast one the other day that might have been it, but he's definitely up there. He was below 20 minutes. He was like 1952. I think we had one yesterday that was like 1920, 30-ish. Really? I definitely remember there being a really fast one, maybe like 1940. I don't know. We'd have to check, but I regardless it was like of whether... like a 21 minute or but... Regardless of whether he was the fastest, uh, he's very fast. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, here's Lee Sin. The slow comes in and the flash charm does land on the second. Do they have the damage though? The orb comes in and owner! Oh, he's going to get first blooded as they will pick up the kill at least. But Zeka will be pretty happy about that. This feels like deja vu. Chovy did the exact same thing as uh, Zeka did there. Getting engaged on early by the Ari as the Talia, knocking the Lee Sin into the tower. We saw this in our series earlier today. Uh, just one of the dangers. Early ganking the Talia. You get a bit too close to that tower, you're going to take multiple hits with the stun combo through the rocks. So, nice answer back from Zeka. And with the teleport back in, you don't really lose anything. Two flashes bid on T1 and 1 of Final Life Esports. You're pretty happy with that. Yeah, you definitely are. I mean, it does mean that, um, you know, Lee Sin and Ari still do have a lot of potential, especially once level 6 is hit to make plays on the flashless Talia. So he is going to have to be careful. I mean, this is one example, right? You can even come in here right away, although there is a very important ward that was placed, and it is going to keep Zekka safe. But yeah. even Kerry is making his way up here, level three. Yeah, they're spotted though. Um, yeah. And I feel like one of the things, when when you see someone on a ward like that, you have to resist the urge to immediately charge back to your tower if you can help it. Uh, Zekka obviously moved back a bit to be safe, but he kind of didn't want to immediately give away that there was a ward. Carry ends up moving over as well. You waste more time in that way. And he still didn't end up going down. But we'll see the replay in this situation. Uh, and I think ultimately, they could have kind of just gone away with this just being the flash. Owner, unfortunately, ends up missing the Sonic Wave. Perhaps if you waited for Faker to hit the charm, that's just a clean kill. Um, but ends up trying to predict the flash with the Q. And then when Faker commits, doesn't have the Q to follow up. So a little bit uh, unfortunate there. Oh. I took on a Viper, he's going to be in a bit of trouble, has to cleanse. And this is my favorite part about a lot of how you play Alistair's matchups, where you're playing more defensively, is when the support engages on your AD carry, you just headbutt Zeri away. Uh, he doesn't have many cooldowns now, he is going to get the Pulverize once again, but now he's down a flash, and the chasing potential of Lee Sin and Zeri will eventually catch up to him. So, good in the 2v2, but... Eventually, with owner there, it's going to be too much. Yep, kind of seen the payoff uh, of that first initial trade, being in the cooldowns of Delight. If you had everything available, if you had the headbutt, maybe you could have gotten out of that one, uh, but just able to pin him down. And a kill for Azari, very valuable for T1. Yeah, it's going to be a nice early start. Um, at least Viper is still alive and he can stay stacking, so he doesn't really have to That's lose too much. That's all he cares about. Oh, my support died? Pretty much, yeah. Can I stack? Yeah, cool. I'm good. Actually, yeah. The, the cow is just <laughs> just there to keep you company, essentially. Keep you safe. Keep you stacking. Um, okay, so the light actually swept as he walked past that brush. So Zayas knows someone's there, but not that it's specifically Delight. I Zeus. think you may be dead, buddy. <laughs> well, he's got Flash. He just likes to just go down. And with four people in the top lane, I think... He'll be okay with that, but yeah, uh, still think. gonna be a nice win for Amalai if he's worth. The right call to save the flash, and you know, this is honestly actually dangerous positioning for Viper. Like, he doesn't have vision control in the river, but Kerry is mid, so he's on an opportunity where he can kind of just walk up here, fortunately. But definitely could have been threatening if T1 were in position to capitalize. They're not, though, so this play goes pretty unpunished for Amalai Fee Sports. And uh, yeah, seeing the repeats of cooldowns unavailable, they're like trying to force the cannon down. Uh, and yeah, just everything kind of gets layered. I believe his headbutt was on cooldown here. Uh, still from the earlier trade and just taken down. And then... Zeus. He's got everything flying at him. Yeah. He would have had to flash right there as the headbutt was coming in, but even then, you're probably dead. Yeah, I think it's so risky. With your, you being so low, like, Zeka could have just flashed after you and killed you, so... Yeah. I respect the decision not to. Um... And now T1 invading on this red buff, just denying from Peanut. But he's playing Maokai, he's pretty 
unfazed. Although I think if he's lost his Krogs to a Zeri laser, I think that <laughs> would bother him. He would be pretty phased. Yeah. If that happened. He might even be rushing with his phases. Yeah. True. That is something he does. Remember Predator? Nope. Don't know what that is. <laughs> This is still in the game, right? Yeah. I can't honestly remember the last time I've seen, in solo queue or competitive, the Predator rune. They really just yeah, it. I, I they don't... really just deaded it. It was very strong, yeah. but um, now it's really not very strong at all. <laughs> so That's crazy. It's gone. How nerfs work, you know. Yeah. And this is the way it goes. Very nice control lord here is going to spot carry a no pings on him. They must have seen him. Uh, they must, they have, must seen have seen him. him. Surely. Surely. Surely nice. Goran doesn't just die to Carrier. Now they've definitely seen him, and Carrier's also seen the control ward. And I think he was <laughs> dead. Well, I mean, he is going to... Yeah, I know. He's, he's um, nice little dive. They see Carrier. Immediately they say, hey, let's just dive the Zeri who's alone. Yeah, two point and click CCs. More than enough. Uh, and it's actually a ghost from Goomer, so... I mean, I, I don't think there's anything you can do, but it's not even like he can cleanse the Maokai root. He was just dead. Um, oh, no. Oh, no, not the disengage cone. Man, he just had a sixth sense. He just kind of knew. Yeah. Maybe someone's hiding in a brush. Just, I guess that's what you got to do. It's like uh, it's like the desert walking in Dune. You just have to like, yeah. throw, you, throw your step off a little bit. Um, you actually do. You pretend you don't know. You run towards the brush, and then right when you get in range of what you know would be the range, you, know, I always you find just do a little sidestep. I find it so hard to like, you know when you're waiting in a bush and you know they can't see you and you're trying to predict that movement and they just do some random erratic stuff. <laughs> but when you're in vision, yeah. you can kind of read. I know what they're going to do, right? Yeah, they think yeah. I'm going to aim here, I'm going to throw it, you know, whatever. But I swear the worst is when there's no vision and you feel so bad about it. You're like, they couldn't even see me and I missed. Yeah. So like you're playing an FPS game and the guy's got his back to you. Similar thing. Yeah. So you don't know which Ray he could go anywhere, but if he's yeah. looking at you, you know what he's gonna do. Yeah. So. Yeah, that dive was didn't take a lot of explaining. They saw a carry atop and they pressed their buttons. Yeah, they they certainly did. They managed to to manage that one. Uh, and yeah, not a huge lead. It is gonna be a Chemtech Dragon second, so setting up for a good soul most likely. Carrier. Really wants to be top lane, but I think something to mention is the fact that game one, Doran was kind of left out to dry. And they've actually been setting up vision pretty well for him. Playing for him a bit, but also just ensuring uh, he can't get spam ganged because Carrier really wants to kill him. Yeah. I think it's safe to say. So a lot. Something that Viper does that other um, Smolders don't do is he will actually just make sure that he sets up his stacks so well. He'll only auto if he knows he's gonna miss it with his Q um, for the CS. I've seen a lot of the other Zeris in our LCK League just... Uh, I mean Smolders. Just, yes, Smolders. Um, just basically clear the wave as fast as they can so they can be elsewhere on the map. Piper's like, no, <laughs> I'm in the right place. I, I'm clearing this wave. This is all I need to do. I need to get the max stacks on this one. Yeah, you need that Nasus mindset. You know. Yeah, or Vagar. You know, I've seen Faker do the same thing on Vagar, where he's like just sitting there tanking six minions because he only wants to kill them with his Q. Yeah. Obviously, it gets a lot easier later when you can just Q a wave as the Smolder and just kill like yeah. seven yeah, minions at once. And obviously, you can waste a lot of time doing that, but especially in Smolder's case, it feels worth because you want to hit 125 as fast as possible. Uh, I don't think you can two-man dive that. Nope. But I Not again, Delight setting a vision on the top side. I do like to see it. Uh, I want to just steal away a camp here. And yeah, it's kind of just business as usual, which I think, you know, it is Infernal Soul coming out. Our favorite, just because of the, the cinders everywhere. Um, ultimately, a pretty nice one for T1. But I still think Honor Life useful with the general state of the game are okay. T1 stacking the dragons early is important, forcing a fight as soon as possible. But I think Honor Life Esports probably still going to be able to get. Viper to 225 before Soul is on the cards, which is the main takeaway. Yeah, I'd say it's very likely. Um, Delight, you're denying oh, stacks. Come uh. on. <laughs> Viper <laughs> will tell his mom. You know that for a fact. That's like how every 80 carry sounds in Soul. <laughs> it's yeah. like the sound to just made. Oh, come on. Um, 
All right, Zekka, he's getting in there. We got a one-on-one -on -one Faker with one more Essence and a ton of damage into Zekka will just run away and elect to not follow up on that one. Yeah, I mean, pretty. I actually think maybe Zekka can stay around and clear that wave up. There's not too much touch him right now, but he will reset. Uh, T1 going to do the grubs on the top side, and Zekka just going to TP back in to catch that. Uh, oh, obviously being by Faker, but going to TP out of Zekka. I think pretty worth, especially once you post Malignance. You got old, like, look, look, look at that old cooldown ticking away, you know? It's going pretty fast. It's pretty fast. Uh, I can see it as well. It's, it's going down. He's almost at half already. I can see it moving. Sometimes when you have, like, Galio old, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's just, it's state. State's call is, is like, it broken? Uh, you have to, like, tap, <laughs> tap the screen a little bit. 160 seconds. <laughs> Isn't that, I think at rank one it's 180 now. It's three minutes. Yeah, it's or something. It's like things like Galio and Tarek have just like absurdly long ults, which is awful in solo queue because you have like fights yeah. every like 17 seconds. Um, but obviously, pro play a little bit more slower paced. But that's kind of the value of the Ari having so much. Uh, oh, cheeky! Got him! <laughs> the <laughs> mental victory is there. <laughs> And we're just setting up for a Rift Girl fight, okay. Hey, just came up. And we're just gonna go for the flash forward from Carry. It doesn't get much of anything as it's gonna go to Faker, actually. Peanut in the pit, he's living for so long and he gets over the wall as well. Nearly gets another passive in there, but it's still going to be a nice little one for two trade in favor of Hall Life Esports, but T1 did get the Herald. But honestly, that looked like it was so heavily in favor off T1 until Delight got this monster knockup. Yeah. Uh, they kind of turned things around, and after that, T1 were kind of just lucky to get away without dying. Uh-oh. He's walking. Yep, he's checking every brush. He's not walking up. He suspects. Could Delight be here again for the 17th time? He is. Suspicious. And it's not only Del <laughs> it's also Zekka. Yeah. Just hanging out in the bush. All right. Don't, don't trust anything. This it's is like the first play. time tonight that our top laner is respected. Yeah. <laughs> Their champion in this top lane. Yeah, T1, get in the pick pretty, pretty quickly and focus down onto Peanut. Uh, he survives a crazy amount of time on the back end. Yeah. Uh, the ult doesn't get huge value. Ooh. This knockup with the light, followed by the Zekka shove back monstrous. I'm just going to say it. If Viper kept his ult for that knockup, I think they just get like four kills there. Um, so a little bit unfortunate. Delight should have told Viper I'm about to knock up four people, save yeah. Oh, maybe. <laughs> you gotta see it. You have to have that chemistry between the bot lane, you know? Yeah. yeah. You just gotta know. It's gotta know. Just trust in Delight's Alistair. Um, but yeah, still, I mean, even though T1 got the Herald, it's still a gold lead for Hunter Life Esports. Any advantage when you have a small to really solid, that 150 stacks on Viper, probably looking at around, maybe even like, not sure he'll get sub 20 minutes, but not too far off um, if he keeps clearing up jungle camps and stacking. Yeah. If like 21, 22. Uh, and T1, do have a dragon coming up in 30 seconds. Hard Life Esports don't need to feel obligated to fight this. It is risky getting so close to Sol, but I think you are free to just keep stacking if you don't see the angle. Yeah, I mean, if you hit 225 by the soul fight, I, I think you're feeling pretty good. Also, I feel like Hextech for sure is just so broken. Mountain is really problematic. I, I feel like it feels strong, don't get me wrong, but I still think it's playable, um, especially when you have a smolder. Yeah. So I, I think that max precarious. burn but not completely doomed. And it looks like they're setting up the fight, but we'll see if they fully opt into it. See some poke already coming down here from Doran and Viper. You gotta be careful not to stay right behind the Drake or it will bounce onto you. And the Maokai ult here going to kind of corral them as here comes Boom to help out as well. Carry is getting so low and the steal comes in from Owner. But now with Carry it down, it looks like Hamalai Esports do want to capitalize as much as possible. Let's see what they can do here as T1 are moving in yeah, towards the mid lane. Just side of the base. Uh, but I guess aggro is there. Oh, Life is chasing. You see that ward? Stop them in their tracks. Not going to matter. And they're just going to go away. Yeah, so T1 get the dragon. But I think Hunter Life Esports approached it well. Picked up a kill. Um, didn't let it go for free. It's still definitely an advantage to T1. And they are approaching Soul. But the thing is as well is like 
you know, you think about getting a lot of stacks from farming, but Viper ends up getting a lot of stacks on these fights. Especially he was like queuing the dragon to bounce it on people. Um, I want to actually have a stack check when we can. Faker is waiting. Won't be rewarded for his patience. He's not like 180, Viper. He's quite close. Okay, 170. Yeah, I kind of felt like the pace would pick up a little bit with how high he is. Yeah, I really like the use of the Tlea wall to crawl them in and then the Maokai ult afterwards. Uh, and they kind of just focus a lot down on a carrier, but lose track of the dragon a little bit. Peanut does. And then the hyper mobility of the carries of T1 just means you ain't catching anyone. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to win the fight, it's another to make sure you actually pick up all the members and kill them. The fight was in their favor. But one kill. Not as good as one Infernal Drink. Yeah. And one step closer to the Infernal Soul. A steady climb for Home Life Esports, but it's a very, very slowly steady climb. Slow, steady climb, you could say. 183. Definitely not beating his record. Uh, safe to say nope. at this point. But uh, oh. 188. I mean, it's definitely before the next dragon. Sure. That's for sure. So that's going to be at about 22 minutes. And that's the thing. If you fall behind in pace, like... If Viper wasn't stacking quickly, we've seen much, we've seen like 26, 27 minute yeah. full stacks. You just wouldn't, like Soul would be gone before you even get uh, fully stacked. So definitely an important factor here. Uh, I think that mid tier one tar might just be gone. Still gone. Mom couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, unfortunately on that one. Uh, but T1 using that pressure well, rotating up to the top side. And take down this tower as well. Especially valuable when they do want to be setting up for Baron. Uh, but that's a TP and a wall. <laughs> All right, nice charm off the wall. Faker experienced some of those himself. He has done it well as now. Kick comes in and they just don't really want to take part of this. But the Maokai ultimate is going to keep them around and make this very awkward for T1. That's some really low health bars to flash on him from Peanut. He assassinates Faker. And now Karia just trying to frontline, just trying to make some space for the rest of his team. But. Zayu's TPing in as well. He's on the run. He's not going to do anything by himself. And how if he's worse, might look at this Baron. Yeah, I mean, it's just spawned. You have an Alistair. If you get control of the area, you can easily deny Ona from getting into the pit. Now, they have wards set up. <laughs> you have to be careful for Doran to not lose his life to the Baron. Yeah, Pina's also low, and there's a Storm that got the Aatrox. Oh, they're just trying to turn at this point. Uh, uh. Not sure, actually. And now Zeri's getting an angle. The Q lands on a peanut. Owner, he threats the needle. And he's going to take him down. As now, oh, God, where did he go? Guma just plucked out of the air. And that's going to be the end of him. Owner, super low as well. As now we got TP's coming in, though. Faker looking for the cleanup. But Viper just going to flap over the wall. And again, it's very early. So it's not like Faker and Karia can do this Baron. But Faker would like as many kills as possible. As the charm is very pretty. And he will pick up yet another one. So many cinders all over the floor is my takeaway from that fight. Get the Sonic uh, Rings! Pick them up, loot them, get the ability haste. But yeah, I mean, Honor Life Esports definitely caught in a difficult spot. Setting up for the Baron um, does end up backfiring a bit. But yeah, this Nestle fight, it's a good charm from Faker. And Doran doesn't commit on a Faker, doesn't want to obviously get a uh, jump on him from just to ult away three times. But this Maokai ult angle so good. But you can see as soon, as soon as the Aatrox TP comes in, they're a little hesitant. Like, you get the flash Q from Peanut, but they all just say, okay, forget Guma and Ona. We need to peel back. We don't want to get caught between them sandwiched. And then here, this was such a tense play. Uh, Doran nearly gets popped here. Has to two flashes bit immediately trying to deal with Zeus. But it's really Zeka who is the highlight of this clip for me. Landing this critical knockback onto Guma. Just catching him, obviously with the code. Zeka, right? Killed. <laughs> Not Zeus. Oh, Zeka, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They both start with Zeh. Who many Zeh? Yeah. Oh, fake it? Oh, the charm gonna miss. Peanut with the dodge south. You don't I love see how that he missed game. it and still did half his health. Yeah. Not I much mean, magic resist. He did malignance him very hard. Oh. You don't have to aim that. Five stacks. Five stacks to go for Viper. Oh, I'm surprised he doesn't have it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, 220 is not 225. Maybe an ult could get them. Uh, they're just going to give it up, though, looks like. We got a wall coming in as well. Owner, I mean, they're throwing everything at him just to make sure. Okay, I think he will definitely have it in time for the next dragon fight. 
Um, yeah. I think I can say probably make a statement. We don't want to jump to conclusions. Yeah, don't want to make too outlandish a statement that I can't stand behind. Uh, but yeah, so Dragon picked up. Gold lead's still close, but I think Honolife Eastworld's still pretty happy with, with where the game they is. They want right to do now. Baron. I mean, Peanuts ult is down. We got Zekka ult down. They used a lot to try to get that. But now we got a Smolder on 225. This and a dangerous. chance. Yeah, this is very dangerous, actually. I think 200 going to pull off of it. They go for the turn. And you see the health is beginning to burn. Yeah, I mean, I, it was definitely T1 trying to start it, trying to bait a fight. Um, but good disengage coming out from Honwife Esports. Oh, delight. Oh, he wanted that. Definitely did. It is Sari, but... And you can definitely feel T1 know the time has been put on. Oh, no. oh. Uh, oh. he's just dead. Okay, well, Charm comes in, and now the Wombo coming in. Look at that knockback from Zekka, Gary, and Kuma. Nearly both die instantly. It was looking okay, actually, with the Zeus damage, but, man, he was outdone by the Talia this time around. And I'm just going to say, you know, I've been pretty critical. A lot of people have been of Zekka outside of his signature picks. Out of style, it's like his Akali, his Yone, the Tristana, the Ari. He's had a phenomenal clear game so far with some great knockbacks. Oh, yeah. Uh, they are looking for this Baron. It's going down quickly, but TP's coming in. Uh, well, you don't have a smite, so very doubtful that they do take it away. But let's see if they can get any cleanup. He doesn't Faker, have his yet. Uh, he yeah, have his. he just doesn't have his smite. Oh, God. As Faker going to get rooted up and, um, you know, scolded by Mom a little bit. But that's about it. They managed to get out. A little bit close to the wire. A little bit dangerous. But they Ooh. pull it off. 3,000 gold lead, Baron in pocket, and they've hit the stacks. Hot Life Esports looking great. They're feeling pretty good about their state in this game, I'd say. You can see that um, that last fight was pretty confusing. They really wanted to hold on to this mid-tier one. Yeah, um, being a lot of teams really heavily dependent on it in this game. No. But the combo coming out, and then the re-engage. He wants fight this. Oh. And it's a double knocker, both bot laners. Guma does get out, but being a flash for it. And yeah, Zekka just having a phenomenal game. Zekka this time, not Um <laughs> Very confusing. Yeah. Well, Doran actually on top of the damage meter. He is Jace, after all. Not too surprising. Uh, this is a lot of members of Hunter Life Esports in the bot lane. They do have Zekka covering mid. Uh, normally, we often see teams where, like, have one one person, maybe two push bot, and then like push mid and rotate over. They're just beelining four straight bot, uh, which means there's like a lot of vision not secured in the jungle here. Yeah. Kind of kind of cheat it and push it in here, but like Faker, Owner, and Carrier are really threatening on this flank. Yeah, just kind of brute forcing it, saying, "Okay, we have Baron. We're just gonna get value out of it, whether you like it or not." And you know what? Even if they defend the tower, Viper will just keep spamming abilities at you and getting stacks. Uh, yep. Two six seven right now. Oh, and he has 268 AD. Not in sync. Well, he's one, one more stack. One stack away. And the poke is pretty annoying to deal with. I mean, carry on the Nautilus. He is a support Nautilus, and he's not farming. So he's not that tanky. I mean, he went Locket. Doesn't have that much armor. As now, Faker, he's going to get the ult out of Delight in trade of his own. But that's about it. Still chipping away here yeah, on not, this siege. Not a great trade. Oh, the hook. Oh, instant regret. Yeah. Instant regret. And you know what? He was definitely fishing for someone else right there, but <laughs> caught the Alistair and threw it straight back into the ocean. Delight is very good at um, standing in front of his teammates and soaking up a lot of it. See, Kuma, I mean, you just get skill. to play the game. Yeah. Esports. Oh, here we go again. He gets it again. Now to two tankier members, but he's got his whole team there, and they all just burst to smithereens. It's now how will I esports 5v3. Maybe they can end this game. Peanut kind of being harassed here on the left side. They don't have a wave, and they have 10 seconds on the Baron buff. Yeah, who needs mid or mid prior? They haven't even taken the tier two, and they're just pushing down bot lane, and it's actually just working. The siege is powerful. They don't really have a response to the smolder right now. Zeus, he's trying to cut off the wave. Pretty desperate. Charm isn't going to land, and you know what? It's going to get Hummelite Esports out of the base, but now Zeus is on the run, and the TP is coming in. <laughs> he's going to stop the charm. Will Peanut, and he gets away. 
And Zayus just runs away after all of that. Uh, yeah. Some shenanigans here. Well, these are two of our top teams capable of really high level play. <laughs> that little passage there was a bit goofy. Um, it was. Just say. Either way, uh, a lot better in that situation. Dragon now up again, and Hotline Esports. Oh, man. Have they overstayed? Well, Charm is going to miss, and they get the Infernal Drake. Some low health bars, though. Oh. And Viper just flaps over the wall. We got Nalton onto Peanut. Somebody, I think, is going to have to sacrifice here. But now, Mom called down, and Owner is gone. And Delight, he gets the knock up here onto Gooma, who is just gone. And now it's 80 carry versus no 80 carry. Immediate cleanse comes in from Viper as he wants to burn some health bars. Oh boy, does he. Zeus is going to get away. And at the end of the day, it looks like maybe Faker and Karia also go down, but they're going to spend a lot of time chasing. The hardest thing about playing Smolder is resisting the urge to flash Q when someone's slow. Yep. But uh, Viper not going to waste his flash in this situation. But definitely just showing the advantage that Hunwife has right now. Delight is still alive. <laughs> oh, the flash. Just not to get knocked up and secure the kill. Not oh, sure about that one. Not sure about that one, Faker. Faker was hoarding all of the cinders. <laughs> he managed. That's what happens when you kill Faker. You get like a million of them. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, we talk about them. They're fun to watch, but the actual value of them on a, on a pick like Smolder is huge because he obviously does value at a Billy Hayes well on Manteca. What a game. Give the guy his POG. Yeah. I kind of feel bad for Delight because Delight's also had a phenomenal game. That's true. But Zeke has just been smashing it so far. Even Viper's had a great game too. He's just. Smolder. We don't so. go for Smolder, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unlucky, I guess. Uh, yeah, unfortunate. And here, Owner just gets, you just get melted, you know? It's like, Mom actually does so much damage. The light catches out the Zeri. Uh, and then it's kind of just T1 trying to escape. Yeah. And failing. So, Baron and 40. Baron and 40, 6,000 gold lead. Two Infernal Dragons in pocket as well. And the person with the most gold in the game is the uh, Smolder. Yeah, he's got an arm guard too, so he's spending it correctly. I think at this point you're doing enough damage. Your your whole comp has so much damage, especially with Zekka also fed as owner. I, I think, well, he is Lee Sin, so he will get away, but yeah. This is just them setting up for the Baron. Yeah, I mean, actually. Vibe doesn't have cleanse yet, but between cleanse and the arm guard, it's so difficult. Zekka is for eye drops in his eye in the middle of the game. It's the Infernal Rift, you know, dry dries eyes out pretty quickly. <laughs> it's very dry um, with all that heat out there. I hope he's doing okay, obviously. Um, never ideal to have to do that in the middle of the game, but... Yeah. Yeah, has been having a, a great one so far. It's uh, working. He keeps it up. Yeah, maybe that's the, the secret. Have you got any eye drops? I do, actually. <laughs> oh, man. If you want some during the cast. Uh, they're just going to try to burst down the dragon, the Baron, rather. And it might work out. I mean, it's not that fast, though. And now, just setting up for this one. Carry on the outside again. He's not that tank. He's just going to burn the smithereens again. And now Viper, he's got an arm guard. Dodges all the damage. Zeus desperately wants to take out this little baby dragon. Meanwhile, Guma's going 1v3. He's going to be taken out. And how many Esports? They have a TP into the base. As Zeka will try to end it. And they will try to stop these two's backs. Yes, yeah, it'll work. Zeus has TP as well. So you can just Ooh. TP back now. Oh, but Baker. he can't go to the Nexus turret. Good luck, Faker. Um, yeah, <laughs> Faker's dead, and now we got a second TP in. This yeah, one is over. over. Jace will put an end to this one, and Hama Life Esports with the big win over T1 tonight. A 2-1 to victory in a close series, and it keeps them in contention for that playoff round 2 seed. Keeps the opportunity, obviously, having that insurance of the double and M. We've seen upsets before oh, yeah. when it has come to that first round, gives you the safety net. And I think, honestly, if Hunter Life Esports had come in and they'd just gotten that initial game and that had been it, I still would have been like, okay, they put up a good fight. We've shown that they can contest with T1. But they went so much further beyond. Such a good series. Uh, and I feel like there was good things to say about everyone, but in particular, Zeka, who we've kind of had a lot of criticism for throughout the split. He had those rough corky games. Kind of felt like when he wasn't on his core champions, he looked yeah. a bit rough. But that Talia game, he just smashed it out of the park. I don't know if I've seen a Talia do that much damage. I mean, it was just insane the combos he was getting. And those are obviously the flashy moments, but even the walls are pretty good. The the damage he was outputting in the team fights, also very high value. And a light, very flashy on his Alistair as well. Yep. I mean, he's so great in that pick. Kind of redeemed himself with the Rakan earlier, but yeah. I just feel like uh, Honor Life Esports, this is kind of the level of play we expected when we saw this roster. Like the three pieces from Gen.G, yeah. 
the two world champion carries, we thought that it could obviously be fantastic, but it really took them a while to build up. But that's that's how the split goes, you know? New roster being formed together is obviously going to be teething issues. And now, so close to playoffs, they can maintain this level of form. Hope's really high for them. And, you know, who knows? Maybe it isn't Gen GT1 finals. I mean, you never know. I feel like Common Life Esports had an opportunity here, and they really took it, right? T1 a little bit uh, wounded after the crushing defeat against Gen G. T1 obviously did come back. They took out DK, but Humble Life Esports are a different um, breed of opponents, let's say. And took advantage of it, played a great series. Got a little bit iffy there in game two, of course, but yeah, just uh, a great moment for Humble Life Esports. T1 are going to have to go back to the drawing board as we are getting closer to reaching those playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously they're still safe in there, but uh, I think the seeding is is important, but also just the form you go in the playoffs can make such a difference to the team. Yep. T1 definitely a roster who will go back to the drawing board when things aren't working, but I think re-examining the draft priorities and some of the plays they were making will be important before the end. But Honda Life Esports, some fantastic fights, and obviously with the smolder, you're kind of just putting the time on uh, the game on a clock where you know you're going to be strong later, but the execution was, was really uh, crisp, and I can't praise Zeka enough. Uh, for his play in this one. Yep. That that pick in particular stands out to me. Absolutely. Not an easy game either for Guma. Like he there were multiple moments where he was getting caught up, but you're playing into Alistair, Talia, Smolder, like you're just eating oodles and boodles of damage all the time. Insane amounts of close range CC. It's hard to deal DPS in some of these fights. Yeah. And, uh, especially when Zeka has like a homing missile seismic shove on you like every single time. It's not easy. It definitely isn't. Um and I think seeing the value of the Talia, you know, we've never seen the, the Ari. I mean, Talia's been picked up a lot, but I feel like the win rate was suffering a little bit in recent weeks. Yeah. Uh, the Especially with Azir no longer being enabled, it's like it was picked up a lot as a counter to that. Ari is kind of being like the meta thing coming in, but we've seen some great Talia games so far. And here, the light catching out Guma. The focus so good, and honestly, the team fighting from, team fighting from Honor Life Esports just been excellent. Absolutely. Okay. Let's see what they have to say here at the very end. Uh, take down Nautilus first. Sin. Sorry, no flash. So, <laughs> Delight was like, Zeri, 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 and Peanut's like, we gotta take care of, uh, of uh, Smolder, by the way. <laughs> so, Smolder? <laughs> yeah, he's like, by the way, keep Smolder safe. Kind of important. Yeah. Bit of a split fight. So. Definitely. But, uh, yeah, and then the decisive decision in, on the end. They no Faker, doesn't have Flash, no, he doesn't have TP. Uh, they take him down, get the double TP, and celebrate him, as they should. We did well, they said. And they did. It was a great series. A very back and forth fun one. This one, the damage numbers pretty heavily in favor of the team that was ahead that had poke champions and kind of controlled the rift from a very early stage of the game. Yeah, and Zayas started the day 13 on Aatrox. Um, 14 well, and 2 now. Yeah. Mm, didn't manage to hold up in this situation. I think ultimately the compositions and both the wins from Honor Life Esports really well crafted. Like this one. Uh, you have so much anti-dive with like the Alistair, the Maokai, Talia, yeah. so much protection for the carries. And obviously, Doran got a ton of poke, but Viper's just kind of chilling, doing dragon things. Yeah, absolutely. Felt like Kamala Heatsports had a really good read um, today. So certainly helped them out, and some good execution gets them the victory 2-1. to one. We are done here on the caster desk. Let's go over to the space to break down that series. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Absolutely fantastic work today. And yes, it is time to break down this unprecedented Humble Life Esports victory over T1. And now, evening out score lines, everything about playoffs now a whole lot more interesting. And gentlemen, it does start with the draft. Do you want to take us through it? I'm so excited. This makes it way better. We thought we were in tier list season, you know, classic LCK spring. Everyone just beats the team below them and, and, and loses quite horrendously to the team above them. So the fact that Home Alive get a win here, I think is really cool. Obviously, you, you might come into this and be like, it's second versus third, like why are we surprised? But I think I speak for all of us, like genuinely, none of us thought the Home were gonna do it. And the draft, guess what? 
get Viper Smolder was normally what I'd say, but you know who the difference maker was? Oh God. I can't believe Ooh, it. Just say Because the, the Talia was locked in and all of us. We were like, oh, well, congrats T1. <laughs> we were, we were like, oh, no, no, no. Pick, pick, pick Tristana. Not even because Tristana is good, but just don't put Zekka. I mean, it's not even on Italia. It's also Jace together. It's oh, two, it's true. It's two, three straight up Jace and Talia. We saw the Doran Jace the all year. It wasn't good. It's the same exact matchup. He he got so some Ollie lane face against Zeus Aatrox. He got boomed in the early lane against Aatrox. Mm -hmm. It was like so like it was no good. But the, but what happened this game? We I, just it was completely new person. Both that was them. absolutely incredible. And the thing that my favorite thing about it is I feel like the players play better if Viper is on an ultra scaling champion. Like if there is like a critical mass that he can hit in the game, it just takes so much weight off the shoulders of these players because he is so good when it comes to late game team fights and they know that just get through it and we'll be fine. But uh, let's have a look at our first highlight here. We're gonna skip a whole bunch of the game because this game was about getting these 80 carries to these big points in the game. Yeah, I mean, it's a really same thing, like, as a game, the before the game. Like, I think it was the fight almost, like, usually happened around the objective. And this is the the first, actually, breakdown from H HLE and T1. Between the, it's just that the Zekka just getting that, that hit. It wasn't even, like, anything set it up. It was, like, just pure, just a pure ability that he just casted. And that actually just changed the, changed the fight. The big thing here is that with that, they denied the soul. That was, to, to us, it felt like one of the ways where you definitely, if you do pick up Infernal, so it gives you so much added oomph. And particularly with champions like Smolder, like being able to kill him in a single rotation is absolutely pivotal. So the fact that Genji was able, or uh, Humble Life, rather, I'm talking about Genji because they beat T1, I mean, right? And also three parts of this team would be. It's, so it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a lot of the same. The fact that they were able to get through that fight, get Smolder a lot of stacks, and then be first to the Drake, ended up being, I think, even though it, it didn't look like they did a whole lot, a really big difference maker. Yeah, there, there were a whole bunch of these, uh, these little skirmishes that we were just thinking to ourselves, yeah, it looks pretty even. It looks like just normally a, a normal skirmish, right? But with the fact that Viper is able to just keep hitting people with abilities, that's the hugest difference maker. I think it was about 23 minutes that he was able to hit his 225. And from that point on, Humble Life Esports did not lose a team fight. Let's have a look at the final moment here that really solidified it as, yeah, T1 um, attempting to get on this Baron and make something happen, but it looked like desperation. Yeah, this is the final biggest fight at the, the completion. That it was the 225, the stack that completed. And just, it's, it's happening at the mid lane. I think it was like kind of, I thought it was like the first time I, th I thought it was like kind of disrespect. Like I thought it was like a little bit of overstep. But I mean, they, after they pressure mid, it's just, they, they got re-engaged on. I mean, this is the combo, the strength of the, the Talia that Alistair has and also the Maokai set it up had. And this, the middle of the team fight just casting that ability and just hitting that. It just, just cause the Baron, cause the Baron game. As it turns out, Zekka has just been, he's been pranking all of us. He's been, just <laughs> pretending to be bad so I could pull out the Talia here. Because genuinely his Talia was out of like the top tier mid laners, I think by far the worst. Which makes sense, because yeah. it's Zekka, that's not what we... But on top of that, we came into today with only Chovy. But actually, we came in today with no one on Talia being able to beat Ari in lane. We actually saw that it was three and zero, I think, before today. Then Chovy was able to do it. Then Faker was able to do it. And now Zekka's able to do it. So I guess now it's not even really a counter matchup. And it never truly was, right? But it's just done pretty well Skill into matchup. Talia. Which Zekka won, which still, I, I, I... It's baffling. And it really does go back to some of the, the juju, the vibes, right? Because Peanut, domestically, very, very good at beating T1. And then Zekka, pretty famous for being able to take them down uh, in very high pressure situations. So Synergize. I don't know, man. There's, uh, there's something in the water or something. Yeah, and the tragic thing was in this game that Faker was the only one who was like, really? Oh, yeah. He played like, really well. Obviously, the Ari wasn't enough, but he was desperately trying. And owner was dying level three. Uh, getting caught a bunch of time. Guma also had a couple of opportunities where it could have flashed. Might have made a difference, uh, but didn't really come through. Was not their day today, but it was this person's day. Let's have a look at the POG. 
I really hope it's Zeka. His Talia was so incredibly good. Uh, but there were a few other options. And yeah. he's going to get it. 900 points now for Zeka. Um, still 200 behind both Faker and Chovy, but incredibly well deserved. And I think all of us are incredibly proud of this player right now. I mean, this play, it was like a little bit misplayed but from the owner, but I think the Zekas played like really calm. And as we, I think this will be already went over. Just, it's just every time, every single time when Zekas there in the middle of the fight, just hitting the ability to enemy, especially the hyper carry, and it's just so important. People was just so in the key. It was, it was actually crazy that he was doing it not in line with the CC as well. This is something you mentioned earlier on. Oftentimes we see pulverize into shove, but no, he like, he waits until after the pulverize, because that's only on one person. He wants to hit three people with it. So he gets them while they least suspect it was, yeah, I don't know, it was very impressive. Let's have a look at the votes and uh, see whether anyone got the wrong memo. Ah, there's a couple. I knew, <laughs> we knew. The, the delight delight votes, we absolutely based. Um, Third media. I knew the small I knew it. I've been yeah. tactical. Really, the, the story of this game is that we thought that they might win game three just because of Viper, despite Zaka on Talia. The fact that they won because of Zaka on Talia, uh, that's that's amazing. That's setting up for an incredible playoffs as well. And it's also just setting up for what Harmo Life Esports are going to be capable of for the rest of this year as well. And we need another team at least. We can't just up be, there with T1 and just Genji. Two, man. We're not a two-team region anymore. Hopefully we've welcomed a third and now we can welcome to the Low Park stage as well as I'm going to throw it over to Deer for the interview translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Deer for the POG interview translation, joined by Peanut and Jack Zeka on the side of Hana Life Esports. Congratulations! How do you feel, Peanut? Our match against T1 was a very important one, and if we were to lose today, that means that we would start off by losing against all the teams that are uh, higher ranked than us. And that would have actually affected our team spirit, but I'm really glad that we're able to take them down today. And Zeka, in round one, I feel like we lost against them so helplessly, and we really wanted to win against them today. And everyone did so well to win, and I'm really happy about that. So in the past, you guys had some regretful matches against uh, T1 and Genji, just like Peanut said. But what a victory today. So what was the key point you focused on while preparing for your battle against T1? Previously, in our matches in the past, we had a lot of uh, points that we had to improve on. And based on what the draft that uh, the opponents prefer, since we have in enough info on that and have a good understanding of that, we try to utilize that as much as we can. And Peanut, in game one, your last pick, Poppy, had a wonderful performance. So how did you plan your early pathing against Lee Sin. Poppy's actually really good against Lee Sin, and I knew that as long as I make enough impact in the early game, uh, the rest of the game will go smoothly, but because of how great my teammates were, I think that's what allowed us to win so easily. Yeah, although you play Poppy with ease, Poppy isn't a very common pick in this patch, so what kind of strength were you looking for comp-wise? I feel like Poppy is a very decent pick where you give the opponent a really hard time. And I feel like there's so many opportunities to use Poppy in any sort of comps. So in game three, Hana Life Esports players took picks they're most com uh, confident with, full of late game value. So what was the strategy during the draft? So since Maokai was open, I feel like that's something that you can set up a lot of things for your teammates as a team player, and I think that's what really stood out to us. And Zeka, you played Talia today, and your seismic shove was on point. And even when you got dove mid early, you took owner with you, and you had several great team fight plates. 
Uh, so, how do you always get the timing right? Yeah, it's important to hit the skills, but I feel like there were a lot of moments that my teammates made such great angles for me to use the skills. That's probably why I was able to land them so perfectly. Zeka! So, we saw Ari in all three games, and we saw Annie against her in game one, and in games two and three, we saw Ari Talia. Matchups. So, what is the best counter to Ari right now? In the past, Azir used to be the best, but because of how Azir is disabled right now, I would say rather than saying that it's a counter, I think Talia is probably the best to try to disable the Ari. The Talia Ari matchup is quite hot lately, so how can you explain how Talia can win against Ari? Talia isn't actually a really good champion when it comes to 1v1 matchups in the laning phase. But I think instead of focusing on the laning phase, you have to think about what kind of impact you have to uh, place in terms of how to cover the entire map. So you guys don't have a lot of matches left in the regular season. You took T1 down today and you'll be playing K uh, KT and D plus Kia next week. So we have two remaining matches before the playoffs. I think regardless of the results, it's important for us to bring up our forms to the best of our abilities. And Zeka, both of the teams that we're playing against in next week are very strong. And so we'll have to take our time to prepare so that we can win against them. And this will be the end of their interview with P Peanut and Zeka of HANA Life Esports and back to the space. Thank you so much, dear, and also extraordinarily uh, happy to hear from both Zeka and Peanut after their unprecedented victory uh, in this moment. Let's bring up the standings and uh, check out exactly what this means. You can see 13-3 and three for both T1 and Hama Life Esports. It's real. We're a three-team region. It's official. There we go. It, Big it, shout out really, to yeah, it, If we just ignore Gen G, the league now, wide open. Exactly. Super interesting. Just ignore them. No, it's, a, it's it's totally fine just to have one out in front. And it's only one match win, you know? It's also only one match win that they've lost so far this season. But still, it's only one ahead. That one doesn't count. That's KT. That's a, that's a true <laughs> quote from every single time, Atlas. <laughs> uh, and they've also got one more match to play uh, at the end of this week as well. But not tomorrow. Our next matchup going to be Firex taking on Kwandong Freaks. That is going to be our Saturday showdown. And that means everything for the final playoffs position. Still a lot of teams in the running, one of them being DRX that's gonna be taking on KT immediately afterwards. If they are able to win that match, they're still in the running as well. It could be a possibility, we'll just have to see. As Kwandong Freaks, they still have their life in their own hands. They can still pick up a win and just go to the playoffs. They could, they could probably just do that, but they haven't been doing much of that recently. Tomorrow, so much on the line, but for today, that is going to be it from us. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow for that Saturday showdown.
모르는 팀 피어 확정됐다고 생각하지 마세요 대왕 광동 저점입니다 광동 브리스 들어오세요 마지막 한 자리를 두고 경쟁하게 됐는데 굉장히 욕심이 나기 때문에 저희가 꼭 차지할 수 있도록 하겠습니다 플레이오프는 저희가 가겠습니다